arthroplasty or hip fracture surgery, recommendation is yes. These are standard and elevated VTE risk. Delegate vote agree 94.6%. Statement number eight, which patient's conditions or factors are associated with the elevated VTE risk after hip and knee atropathy or hip fracture surgery in the Asian population? Recommendation included previous VTE, varicose vein, congestive heart failure, medical history of thromboembolic stroke, and family history of VTE. Delegate vote agree 93.2%. Statement number nine. In Asian patients, which surgical factors or perioperative patient management are associated with an elevated VTE risk after hip and knee arthroplasty or hip factor surgery? Recommendation surgical factors or perioperative patient management includes. Revision surgery, bilateral surgery, prolonged surgical time, prolonged time to surgery after hip fracture and delay ambulation. Delegate would agree 95.9%. Now, we move to selected statements and consensus in group 2, mechanical VTE prophylaxis. Statement number 6. Choose a mechanical device for VTE prophylaxis be routinely applied in Asian patients undergoing hip and knee atropathy and hip fracture surgery. Recommendation is yes. Delegate votes agree 84.9%. Statement number 8A. When should the mechanical VTE prophylaxis be applied in patients undergoing hip and knee arthroplasty? Recommendation from early post-operative period and also can be applied from intra-operative period. Delegate board agree 98.6%. Statement number 8B. When should the mechanical VTE prophylaxis be applied in patients undergoing hip fracture surgery? Recommendation from the preoperative period. Delegate would agree 93.1%. Statement number nine. What is the appropriate duration of mechanical VTE prophylaxis applying to the patients? Recommendations. During hospitalization and can be extended after discharge until the patient becomes independent ambulator. Delegate vote agree 90.4%. And now we move to selected statements and consensus in group 3 pharmacological VTE prophylaxis. Statement number 4. Considering VTE risk and bleeding risk, which method of VTE prophylaxis should apply for agents, patients undergoing hip and knee arthroplasty and hip fracture surgery? 4A, standard VTE risk without bleeding risk. Recommendation, mechanical prophylaxis alone or pharmacological prophylaxis combined with mechanical prophylaxis. Delegate word agree 97.2%. 4B, elevated VTE risk without bleeding risk. Recommendation, pharmacological prophylaxis combined with mechanical prophylaxis. Delegate word agree 98.6%. 4C, standard VTE risk with bleeding risk. Recommendation, mechanical prophylaxis alone. Delegate would agree, 97.2%. 4D, elevated VTE risk with breathing risk. Recommendation, mechanical prophylaxis alone or combined with aspirin. Delegate would agree, 86.3%. 
statement number 7A, among all available pharmacological agents for VTE prophylaxis, which is the most appropriate for the agents undergoing hip and knee arthroplasty. Recommendation Aspirin is the most appropriate agent for patients with standard VTE risk. Direct oral anticoagulants or low molecular weight heparin are the most appropriate agent for patients with elevated VTE risk. Delegate vote agree 82.2%. Statement number 7B. Among all available pharmacological agents for VTE prophylaxis, which is the most appropriate for the agents undergoing hip fracture surgery, recommendation inconclusive. Delegate vote agree 93.2%. Statement number 11A choose the dose and duration of pharmacological VTE prophylaxis in Asian patients with standard VTE risk be adjusted from the recommended dose and duration by the American or European guidelines. Recommendation, a lower dose with delayed pharmacologic administration can be applied in Asian patients with standard VTE risk. Delegate vote agree, 87.7%. If you are interested in the full text of this AP VTE consensus, you can download from the MedLine. We published three articles in knee surgery and related research, which is the open access. The Asia Pacific VTE working team would like to thank our four advisors and also our 93 Asia Pacific experts. Thank you. Thank you, Ari, for the excellent lecture. And to all participants, you may now proceed to either the HIP or knee auditorium. And thank you so much. Have a good day, everyone. Enjoy your meeting. Good morning, good afternoon, good, good evening. Um, welcome to the Combined Congress. It is an honor to introduce a person who is teacher of a teacher. Um, he has published more than 350 peer-reviewed papers. He has authored chapters in 121 books, and he's edited 11 books on hip and knee arthroplasty. He has been president of Mid-America Orthopedic Association, President of American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons, President of the Hip Society, President of American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, President elect of International Hip Society. He is a senior director of current concept in joint replacement. He is no other person than Dan Barry. He is the professor of orthopedic at Mayo Clinic. It is a pleasure to introduce him to start a session on how I do it, total knee arthroplasty. Welcome, Dan. Thank you very much, Shahid, and a good day to all of you. It's a real privilege to be involved in this outstanding combined meeting. I'm going to keep my comments brief because we need to get on with this panel, which I think you're going to enjoy. In this panel, we're going to talk about a step-by-step -step discussion of how to perform a total knee arthroplasty and decision-making related to perioperative as well as intraoperative management. We have an absolutely superb uh, team of panelists. This will give you an opportunity to hear how thought leaders are thinking about knee arthroplasty and compare your practice to theirs. I'm going to ask the panelists who are chosen for their expertise to also be brief in their answers because we have quite a few slides to get through. I'll just briefly introduce the panelists. They are Arun Malaji, Ari Tanavali, Sami Tarabichi, Ashok Rajgapal, Shahid Noor, Dermot Kalapi, John Bing Ma, and Sajin Tapazi. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, let's get going. I should just mention to you briefly that I receive royalties from the view on some hip and knee products and the rest of my disclosures are listed. To provide a little broader perspective, occasionally I'll share with you a slide that shows you trends from a recent poll that we took of around 600 members of the AHKS this past year. Let's get right into it. Indications for surgery. Body mass index. 
panelists. Do you have a strict cutoff for BMI or not? Is it a soft cutoff or strict? And if so, what's your number? Let's just start with Shahid and then go right down the list. Shahid? You need to unmute yourself, uh, panelists. Yeah, go ahead. Cut off, uh, and it is 35 uh, BMI, but medical fitness is important. Thank you, Sachin. Yeah, I think it's more or soft cutoff around 35 to 36, pending medical fitness. That is the key for uh, doing surgery or not. Thanks. And I'll ask everybody just to keep it to one sentence or we'll never get through the room. Uh, I see whether you can flex the knee adequately to perform the surgery. I don't go by the number. But generally, I tell people that 35 to 40 increases your risk. So we would take more precautions for these patients, but I would assess clinically how much they flex. Okay, thanks. We got to keep it to a sentence, guys. Ashok? Um, 40 is my cutoff, Dan. I like that answer. Okay, uh, Dermot? No cutoff. No cutoff. Go for it. Ari? Yeah, I'm 35, but fortunately, we don't have this obese patient much. Not so many there. Jim Bing? I think the 35 may be cut off, but sometimes for fat, fat patients, it is difficult to, to to be seen or yeah, sometimes uh, maybe. They may not yeah. get in the 35. first place. 35 ish. So a lot of people at 35, some 40, and a few none. Smoking. I'm just gonna ask if there's anybody on the panel who does not try to get their patients to stop smoking before surgery. No. Everyone tries. And is there anyone on the panel who, if they hear right before surgery, the patient's still smoking, will still go ahead with surgery? Yes. Dermot. Dermot, you'll still go ahead, but you try hard to get them to stop. Correct. Okay. We're going to talk a little bit about <coughs> blood, blood management. On this slide, I'm showing you that uh, almost everyone is using tranexamic acid, at least in the United States. I presume that's probably true internationally. So we won't ask whether you use it, but I'm simply going to ask, for exclusions. So very quickly, starting uh, with Sachin, go right down the list, Sachin, any exclusions, very briefly. Only if they have severe hepatic damage, then I would exclude otherwise for all. Okay, thank you, Arun. Almost everyone. Ashak. Uh, we do it for everyone, we have no exclusions. Dermot. Only if they've got stents in the leg. Arun. Yeah, mostly because of anaesthetic cirrhosis or internal medicine concern about like the CVA problem, but I don't have uh, any uh, exclusions. Jean Bing? For every patient. Everybody. So it looks like people have loosened up their restrictions and most people are getting tranexamic acid. Standard antibiotic prophylaxis, I believe, is probably going to be a first generation cephalosporin for everyone. For the penicillin and allergic patient, what is your drug of choice? Jean Bing? Yeah, maybe a standard antibiotics. Yeah. Yeah. Ari? Ari? Yeah, I, I choose phosphomycin. It's a Japanese antibiotic and work well is a side out okay. antibiotic. We don't have that one in the US. Sachin? Vancomycin. Vancomycin. Arun? Uh, Vanco. Vanco. Ashok? Vanco. All right. Uh, let's see, who didn't we get? Uh, Dermot. Uh, Ed, yeah, Vanco. And Shahid? Uh, Kefiroxin is the second generation cephalosporin. Okay. Uh, all right. So I think I'm going to skip this, uh, go on to the next question. Antibiotics in the cement. Please tell me if you use them, and if so, in whom? Starting with Sation. Only in high risk patients, rheumatoids, and high uh, diabetics. Thank you. Arun? Immune suppressed, diabetics, and other high-risk patients only. Ashak? Rheumatoid in all revisions. Dermot? Everyone. Everyone. Uh, Jin Bing? For everyone. Everyone? Yeah. Let's see, who did I miss? Shahid? Yes, everyone. Shahid? Antibiotics only in rheumatoids and in diabetics. So you can, the audience can see that it's pretty evenly split between people that are using them almost all the time or only in high risk patients. And it's interesting to see almost everyone's using them at least some of the time. I think I'm going to skip this question and move on to the next one. Uh, Preoperative urinalysis. Uh, 
You get one in everyone nowadays. This has become an area of controversy. Shahid, yes or no? Uh, yes. Yes, uh, Shashan, yes or no? Yes. Arun? Sorry, I didn't catch what this question was. Preoperative your analysis. Everyone yes. or not? Yes. yes. Ashok, yes or yes. no? Yes. Yes. Dermot? Y yes, from Dermot. Yeah, Sachin? Yes, please. Okay, and uh, Ari? Yes. Okay, so that's interesting. Yes, All of you are still doing it. Uh, in the United States, a lot of people have stopped, or if they get a positive one, they'll go right ahead and just treat them with antibiotics and carry on with surgery, for right or for wrong. But I, this is an area where the practice is changing. Surgical use, in everyone, no one, or selectively? Maybe just a quick answer, starting with Arun. Uh, almost for no one. Uh, the only time we'd use it is if you're doing a bilateral where uh, the patient is rheumatoid with low hemoglobin. Okay, Sachin. I need the one for everyone except those with peripheral vascular disease. Ashok. We don't use uh, tourniquet, Dan. Dermot. I do for most, but I'm regretting it. I want to stop. Ari? <laughs> yes, I use for everyone. Uh, let's see. Uh, Sachin, did you get the answer that yet? Yeah, I did, yeah. Okay, so uh, I think we've lost. Uh, Jean Shahid. Oh, Shahid, sorry, I sorry, I can't yes. see you on my screen. So go ahead, yeah. Yes, uh, uh, for everyone, for Except, everyone. Uh, okay. Peripheral vascular disease. Okay, great. All right, next slide is going to be: Do you perform bilateral simultaneous total knee arthroplasty? Uh, if so, uh, who do you exclude? Uh, let's just. Uh, I'm going to only ask a couple of people here because we don't have time. Ari. Yes, I do uh, both three uh, indication three criteria. First, severe deformity both sides. Second, physical fit. Third, the patient willing to undergo bilateral. Okay, Dermot. Yeah, never. Never. Uh, let's ask uh, Ashok. Uh, Dan, patient has, has to be below 75 ASA grade one or two. Yeah, that's pretty close to my indications as well. Your routine exposure, does anyone do anything other than a medium parapetellar exposure routinely? No. no. So this no. is interesting. No. This is an area that really has changed. There was a lot of fooling around with exposures for a while, and everyone's pretty much back to medium parapetellar. Do you aim for a neutral mechanical axis or kinematic alignment? I'm going to start with Arun. Uh, neither. I uh, adapted to the patient but it's not kinematic. I don't go for the entire kinematic alignment, but it would be patient-specific. Thank you, Arun. Uh, Ari? Yes, uh, purely neutral, but clearly I put in less neutral mechanical axis in between the neutral and kinematics. You cheat a little bit. Sammy? Yes. You're not on. You on? Yeah. No. Uh, Shahid? Uh, neutral mechanical axis. Thank you. Ashok? Uh, Dan, neutral mechanical axis, but I use the constitutional alignment uh, that uh, Johan Bellemont is recommended. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. You can see that there's going to be zero consensus from the panelists on this topic. Everyone's doing it their own way, and we still don't have strong data that says one's better than the other. So you can do it however you want. This will be an interesting question. Just give me one word answer for your standard vanilla knee. What are you doing? Manual instrumentation, some sort of computer assisted or robotic? Well, it's just a quick one word answer, starting with Ari. Yes, mostly I use manual and manual. That's it. Yes. Okay. Uh, Arun. Computer assisted always. Ashok. Uh, always manual, except uh, patients with extra articular deformities where we use robotics. Thank you. Shahid. Uh, always manual. Dermot? Robot. Chambing? I think we uh, lost no him. No computer oh, assistant and no robotic. Okay, thank you. And Sachin? Manual, please. So you can see that this is an area which will continue to evolve rapidly, I suspect. I think I'm going to skip this uh, question and move to the next. Rotation of your femoral component. What are you basing your rotation of your femoral component on predominantly? White sides line, the epicondylar axis, and gap balancing. And if you're using some sort of computer-assisted surgery, just tell us which of these you usually input as your way of choosing. Uh, let's start with uh, Sachin. 
Uh, I use a combination of white size line and epicondylar axis. Thank you. Zhang Deng. Didn't get him, Dermot. Yeah, the, with the robot, you get uh, 3D computer modeling. So it's, it's based on the functional flexion axis and then cap balance for adjustment. Okay, Shahid. It's epicondylar axis, white side line, and cap balancing. Asha. Uh, white side line, epicondylar axis, and the tibial resection. Ari? Yeah, mostly fixed three degrees of external rotation. Okay, and Arun, you get the last word briefly. Combined referencing all these uh, um, combined because I use computers, so we get all the information at the same time. Very good, thank you. I'd like you to give me now your single best technical tip for balancing the varus knee. You got to do it in one or two sentences, starting with Arun. Do not release the superficial medial collateral ligament. Okay, uh, Ashok. Uh, wide posteromedial release, removing the osteophytes uh, from the medial side of the femur tibia and the posterior osteophytes. Ari. Yeah, the same possible medial release, remove osteophyte. Shahid. Uh, posterior medial release is the key and, uh, uh, and removal of osteophyte. It is the release of semimembranosis and uh, is, is the key of correcting the deformity. Dermot. Yeah, anatomic tibial cut helps. Yeah, that's true. Jean Bing. Jean Bing. And maybe we'll go to Sachin. Yeah, I think uh, the same posterior middle release with uh, careful release of all the osteophytes. Okay, good. There were quite a bit of consensus there. The one thing I will say I've added recently has been the uh, the 18 gauge needle use of uh, multiple perforations of the MCL that yep. was popularized by Johan Bellmans. It's a very effective and very nice way of titrating the release after you've done the rest. Single best tip for balancing the valgus knee. Sachin, you first. Use of you have gauge needle, both in extension and flexion, and doing a use of the 18 gauge needle and uh, releases with the same in extension and flexion. Thank you. Arun? Posterior lateral corner release, especially the popliteal fibular ligament. Thank you. Ari? Yes. For extension, the IT band release, but if they have both, I would do the popliteal release. You release the popliteus. Okay, that's interesting. Yes. Well, yeah, uh, well, this is the posterior lateral release runover technique with extension uh, uh, in extension. Thank you, Dermot. Yeah, anatomic femoral valgus and a little bit of anatomic tibial varus. Yep. I think Dermot just leaving all the knees in the same position so he doesn't have to release anything. Jen Bing? Uh, and did I miss anyone? I think not. All right, thank you everybody. It's interesting to see how the, uh, the pie cresting technique has really taken over for most people with one variation or another and a lot of emphasis on that poster lateral corner. Um, I think I'm going to ask just one or two people this. Arun, how do you test flexion stability? I use a tensioner uh, supporting the thigh and allowing the knee to flex. And then I use a tensioner to check my flexion stability. And uh, with the trials, I also do anterior, posterior, rotational, varus valgus uh, stressing, keeping the thigh supported. Great, so you do rely on the trials as a means to make sure you've got it right. Dermot, do you have anything else to add to that? No, I can look at the stagital stability real time. So, you know, that's the nice thing about having computer assisted is you can see real time whether you've got anterior, posterior, tibial draw uh, when, when you've got your components in. Fair enough. Dan, I do have the uh, last word, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, Dan, it's important that you test your stability 30, 45, 60, 90, and 120. I think that's critically important. Thank you for those tips, everybody. There were some good ones in there. Your, your, your standard form of fixation, if possible, just one word and try to be as brief as you can. Uh, let's start with Shahid. A cemented. All cemented. 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 John Bing. Ashok. Uncemented. 
Uncemented most of the time. All right, new one. All right, Sam, uh, see, Ari. Yes, all cemented. And Arun. All cemented. So most people are going uh, cemented with, uh, Dur Durma, maybe I didn't ask you, what are you doing? Yeah, hybrid. Hybrid, all right. So we got a few a few people in there that are uh, starting to try to use some uh, uncemented fixation, but most are still going cemented. In a total knee arthroplasty patient who's high BMI that you've had to operate on, do you use a standard component or do you add a short stem to your standard component? Sachin, let's start with you. Stemmed component, please. Okay, Ari? Yes, extend the stem or the tibial component. Dermot? Standard. Standard. Ashok? Uh, fully cemented short stem, stubby stem. Fair enough. Arun? Always a short cemented stem. Sean Bing, are you there? Okay, let's move on to the next one. This is the time to declare your religion, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, in most primary knee cases, do you use a cruciate retaining implant, a PS knee with a post, an ultra congruent bearing, or some form of medial stabilized bearing? Let's start with uh, safety. Most often, I'll use a PS with a post, occasionally an ultra congruent. Okay, thank you. Jean Bing, are you there? Dermot. CR, 95% of the time. CR. Shahid. Uh, PS both with post. Okay, Ashok. Uh, CR, most of the times, recently started with the needle stabilized dam. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ari. Yeah, PS with post all the time. Okay, and Arun? PS with post. So it's interesting. Uh, this is uh, shows that that around the world there remains really a plurality of different approaches to this and there's not a single approach that everyone has agreed on is best. So you're on fairly safe ground, whatever you're doing, as long as you do it well. I think we'll skip that and uh, we'll skip this because most implant systems now are being sold with crossing polyethylene, uh, I think, routinely, but uh, there may be conventional polyethylene still being used, so we'll skip that. Patella resurfacing, routinely, selectively, or never, starting with a rune? Almost always. Shahid. Uh, always. Dermot. Yeah, always. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Uh, Sachin. Selectively. Ashok. Almost never. <laughs> All right. Ari, what are you doing? Yeah, I'll be resurfacing. So uh, actually, most people are doing it most of the time, it sounds like, uh, or all the time, but there are a few that are not doing it routinely. Uh, I'm just going to ask this of a couple of people. T tips to check patellar tracking. Arun, any tips to tip check tracking intraoperatively? What do you accept? What don't you accept before you do something about it? First thing is confirm that you've resected an adequate amount of the patella and done a yep. correct uh, resection. And then yep. uh, I don't use a tourniquet, but if you do, I think you should release a tourniquet and check. Very good. I think that's a good tip. That was one uh, that Chip Manawa taught me, and I think that it stood the test of time. Sachin, do you have anything to add to that? I think just, sorry, just use a no thumbs test and uh, with the tourniquet down, that's the best way. Fair enough. And if it tips a little bit with that, are you willing to put a little towel clip in there just to make sure that it doesn't tilt? I just put a retention suture at the superior, superior corner and just see if it's sitting in place properly. Okay, fair enough. So you're willing to put one little suture there. Drains, yes or no, and exceptions, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let's go down the list, starting with Ari. Yes, always drain, but remove very early, 12 hours. Okay, Arun. Never. Never. Okay, so yes and no so far. Ashok. Uh, we don't use drains, uh, Dan. You're not using drains. Uh, Shahid. No. I stopped using drains five years ago. Okay, you've stopped. Dermot. Yeah, 100%. Stop. 10 years ago. Yeah. John Bing, are you there? I guess not. And Sachin. Uh, I use drains always. Leave them subcutaneously for 24 hours. Not Fair enough. And those of you who do not routinely use a drain, are there any exceptions to that? Are there any people who, in whom you will put a drain because something special is going on? Dermot? 
uh, super rare unless there's a big uh, defect on the medial side, you know, where you can't close that the bottom of that capsulotomy and you think you're going to get a subcutaneous collection, I'll put a subcutaneous drain, but I never drain the joint. Fair enough. Arun, you have anything to add to that? Sometimes in revisions. Sometimes in revisions. All right, and you can see what's happened with drain use uh, in primary tonal arthroplasty, at least in the United States. It's, it's become fairly uncommon for people to use them. Um, and maybe that is partly because tranexamic acid has helped us all. Your favorite wound closure in primary total knee arthroplasty. Uh, let's start with Sachin. Um, Vicryl, uh, so Vicryl number one for the capsule, subcutaneous with Vicryl number two, and skin with monocryl, 3 -O. Okay, th thanks. Let's just stick with just the skin. Uh, Arun, what are you doing on the skin? Are you doing anything special? Subcuticular, mono, uh, monocryl. And nothing else on top of that except steri strips? Steri strips. Dermot? Yeah, same, and I'll use my steri strips vertically, not transverse, so I don't get blisters. Okay, being careful about blisters. Ari? Yep. Yeah, Subcuticular stage and uh, 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 what do you call uh, a strip? No, no, no grow. Just steri strips. Shahid? Yes. Uh, sub subcuticular white fill and staples. Staples. Okay, Dermot? Already done it. You missed me. Oh, sorry, about that. sorry, I apologize. Uh, I, can, I can change my mind. No, I just wanted to see if you were consistent. <laughs> Sage, are you there? Yeah, um, I just said it. Subcritical three or one Yeah. Okay, well, you guys were both the same both times. That's great. Okay, uh, post operative pain management. Uh, Local peripheral nerve blocks, yes or no? Local cocktail infiltration, yes or no? Let's start with the room. Only cocktail infiltration. Okay, thank you. Ari? Yeah, both. Peripheral nerve block, continuous adductor, and also cocktail infiltration. Thank you. Ashok? Uh, posterior capsular infiltration with adductor canal block. Thank you. Shahid? Uh, local infiltration and epidural infusion. Thank you. You're using the epidural. Interesting. Dermot? Yeah, single shot, uh, Dr. Canal block and, and LAI. Yep. Fine. Fine. Thank you. And Sachin? Local infiltration and combination of erector canal block with an IPAC block. Okay. Thank you. CPM, yes or no? Uh, let's go down the list. Let's start with Sachin. You're first. I'm going to go for primary, you for revisions. Okay, thank you. John Big, are you there? No. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dermot? And not for 10 years, never. Dermot, you've given it all up, I can tell Correct. you. Correct, 100%. Minimalist. Yeah, I followed you late, Dan, I followed you late. A minimalist. Shaheed? Uh, never. Never. Ashok? Never. Ari? Yeah, no, for 10 years. Arun? Only for ankylosed rheumatoids. So rare, rare situations. You can see what's happened to standard use of CPM in North America. It's almost completely gone away based on all the data that failed to show major benefit. And I, I agree, Arun, there may be rare cases where it's reasonable to think about. You send your patients home with physical therapy, always, never, or in selected cases. If selected, just be very brief about in whom. Let's start with you, Arun. Almost never. The only ones are those with a severe flexion, contracture, and quadricep weakness uh, who would need uh, extensive physiotherapy. Fair enough. Ari? Yeah, mostly never, but selected in some case with problem with balance of the body. Okay. Uh, Ashok? Ashok? We always send patients with physical therapy support. Fair enough. Thank you. Uh, Shahid? Always. Dermot? Not for the first couple of weeks, wait and see how they go, and then make a decision in three weeks if they're not doing Fair it well enough. themselves. If they're, if they're having trouble, then you'll institute it. Correct. And uh, Sachin? Always. Thank you. Your favorite Dermot, uh, favorite DBT prophylaxis. Let's start right away, Sachin, with you again. I would use aspirin, and in high risk, I would go to enoxaparin. And duration. Thank you. Dermot? Standard Clexine for a week, then aspirin for six weeks. So one molecular heparin, then aspirin. Shahid? Uh, aspirin and mechanical prophylaxis. Fair enough, Ashok? Uh, Anoxaparin and uh, Ecosprin for six weeks. 
Okay, uh, uh, CRE. Yes, uh, Esplin and IPCD. You just gave us the whole talk on it. And Arun. Yes, yes. Aspirin and pumps and rivaroxaban for high risk. Okay, fair enough. And this is what's happening in the United States. Uh, most people are doing similar to what most of the panelists are doing, aspirin plus mechanical measures and uh, for high risk patients, usually something else. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you've come down successfully to the wire. We are right on time. So I'm gonna ask you your la the last question. Dental prophylaxis, always, uh, forever, first one to two years, or, and if you're high risk patients, do you do something different? Let's begin with Ari. Yes, I always, even though past two years. You give them uh, everything, them it forever. Arun, what are you doing? Yes. I tell them to inform the dentist that they've had a joint replacement and they should be covered with antibiotics very operatively. Fair enough. Thank you. Ashok. Uh, the same We Tell the patients to inform the dental uh, folks that they've had to joint replacements and to cover them for prophylaxis. Thank you. Shaheed. Uh, yes, for one or two years. For one or two years. Okay, fair enough. Dermot? First three months and then don't worry about it. Oh, that's interesting. And in the United States, most people have gone to doing it only for the first year or two. Sasha, what are you doing? First two years, please. First two years. And I will say that for patients we consider high risk, those that are either immunosuppressed or diabetic, we or have had revisions, we normally recommend forever, uh, based on relatively little data, I will say. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for an absolutely superb panel. We're right on time. You've done a marvelous job of getting through everything in record time. So congratulations to all of you. Thank you for sharing your opinions. I wish we could have expanded on some of the questions a little more, but a half hour is a half an hour. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Yes. Appreciate all of your participation. Yes. And we'll turn the podium back over to the organizers of the meeting. Thank you all for having us today. Thank you, Dan. Well thank done. You, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Yes. That was yes. stellar as always. Great thank job, you, guys. Dan. Can't thank you enough. You guys were stellar. Brilliant. <laughs>
uh, soft tissues have been removed. We're relying on the muscles and tendons and bearing surface conformity. We can diagnose instability with um, valgus and varus um, stress tests and look for a thrust. Often it'll manifest just as swelling and pain. And this patient here who is not confident, she has difficulty going downstairs because of just not a feeling of confidence in that knee. If we test them, we can do a Lockman's test or an anterior draw, and you can see in this replaced knee the amount of anterior posterior movement. So we studied this a couple of years ago, looking at 60 patients with four different knee designs, uh, cruciate retaining knees and a medial pivot knee. We used a KT1000 at 30 and 90 degrees to measure and, and categorise the knees as stable and unstable. When we categorise them as stable and unstable, you can see there was no difference in the age, the BMI or the gender, but there was a significant difference between the stable and unstable knees in these four different designs for these outcome scores, uh, forgotten joint score, Coos, particularly Coos Sport, uh, Womack and Oxford scores. And you can see Coos Sport is the one there with the stable knees in yellow, the unstable knees in red, Coos sport is the real the questions that differentiate these patients most strongly. So that's questions about difficulty with squatting, running, jumping, twisting, pivoting, and kneeling. So there's something about these activities that when they produce this anterior force and there's instability, it makes the patient unhappy with that. So a little bit on the design of implants. There are basically three broad categories of design, medial stabilised design or medial pivot, the cruciate retaining and the cam and post. The medial stabilised design is fully congruent and so it doesn't matter um, if the force is directed anteriorly, it'll still be a normal force without shear. The CR and the cam and post designs both have uh, some form of round on flat and so there is a shear force. And it's this shear component that produces the anterior movement of the femur on the tibia and I believe the swelling, discomfort and lack of confidence. So the medial stabilised design or medial pivot design is stable no matter whether the ligaments are stable or not. And when we looked at the medial stabilised versus non-medial stabilised in those groups, uh, we did see that there was a difference in the stability and a difference in the patient reported outcome scores in those different designs. We then went on to model these um, using kinematic modelling and I'll show you what happens in a deep knee bend with these designs. So the medial stabilised design on the right, the first nine degrees in red, there's no movement, and then it simply rolls back a bit. The posterior stabilised and the cruciate retaining both displays anteriorly before they roll back in the model. I'd like to just talk a bit about conformity ratios. There's some designs talk about this. And I'd like to use an analogy of a total hip replacement. So we're mentioning a total hip replacement on the left there of with a conformity ratio of once that's a 36 millimeter head and a 36 cup. If you had a conformity ratio of 0.76, that would give you like a 27 millimeter head and a total hip in a 36 millimeter cup. Conformity ratio of 0.3 would be like putting an 11 millimeter head in a 36 cup. We don't do this in total hip replacements, but we do it in knee replacements all the time because somehow we think it's acceptable to have conformity ratios less than one, and I believe this causes the instability that gives the um, symptoms to our patients. So in conclusion, extensive instability is not well tolerated and may lead to revision. Flexion instability is related to inferior prongs, especially sporting activities, and more congruent knees are inherently stable. Thank you for your attention. Good afternoon. We're going to talk about simultaneous bilateral to the knee replacement. I had the opportunity to practice in the States uh, for, for uh, almost 20 years. And I have to admit, I've never done simultaneous bilateral knee replacement in the United States. In the Middle East, there is a different reality. Patients are different. Pathology is different. And I have done thousands of simultaneous bilateral to the knee replacement and, and the finding use in a certain patient. So reality in the Middle East is that they, can't, they present to you in advanced disease with a horrible deformity and significant bone loss. And you have to solve their situation. If you do a single knee, 
you're not going to solve their situation like in this lady. So you have one chance to succeed. And the reality also that some people have a horrible deformity. And if you correct one leg, uh, the, the, the corrected leg will be longer and the patient will be uncomfortable, such in this case. It's even a necessity if a patient had a, a flexion uh, contracture. Because if you do one with flexion, one new patient had a flexion contracture, that flexion contracture is going to recur uh, if you don't correct the other knee. The other reality also that we have in the Middle East that is the fact that patients like to kneel down uh, on the ground. And kneeling down required by uh, both knees to be functional. When you want to look into literature, you will find conflicting papers. I can get you papers that go for it and goes against it. So it's really, I, it's like a game. Uh, so I gathered here a number of uh, uh, papers which shows that you have less infection when you do a simultaneous bilateral knee. You have less hospitalization, shorter anesthesia. You have a better knee score after six months if you do simultaneous bilateral knee. And there is no mortality difference. Uh, so again, you could find from the paper whatever, but the, normally it has a better recovery than uh, dragging the patient to do one and then the other one. And infection is def different uh, and, uh, and the cost is definitely less. And also uh, it's not, does not increase. Some paper shows it clearly that it doesn't increase morbidity and mortality. And those are a few uh, great articles uh, that I, I find uh, uh, give good details about simultaneous bilateral knee replacement. So the reality is most Asian surgeons perform it. The number is increasing in the United States. Uh, in, in my practice, it is, it's a must, especially with the flexion contracture. And, but I have to caution you, it takes a lot of pre uh, uh, preparation to do it. So the uh, majority of the cases right now that I do, 82% uh, of my cases are simultaneous bilaterally. And I use the vastest approach. Uh, I have, you have to have a special team working with you. You cannot really, uh, you have to plan it intraoperatively and you have to uh, train your team to do that. So I have a, usually a joint replacement task force and through this task force, we're organizing, we do training for our staff. You have to plan where the staff are going to uh, stand up in your operating room. Otherwise, it's going to be chaotic. You don't need a lot of people. And we prep the, both knees together. And normally, I start with one assistant on one side, uh, finish up the first knee. And you can see I have only one scrub nurse. And then uh, after I cement, I st they start doing the approach on, on, the second, uh, on the second knee. We keep minimum instrumentation so they don't cross and we have contamination. Surprisingly, the, our OR time difference between single and bilateral is only 45 minutes. And, uh, you know, you could see that we have done that a lot of time. And here is a case where the patient had a horrible virus deformity and she obtained uh, full reflection after uh, to the knee replacement. The point that I'm trying to tell you, it is very important in my region because they want to flex, they want to sit on the ground. If you don't do that to them, uh, they're, they're not going to like surgery. This is a gentleman who had simultaneous bilateral. You can see that he is bending fully and he can kneel on his, uh, on his, uh, in, in both knees comfortably. My argument, you have to choose, uh, choose your patient uh, I think it's relatively safe. It is more economical. And it is important where you have a severe flexion deformity or a severe virus deformity, or you have a patient who is totally disabled, can't, can't walk. You have to be prepared that the blood loss is a, limit, uh, is a limiting factor. You know, good 70% of my patients get uh, transfused after surgery. And you have to have a good team working with you. You cannot just decide one day and say, okay, I'm going to start doing bilateral knee replacement. You have to plan it and organize it. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank the organizing committee for asking me to give a talk. The subject is update on total knee in rheumatoid arthritis and the role of constrained implants. I'd like to thank my co-author, Nilesh Patil, for his help in preparing this presentation. My disclosures, total knee replacement for rheumatoid arthritis. 
Case numbers have greatly decreased in the past two decades due to improved disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. The rates of hip and knee replacement for RA have declined up to 40%, according to the rheumatology literature. And in a recent Mayo Clinic series, 5.6% of complex primary TKRs had a diagnosis of inflammatory arthropathy. Reported outcomes in the long term have generally been very good. Uh, the 2013 Journal of Arthroplasty paper showed a large U.S. database studies. RA patients were younger and female and compromised only 3.4% of a very large number of total needs. Infection rate was no noted to be higher, otherwise no differences in complication rates were found. Studies indicate that implant survivorship overall may be better for RA than OA patients, presumably due to lower demand and activity level as well as lower BMI. Longer-term follow-up studies have also reported higher incidence of periprosthetic fracture as well as infection compared to OA patients. Surgical challenges remain for the rheumatoid patients, especially correction of severe coronal and flexion deformities, ligamentous instability due to severe attenuation, as well as massive surgical releases that are sometimes necessary to obtain adequate correction in the coronal and flexion extension planes. There also can be severe osteoporosis and erosive defects. Constrained total knees were in, introduced in the late 80s uh, by Dr. Insall at HSS. The deep dish ultra congruent designs came in in the 2000s, as well as intermediate constrained options in primary TKR. Ligament repair and reconstruction techniques historically have not been reliable. Uh, constrained implants introduced in the 1980s and early 90s were meant to address this ligamentous insufficiency, as well as bone loss in the revision setting. Indications for use of constrained implants in the primary setting are still unclear, but is usually severe valgus with an incompetent MCL. The constrained TKR is a modification of the posterior stabilized type design. There's a higher, thicker tibial post with a corresponding wider and deeper box cut on the femur. Most designs allow for two to three degrees of varus valgus and rotational freedom, and the higher, higher, deeper post and box can also address hyperextension, asymmetrical flexion instability, and mid-flexion instability to some extent. The concerns for using uh, constrained total knee in primary setting are increased loosening rates due to increased forces transmitted to the fixation interface, potential implant failure at multiple modular junctions, and this has been reported in the literature, tibial insert dissociation, increased polywear, especially the post, and the literature still remains sparse on the subject. Controversies also include the necessity of using a stem augmentation. The literature is growing but limited and we'll take a look at it in a moment. And there is also the added morbidity and increased surgical time from the additional bone preparation and final implant assembly. Intermediate constrained options have been offered now by most companies, but the role for this is still unclear. When preoperative planning for constrained implant, the usual x-rays and assessment and physical examination, and arrange for anticipated implant needs with company representatives. Once decided to use constrained implants, additional steps are necessary for both femur and tibia with reaming. How much stem extension is not well defined. Minimum extension of 30 millimeters is available for most manufacturers and is probably adequate in the low demand patient. On the femoral side, there is a wider and deeper box cut. Reaming is necessary to accept stem base and extension. And again, the shortest length is usually 50 to 60 millimeters in most manufacturers and is probably enough in the low demand patient. As far as the literature, it is not much. Uh, there was a series from our institution in 1998, as well as some uh, papers from the Lukavich group showing good survivorship at 10 to 15 years. I was able to find one paper on uh, exclusively on the use of constrained condylar implants in rheumatoid arthritis from Japan. They had 23 constrained total knees in 17 patients, 14 of which were primary, and the survivorship was 92% with one loosening. Musa's study in 2017 looked at the early results of 85 stem constrained versus 354 intermediate non-stem constrained. A third of the patients were inflammatory arthritis, although it did not specify exactly how many were RA. With minimum two-year follow-up, the operative time was longer in the STEM group, but the revision rate was higher in the intermediate constraint group. They concluded that the results supported the use of STEMs in constrained total knee. This recent paper was a meta-analysis of 30 articles, compromising over 3,600 total constrained total knees. The early failure rates were low, 
However, they sounded a note of concern as rising revision rates were noted beyond 12 years. This very recent paper from last month shows 143 constrained total knees with 24 primaries. The diagnosis in the primary group was not clearly specified, although they showed 100% survivorship in that primary group. They found that male smokers and obese patients had higher risk for revision. So in summary, constrained total knee replacements are now widely available in most markets. The indications and long-term results of the use of constrained implants in primary total knee are still unclear and even less so in RA cases. It is technically more complex than the standard primary total knee, and surgeons vary greatly as to the threshold for bone constraint. The current indications from the literature seem to be quite narrow at present, given improvements in surgical techniques and improved implants. There is general agreement that the constrained total knee is a useful option when necessary. It is good for elderly and low-demand patients such as RAs, and there are clear indications in the cases of gross collateral insufficiency, especially the MCL, or destabilization from massive releases. The literature at this point is supportive of its use with no reports of grossly increased rates of loosening or periprosthetic fracture in the, in the midterm. Thank you very much and looking forward to the discussion session. Hi everyone, my name is Yasu Oshima from Nippon Medical School. Today, I will talk about the influence of PCL resection on tibiofemoral joint gap in TKA. In PSTK for virus knee or early, it has been considered as a common knowledge that tibiofemoral joint gap in fraction is dominantly increased after PCL resection compared with that in extension. However, do you think is it really a common knowledge in current TKA? When we talk about the soft tissue balance in TK for virus knee, gold standard, which is believed to be a common sense, has been considered to obtain the rectangular and symmetric gap with medial soft tissue release as a classical alignment method. However, current trend which might be a new normal, has been considered to accept an asymmetric gap with medial soft tissue preservation. As the great man of the past said, we need to know the effect of this rejection on the gap with and without the soft tissue release. So today, I will introduce the recent trend to obtain physiological knee kinematics with preserving medial soft tissue post TKA and the influence of PCL resection on tibial femoral joint gap. PCL resection has been believed to increase the fraction gap compared with the extension gap in previous TKA, and this is one of the most reliable articles to support this theory. However, this phenomenon was measured after the bone rejection and the medial soft release. Therefore, this phenomenon was thought to be evaluated under unphysiological knee condition. The physiological gaps in healthy knee has been reported to be trapezoidal and asymmetric. The influence of medial soft tissue release for knee stability was also evaluated, and the results showed that the excessive release of DMCL and POL resulted in the bulbous and rotatory instability. For these reasons, instead of the classical, rectangular, and symmetry gap, recently it has been trained to preserve medial soft tissues and to accept trapezoidal and asymmetric gap. So we hypothesize that the variation of the gaps with PCL rejection are different with and without medial soft tissue release, and the influence of PCL rejection on the gaps in both knee or air as evaluated under the existence of medial soft tissue as a physiological knee condition. Patients with both knee or air and received PSTK were included in this study. As you would like to know, the physiological phenomenon of the knees. After knee arthrotomy with medial parapatial approach, medial joint capsule was separated down to reaching the anterior edge of the MCL, 
but the initial itself was placed up as much as possible. The gaps were measured just after the knee outsmoking, and again measured after AC and PC resections under the existence of MCL and osteophytes. The gaps in medial and lateral were measured separately with the gap balancer under the destruction force of 120 newtons, and the anterior posterior position of the tibia relative to the femur were maintained when measuring the gaps. The results show that most knees were severe both knee or leg. At the first gap measurement under the resistance of the ligaments and osteophytes, the physiological knee OA showed the trapezoidal and asymmetry gap, which is similar to the healthy young patients. Where we calculated the increase of the gaps in both in extension and in fraction with AC and PCL resections. The gaps were not significantly increased and most were less than 0.5 millimeters. PCL has been reported to be a first restraint to posterior tibial translation and the second restraint for balls and bolus and rotational stability. Moreover, MCL is the first restraint for the bulbous stress in which SMCL is the first and the DMCL is the second. In the present study, under the existence of the first restraint for the bulbous stress, although PCL, which is the second restraint for the bulbous stress, is rejected, the gaps were maintained. This is also one of the famous articles which supports the increase of the gaps with PCL rejection. They concluded that the ACL rejection increases the extension gap, and the PCL rejection increases the flexion gap. However, they removed one centimeter of periosteum from the medial tibia. But they didn't mention about the medial soft tissue. The DMC attachment is 6.5 mm from the joint line, and so some of the DMC might be released. At least the gap changes were clinically small. Based on these results, in our institution, osteophytes are all removed from medial to posterior medial of tibia and femur. However, DMCL as well as POL are preserved as much as possible to preserve the physiological and kinematics with asymmetric joint gap. Our conclusion is that in recent TK for bowel's knee OA with preserving medial soft tissue to obtain natural knee kinematics, PCL rejection is not influenced for tibial femoral joint gap. Thank you very much. Today, my topic is surgical navigation technique and uh, soft tissue stress management in total knee osteoplasty. I'm Dr. Hong Kai from Peking University, third hospital in Beijing, China. In recent years, the trend of uh, digital total knee osteoplasty has taken shape, which is also affecting in China the application of navigation, robots, sensor, PSI, etc., were gradually increased. We can obtain an accurate prone and sagittal alignment of the lower extremities, uh, rotational position of the femur through navigation, and a determined amount of the osteotomy and the size of the processes. But where is the goal of the soft tissue balance? How can it be accurately achieved? Current robots cannot tell us the balance of the soft tissues, and the doctors still need to be make a decision. Now we can get a balance chart by navigating. Uh, from the balance chart, uh, it seems that the figure is, uh, is only 0 0.5 millimeters away from the extension and uh, flexion, which looks very balanced. But is this balance we want? Questions are, what is the joint tension under the current gap? 
what is the acceptable difference between the media side and the lateral side of the faction extension gap? Is this the best balance in the physiological state or in the prosthetic state? How to choose the thickness of the insert if there is no one millimeter gradient insert? In fact, this is not essentially uh, different from the balance judgment method taught to us by the professor Ranawat at the 15 years ago. Similarly, you needed to give a various or vulgar stress to judge the degree of opening and to determine balance based on it. Uh, usually we use two fingers to touch or use a block or trial to test the tightness and the balance of the soft tissue. This is all subjectively judgment based on experience. The tension increases regardless of extension or flexion. The gap is increasing and the imbalance of various also increased. The stiffness of the media and the lateral side the soft tissue is inconsistent and the lateral side is smaller than the media side at all angles from extension to flexion. In a flexion position, the tension of the media side and the lateral side of the sub-tissue is unbalanced. From the literature, we can see under various stress, the lateral joint space opens by 6.7 millimeters. Under the walker stress, the media joint space opens by 2.1. The normal knee joint flexion is not a rectangular gap, and the lateral side is significantly more relaxed. So this is the uh, balanced chart without stress. After exposure, keep ACL, PCL intact and no osteophyte removal, no releasing. We can see the media side tightness. If we apply the maximum various workers stress, uh, the media side and lateral gap increases more obviously in the flexion positions. Uh, balanced chart with, this is the balanced chart without osteophyte removal and a soft tissue releasing, cutting ACL and a PCL and applying conventional varus vagus stress. You can see the only media side gap in the flexion increased. In the trial phase, convention stress is applied and the imbalance always exists between 1 to 1.5 millimeters. If we apply the maximum various vulgar stress is applied and the imbalance increased between 2.5 to 3 millimeters. So from literature, we, we know if the, the gap is two millimeters tighter, the contact pressure increased by 54 to 131% at a zero degree, the CR and more bearing presses are more obvious. If two millimeters looser, the contact pressure is reduced by 33 to 84% at zero degree. So this is also confirmed uh, by uh, my research. I used a sensor system and in 20 total neoplasty. Uh, these patients are also osteitis combined with mitral virus. Flexion contracture less than 20 degree. We used the PS processes, gap balancing technique. Uh, the media gap pressure was significantly increased at extension and flexion as the thickness of the sensor increased in most patients, while the lateral gap pressure changed without a specific trend. The average media gap pressure was significantly larger than the average lateral gap pressure at both at the floor extension and a 90 degree flexion position. Now we have some tools that can help us determine the force of the soft tissue tension. For example, this is a torsion based gap uh, tension balance device. And this device can provide one pound power indication. However, these are steer mechanical device with relatively poor accuracy and they cannot be displayed continually. Electrical pressure sensors are now also available, but we are still learning and understanding the best sub tissue balance tension options in knee replacement. The combined use of these electronic, electronic devices and the traditional technologies can enable us to more objectively understand the state of the soft tissue balance. If combined with navigation and robots, it will help us to obtain better and acceptable soft tissue tension under the controllable alignments and the gaps. Even we can guide the autotomy after reaching the optimal line of force under the balanced tension. 
So conclusion, the goal of the soft tissue balance needs more in-depth research. The method of realization must be assisted by a pressure sensor, real-time post-line acquisition, and a planning combined with pressure values are the core of future digital technologies. Navigation is a necessary condition to assist in obtaining alignment. The robotic is the only way to accurately achieve the target under the condition of the determination. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I would request Arun Mudaji to start the discussion and question and answer, and I will uh, do the later part. Arun, please go ahead. So it's been a great session with wonderful speakers and great talks. First, uh, let's talk to Bill. Firstly, Bill, congratulations on uh, getting the FDA approval for the NAV bit. That's a great thing. Great achievement. Thanks, which, case, which cases, Bill, would you not use a medial pivot knee? Are there some patients whom you would not? Is that your standard uh, go-to implant? Uh, thank you, Arun. Um, thanks for the question. So the, the medial pivot knee relies really on balancing the medial compartment of the knee. And so if you've got a varus knee, it's ideal. I would say if you have mild valgus, uh, you could still use a medial pivot knee. But if there's severe valgus where you, don't, where you can't balance the medial compartment because you have an incompetent medial collateral ligament, then I would say that would be a case for a more constrained uh, cam post design. And uh, because you're using a medial pivot knee, are you a little more relaxed in the type of soft tissue release you do medially because you know that the implant will confer stability? Exactly. So it's not as critical to get uh, the tension perfect on the soft tissues with a medial uh, pivot knee because the bearing gives you stability. So if you're using a CR knee and you have a bit of laxity, in, on your MCL, then it will, it will translate as instability, but with a medial pivot knee, uh, it's more forgiving. We have a question from the audience. Uh, the question for you, Bill, uh, the, the surgeon concern has been using a medial pivot for several years, but although the initial results are good, uh, doesn't seem to be any superiority with uh, CR or other standard implants. Any reason for that? Well, it depends how you measure, I guess, the benefit. There are a lot of surgeons who have used other designs who come to a medial pivot who say they do see a difference. And there are studies, uh, you know, Roger Brighton and others, randomized studies showing that there is a benefit measurable in proms. But it's difficult, isn't it, to have the sensitivity with our our methods of measuring superiority with knees. Shahid, do you have any queries? Um, I would ask the panelists that what percentage are using medial pivot routinely uh, among the faculty? Um, Sami? Uh, I use it only when I feel uh, that the, the, the PCL in a CR knee is really dysfunctional. In another word, if I see that there is some instability and to posteriorly, I use the, uh, uh, the medial pivot knee. Okay. I think the literature around the world would say 15% of all total knee uh, in the world are done medial pivot. And it has been there in market for quite a, some time, but it is gradually picking up. So my uh, next question again uh, to Samit Arabici that uh, uh, yes, in the Middle East and in Asian countries, we come across severe bilateral and I agree totally my practice. Are there any contraindications of doing a bilateral properly in place? The contraindication is uh, dictated mainly by the anesthesiologist. So if he told me that, no, we're not doing it uh, simultaneously, then I'll, uh, you know, I'll go along with it. 
So the anesthesiologist is the one who usually blocks it. On, on, from orthopedic point of view, I do it in, uh, practically uh, in all the uh, all severe cases. But the contraindication is anesthesia and sometimes something like cortex stenosis uh, is a problem. So they, they instruct me not to do it and I comply. So Sami, I have two questions about this. Uh, have you ever had to bail out from a bilateral, let's say after the first side, has the anesthetist ever told you, no, don't go ahead? And if so, why? Uh, I can remember only two incidents when this happened. And uh, it was, an ex I think it has to do with your preoperative team. Uh, but uh, only two incidents, you're talking about thousands of cases. And yes, it, it happened and it, it was kind of unexpected uh, blood pressure fluctuation. So we abandoned. And are there any special precautions uh, that you use in a bilateral which you would not perhaps use in a unilateral case? Uh, the percussion uh, mainly you have to be prepared, like I said, for blood transfusion. You know, 70% almost get uh, reinfused, although I, I use a cyclocapron, but it's still you have to be prepared for that. And I normally, in the, in the first day, I keep them in the uh, uh, intensive care unit, not just to, to monitor their flu. Uh, but the at first night we give them in the ICU. And do you use a tourniquet in these patients? Always. And normally I inflate the, uh, the first one and uh, after cementing, you know, like I said, the uh, the other team will, will start opening the, the, uh, the second knee uh, after I cement. So after we cement, we deflate. But there is... A period of time, about 15 to 20 minutes, where we have bilateral tourniquet inflated. Arun, can I make a comment? Of course. On the bilateral? Professor Sammy, excellent talk. Um, I think also uh, your point about the transfusions as well as the convenience to the patient. Um, I, like you, I have practiced in both Asia and the United States. And certainly a lot of patients in the Asia Pacific prefer to get this done in one shot. I think in the United States and Western countries, it's fallen out of favor. Uh, a lot of that has to do with our insurance and, and government regulations, as well as our the, the general societal aversion to transfusions, even though transdynamic acid has greatly, greatly decreased that. And there are blood management strategies to, to, to address that. But again, excellent paper. And I think uh, one take home point from Professor Sumner is you gotta have a good team and an efficient team. And then, it, then it'll work well and the patients will be very satisfied. Thank you. So Chris, this brings me to your talk. And that was excellent, uh, a great summary of the problems faced in rheumatoid patients. So many of them do have bilateral problems. So how do you tackle the situation in the US? I know you don't see uh, rheumatoid that often, but when you do see them with bilateral problems, would you do it? Yes, I think, uh, again, Professor Sammy had a good point that Sometimes the other knee is so bad that it will not withstand the rehabilitation. So functionally, uh, you know, flexion contractures of 90 degrees, and you have a good paper on this uh, this subject. So certainly when they get into that level of deformity, uh, a bilateral will, will, should be considered. Even though uh, our rheumatoid patient numbers have fallen so drastically in the U.S., as well as the level of deformity in which they come in now. So this is not a, a, a common situation, although when it was in the 90s, uh, when you and I came out of training, uh, we did a lot of bilaterals in the rheumatoid setting. And you talked about the use of stems and constrained implants uh, in rheumatoid patients. What would your preference be? Would you use a short cemented stem or a long cementless one and then risk uh, end of stip, uh, tip pain and so on? Great question, Arun. And this was touched on in, in your last panel with Ben Barry in the obese patient. Usually in a, in a primary for a rheumatoid, we're going to have a low demand patient. Sure, the shortest stem option is preferable. I agree with you. Don't want to start putting a reamer way down into the to the isthmus of the tibia or up into or farther up in the femur. You've got to preserve that endosteal bone and stick with a minimum stem. 
I prefer to use the insole technique of the lightly cemented stem, non-pressurized. Just put some cement around the stem, not pressurizing or using the cement plug like in a hip. Lightly cementing it and doing standard cement uh, techniques at, at the cut surfaces. And would you have reservations using constrained implants with stems in young patients? Because typically these rheumatoid patients, some of them are juvenile rheumatoids that we see. Uh, would you have some concerns with these constrained implants? Or would you try and stick to a less constrained ones? Another great question, Arun. Um, I think in general, all of us on the panel would agree that to try to go with the least constraint possible. And that's an intraoperative uh, decision. Uh, but the literature is bearing out, though, that using the, the with a minimum stem length and a constrained option in the rheumatoid patient, the long-term survivorship has been quite good. Um, and I also look forward to, to Professor Hongzhai's uh, comments for this, because certainly I enjoy his talk very much, and the digitization of our ability to collect intraoperative and real-time data is going to have a role as, as, as our decision-making to go to the level of constraint intraoperatively. I agree with him 100% on that. And when you advocate uh, discontinuation of uh, disease-modifying drugs in these patients before surgery, or do you leave it to the rheumatologists? Yes, yeah, so we, uh, we leave it to the rheumatologists, but in general, it's a month. Methotrexate right. at least two weeks to a month, and holding for at least two weeks to a month postoperatively, depending on whether their symptomatology can handle it or not. Right. I have some questions for Yasushi, if if uh, that's okay with you. Yes. Please go ahead. Uh, you mentioned uh, a very interesting uh, topic um, on the influence of PCL resection. Uh, what is the effect of the osteophyte removal before and after osteophyte removal? What's happening to your gaps? Have you looked at that? Yeah, thank you very much. That is a good point. The, actually, we uh, tried to see the uh, original uh, or any condition. So that's why we try to keep the osteophytes and then cut the PCL. However, in our cases, some has a, some have a big osteophytes and the others have less osteophytes, but the PCL resection was not uh, different in these cases. So that's why I believe if even we removed osteophytes, that could uh, correct the virus contracture, but the joint gap is not much different. Because when you excise the osteophyte, you have to release the deep MCL. So the initial part of your uh, presentation mentioned that if you release the deep MCL, your gaps will change. We believe that uh, the MCL is attached under the osteophytes. So that's why the, when we do the surgery, we try to protect the DMCL with like a retractor and then uh, try to uh, carefully remove the osteophytes itself and then try to uh, preserve it. Also, after we remove the osteophytes, we check the DMCL fibers and uh, almost all of the fibers could be protected. Okay. Great study. Great study, Asushi. Thank you very much. And we have a last few minutes to ask uh, Hong Kai some questions because uh, I also use a similar sort of navigation and uh, gap balancing. So what I want to ask uh, Hong, Hong Kai is, how do you balance uh, the knee yourself? Do you use a tensioner? Do you leave the extension gap tighter, medially, laterally, or they're equal? And what do you do in flexion? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Malach. I, th I think now it's hard to answer this question because you know when we learn to how to balance the knee usually we use the the objective that we do the various uh or more stress and we check the the gap uh one or two millimeters it, it will be okay but now um, we have a lot of uh, electronic uh, device and uh, we we find it's uh, maybe 15 newtons uh difference between the media side or the latter side uh, you you can find that there's only one millimeter gaps open, and uh, uh, but when you uh, check the the flexion gap, and the extension gap, the, the flexion gap always is bigger than the extension gap. So I'm confused how to balance if we use the electronic device. It's a 15 newtons or 30 newtons difference, 
but uh, uh, in the traditional techniques, I always check the two millimeters uh, open is okay uh, between the uh, meter side and letter side. But I think it's uh, it's an, it's an, it will be changed when we use the device. Is that locked? Can we unlock it a bit? Yes, a bit closer. Okay, gentlemen, you're live, Miles. Thanks, Andrew. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Miles Culligan from Sydney. And together with Nico Badit-Barama and Guozhong Zhang, we're moderating this total knee replacement by my friend and colleague, Mark Platworthy from the Ascot Hospital in Auckland, New Zealand. Mark is going to perform a Valis robotically assisted solution knee surgery, tibia first, ligament guided, patient specific alignment, total knee replacement. So Mark, over to you and welcome. Thank you, Miles. And just one more thing, we're going to be using the Attune implant today. So I've got my A team today with Mia, and Alicia, they were the first ones in the world to do this. So we've got the team back today. Thank you for coming to view this. And what we're going to do is just show a, a video just to explain some of the technology, some outcome data, and introduce the patient. Uh, while that's playing, I'll do the approach, and we'll come back to me for the array implantation and morphing the knee. So uh, enjoy the talk, and I'll see you soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mark. Yep. Hello, everybody. I am Mark Clatworthy from Auckland, New Zealand. I'd like to thank APAS for giving me the opportunity to present and show to you today the Pusynthes, a new FDA-approved robot, the Velis Robotic Assisted Solution. We were the first surgeons in the world to use this device in November last year. We've now done 60 cases, and it's just been commercially launched in the US. The Velis Assisted Robotic Solution consists of a sleek, low-profile, fast, efficient robot mounted to the bed. On the left is the base station, the screen and the camera. On the right is the docking station with another screen for surgeon input. The Velis Robotic Assisted Device brings a new technology to totally arthroplasty. Natural control proprietary technology maintains the saw cut plane to help execute precise, reproducible surgeon control cuts. The high speed camera, triple drive motion technology, and pure side hydrophobic optical reflectors work together to adjust and control the resection plane for accurate, consistent execution of the plan. The camera is 250 hertz versus 60 hertz of Mako, so it's four times faster. The compact design makes it easy to execute all cuts from a bed-mounted position. You will see in the case today that Velis provides valuable insights for optimal TKA implantation, with gap balance data to help the surgeons visualize and predict resulting joint stability. On the left, natural joint assessment, which is pre-resection assessment of alignment and predicted gap balance to help surgeons plan for optimal attuned knee implant position. In the centre, the ProAdjust planning screen, which is a single page planning to easily adjust parameters, helping surgeons personalise alignment and balance relative to the soft tissues. And on the right, the AccuBalance graft, where soft tissue stability graft provides balancing data throughout the full range of motion prior to execution of bony cuts to help surgeons visualise and predict joint stability. The clinical application performs a fast anatomy registration and knee balance assessment. It assists planning without using any pre-op imaging, so there's no input from any CT or X-rays. So the joint surface bony anatomy and soft tissue envelope determine optimal component positioning. It assesses the balance consequence of the TK implantation. It supports four techniques, femur first, tibia first, hybrid, which is mechanical axis tibial and distal femoral cut with a balanced flexion gap, and tibia first patient specific alignment. The technique we're going to use for the case today is patient-specific alignment, tibia-first, ligament-guided. 
I first developed this technique in 2014 and have done over a thousand cases with Brain Lab 3. We've further developed it with a ballus. The concept is to implant the TKA as anatomically as possible with small positional changes made to accurately balance the knee within its natural soft tissue envelope. We initially removed the peripheral osteophytes, then collect the deformity and correctability. We then range the knee to evaluate the soft tissue envelope to create the accurate balance graph. We then use the ProAdjust planning screen to modify the TKA position to balance the knee. We then cut the proximal tibia with vellus. We remove posterior osteophytes and release tight capsule if present. Then insert the ligament tensor and range the knee to create a post-tibial resection acubalance graph. We then use the ProAdjust screen to modify the femoral component position optimally. And finally cut the femur with vellus. I'd like to present to you today some outcome data using this technique with Brain Lab 3. We published in case today in 2020 287 patients with two year data. The mean Oxford score was 43, Womack score was 9.2, forgotten knee score is 67.4, whose joint replacement score was 75.5, and patient satisfaction is 90.2. We now have over a thousand patients with prospective data and we now have 611 patients at two years who have almost exactly the same outcome scores as these 287 patients which were published. The five-year data are 961 patients and surely shows an improvement in all outcome scores with an Oxford score of 44.4, WOMAC 7.8, forgotten knee score 76.4, Coos joint replacement 88.3 and patient satisfaction at 92.4. We have recently compared 161 patients with the five year data using this technique with the average total knee, unicompartmental, and total hip score from our New Zealand Joint Registry. So the Oxford score for total knees 40.5, the uni 41.4 a total hip 42.4, whereas the patient specific alignment technique had a mean score of 44.4. Interestingly, if you look at the number of fair and poor scores, we have one quarter compared to the average knee in New Zealand, and one third compared to the average uni and total hip. The patient details is a 57-year-old male with a range of motion from 5 to 120 degrees. He has a various deformity which is partially correctable. I don't normally do a three foot standing x rays, but for this case I have. The long x ray shows six degrees of mechanical varus, the tibia is in eight degrees of varus, and the femur in two degrees of valgus. The pre op outcome scores are an Oxford score of 10, a forgotten joint score of 12.5, Womack score of 63. A coos 12 of 12.5. He rates his worst pain at 91 out of 100. His rest pain at 80 out of 100. He says his knee normal score with zero is completely abnormal. 100 is a normal knee is 49 out of 100. On the weight bearing AP x ray, you can see he has bone on bone with quite a lot of media osteophytes. Good preservation of the lateral compartment. Uh, the lateral is important for me. I want to evaluate posterior osteophyte both on the femur and tibia. So he has a relatively normal looking patellofemoral joint and the three foot standing x-ray shows that the mechanical axis is medial. Well, Mark, we finished the video. Take us well, through the operation. Ready to go. So just to introduce, show, just to have a look at the patient's knee here. Uh, we'll see the patient's got medial compartment OA, really quite a lot of anteromedial OA down to bone here, here. Uh, there's full thickness loss of the trochlea, but good preservation of the lateral compartment and of the patella. Uh, the first thing I do is remove peripheral osteophytes. They tend to collateral ligaments. This is uh, a technique where we want to use the soft tissue envelope. 
So the first thing is to grab a rongeur and to resect the posterior osteophytes, so the tibial, the medial tibial osteophytes of the tibia, and then a small uh, one centimeter osteotome, and then I take those, next size up actually, once more, and then we take those off the medial side. I only resect those that are, are distal to the MCL, so we'll just take the osteophytes off here. Just while you're doing that, Mark, you mentioned that the trochlea was fairly badly worn. Are you going yep. to resurface the patella? The patella looks pristine, which is interesting. Ron Jure, please. And so are you, are you are you a sometimes resurfacer, a never resurfacer, an always resurfacer? Uh, I'm a most times resurfacer. So in this case, the patient's relatively young. He has um, small Ron Jure, and he has a good preservation, so I'm going to leave it. Okay, so the next thing we now is put in the arrays. I used to put my arrays down here for a long period of time, but we had some skin issues. I now put it in the incision. Uh, my approach is really to do a very limited medial release, just to release the deep MCL. So I just have these obliquely, and I just go into the far cortex. So I'm obviously heading towards, legging back down here, thanks. I'm heading towards the perineal nerve country. So I'm and Mark, you think that metaphyseal uh, fixation for your array reduces the chance of a stress fracture there later yep. on? As is that. And the other thing that I really like is it also gives me some uh, holes from which the, the lipid's going to come out. So I, I cement my knees. And so I really like the fact that, and I'll show this, demonstrate that when we put the cement in, we're going to get quite a lot of lipid coming out of those holes. So I'm going to get a really good cement mantle. Okay, as, they right say, as they say, Mark, fat is the enemy of cement. So I'm glad you're getting rid of it. Yep, fat, yep, fat, yep, exactly. So uh, if we get to, if we have enough time to show it, you'll see that I'm a pretty avid, I'm a very sort of anal cementer. Um, I have been using this technique since 2014, and we've done about 1,250 cases, and we have had no implant release. Push back further, thanks, Alicia. No, 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 put, bring your retractor. The other issue, of course, of putting the so the other important thing on the is yes. is that it, they can get in the way of the of the saw. That's not an issue for you. No, well, because I've got the very medial. If you see, so I think this is another very important point: is that I have my arrays very medial. They're literally going into the bare area. And so, therefore, I don't like going through the quad. But I think that's a bad thing to do. Okay. Okay, so we can then just line up. We're going to bring our robot into play now. Can we have a room, a view of the room so we can see how the robot sits in relation yeah, yeah, to sure. the patient? Okay, and we can go to that. It's good there. Yeah, we can give you a little room. I'm just going to drop it down a little bit. Okay, so we get a view of the room. Okay, so we're now just going to centre the robot on our arrays. I'm just going to check one thing, Andrew, just to make sure that looks good. Okay. We haven't got, we've, we right now we're cameras. still looking. If we can have a more panoramic view so we can see the setup of the room, where you have the robot, where you have your screens and your... Okay, your so you guys can work on that, thanks. So now we just centre our robot and camera, get it in sync. Okay, we locked that. We locked it. Okay, so we then go through the registration. The new which you see here is very swift. Put bloom here. What was that? Just thanks, Andrew. Okay, lock. Push me. Where my pointer? So I've made two marks on the tibia. Yep, blue. And on the femur. Are these so, are your checkpoints? My checkpoints. Okay, right. We're now going to acquire the centre of the femoral head. Push me. Ah, that's what we need. That's the view we need. Okay, is that working for you? Yeah. Well, what, what, uh, Mark? If you could just point out to the audience where you have your saw, your screens, um, how all the setup. So the, so the robot's attached to the bed. The saw is attached to the robot. I've got two screens, one opposite me, and one here, which is the one I use myself. And I really like using my own screen. I think it's very important for the surgeon to drive the screen themselves so they understand the technology. 
I'm not a fan of a technician planning the operation in advance. And the big thing for me is I want to evaluate the soft tissue envelope. And That's you can't great. Do that with a CT scan or a 2D to 3D image. So this is an operation that incorporates both the bony anatomy and the soft tissue envelope. Excellent. Okay, so we collect now the medial malleolus, push up, right. the lateral malleolus. Right. But while Mark is registering his points there, Nico, have you got any questions you might have? Yeah, um, it is, um, Mark, so if you look at the, um, the, uh, the, the this is very compact. As I, as I told you, uh, remember last week, it is very compact and it's not that bulky, right? So, uh, I, hey guys, can I just do one thing? Can I just register the knee? Let yep. me do that sequentially and then I'll answer some questions. Otherwise, we may never get to the off. So if that's okay, I might just go through the registration and then we can answer some questions. Is that okay? Sure. Yep. Okay, we'll get back to that later, Nico, but I just want to just go through the registration so it's not joined. There's some really important points I want to pull out, point out. So what I do here is just mark the tide mark where articular cartilage turns to bone on the medial side. So I just mark that point. Okay, so go, Mia. And then I mark it in the same MLAP position on the lateral side, which is normal. Go there, please. And then the slope. This is the centre where I put my rod if I was doing a manual technique. Go. White sides line. This is terrific, Mark. We've got a great view here. And now the medial side. Go. So You right, Mia? So what we've done is separate the distal and the posterior areas. I think that's important to do that. Go. I've found with some other technologies I've used which collect them both together, with a big knee you don't get enough posterior points. Okay, go now, posterior medial, go. Grab a curved home in there. You can hold that there, thanks Alicia. Okay, and go. Okay, if you can grab a Langenbeck, thanks Alicia. Now we measure the anterior cortex. That enables us to look at every size. Can I just have a home in there? In the, so we just make sure there's no soft tissue. Just come back under, under that soft tissue there, Mia. So Alicia, and come under that soft tissue. So we just got to make sure, and a swab to me. So this is an important point because it does the sizing. Okay, go. Okay, we need to confirm that our points are accurate. So we just go there. Make sure we've got a good model within the mill. Good there, good there, good there, and good there. Okay, so we've got a great model. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is just have a look at the deformity that we've got and its correctability. Okay, yep. Okay, so we've got a knee that sits on. It's in four degrees of varus, and we can correct it into three of valgus with five extension. I now want to look at the balance. I'll do a pre-plan looking at the balance for the soft tissue envelope here. So what we do is move the knee up to 90 degrees, and then rotate the hip to tension the median lateral side. So Mark, you've got four numbers on the right-hand side there. Well, you can just tell our audience. Here. Yep, I'm going to go through those now. So what that tells me, and this is a very important. So this basically shows you, so I've got my, my planning screen on the left, progress <coughs> planning screen, my accurate balance graft on the right. What this does is default to mechanical axis. So what that shows you, that if you put your tibia at zero, your femur at zero, and you externally rotate the component three degrees, you get this balance curve. So what it shows you is that on the bottom we've got 9.5 millimetres medial gap and extension, 6.5 lateral and extension, 11.5 medial flexion gap, and 12.5 lateral flexion gap. So if you did this using mechanical alignment, what you're going to have is too tight a knee laterally. So it's not going to, you're going to have to do a lateral release on the outside to balance your extension gap, 
But the problem will be by doing that, you're going to have unstable lateral flexion gap. So I've now got the, the, the balance consequence of a mechanical axis knee. The next thing I do is make this knee do a kinematic, which is a true anatomic measured resection. So to do that, I look at my tibia. I want to take 10 off the normal lateral side, because I'm going to look at using a six spacer, and I want to make it anatomic. So I use my tide marker. I've lost two millimeters of articular cartilage. So I want to have 10 and eight millimeters. So I then put my tibia into more varus until it's 10 and eight. Okay, so this tibia it lies anatomically in four degrees of varus. I then move to my femur, and here we'll see, and so what we want here is reverse. So we've actually got, so nine on the medial side, 4.5 on the lateral side. But with this knee, the lateral side is the normal side. So I only want, actually want to make this knee, it's actually the femur is in quite a lot of valgus. So we're gonna put this, determine what's anatomical. We want to take nine millimeters off because that's the thickness of the implant. So this knee actually anatomically is in a little bit of valgus. The, the femur is in 6.5 of valgus. The tibia is in four of varus. There's no articular cartilage loss on either the posterior medial or posterior lateral femoral condyle. So it's zero rotation relative to the posterior condyle axis. So, then we can look What's at the, the thickness the of the posterior condyles on the implant you're using? They're eight millimeters. So I'm going to adjust that to eight millimeters. Thank you. So then to actually make it truly anatomical. Another way. We can only So that gives you a guide. So it's eight millimeters thick. So what that'll give you is so a true canonic alignment knee is actually relatively well balanced. You've got a medial extension gap of 11.5 a lateral uh, extension gap of 10.5, a medial flexion gap of 12, and a lateral gap of 12.5. What we now do is make small positional changes to get optimal balance for this knee. It says we're going to use a seven femur, so we're going to get a size fem seven femur. What it does is actually it determines the femoral component size on the AP size, not the ML. We have a lot of ability to change our femoral component size by flexing and extending the component. So I want to look at my ML dimension. So I get my size 7 here. I measure it up, and the size 7 looks good. So I'm happy with the 7. If we now go back to our AccuBalance graft, then we want to make this uh, balance. So we're a little bit loose medially in extension. So I'm going to put my femur in a little bit more varus. So, so I'm going to put my... I'm going to put my tibia a little bit serious. Okay, and then I look at my extension gap. My extension gap is now balanced. I like that to be nine millimeters off. So 10.5, 10.5, what does I aim for? I need to take my posterior section out. And then I've now got my, you'll see that my extension gap is well balanced. My flexion gap is what I want, but I've got a slightly bigger flexion gap than extension gap. So I'm going to flex my femoral component to reduce that down. Okay. Right, so I've now got my, my plan. So here's my plan here. And so I'll now execute my plan. Now one point I want to make is we're making this plan before um, cutting the tibia, and particularly there's a lot of posterior osteophytes out that'll change the plan. So I want you to look at this plan now for the audience and see our numbers of 10.5, 10.5, 10.5, and 12.5, and see if that changes once we've cut the tibia. Okay, so just as you're cutting the tibia, Mark, uh, am I right in thinking that you're quite comfortable having a little bit more laxity on that lateral side in flexion, which is what you've got with yeah, the so, there? So I want to have two millimetres, and the reason for that is I want to replicate the lateral rollback of the femur in flexion. So what I'm aiming to do is restore more native knee kinematics, 
and we've been doing that for, for a long time now, by, so I'm building in that laxity lateral inflection on purpose, so I'm getting the lateral rollback of the femur inflection. Okay. Okay. I have questions about, I have questions about your uh, external rotation of the femur. Why did you uh, select the, the femoral, uh, femoral product um, zero external rotation? Oh, because that's, that's anatomical. Because it's a, it's a, it's a, okay. I've got normal articular cartilage there. That's so I start with that, but then I change it so I want my flexion gap to have that two millimeters more laxity. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, so what I one thing when you're using this new technology is your assistants are used to coming in and out of the plane uh, more often normal. So what we're going to do here is just get a little bit of a setup. So I'm just going to. Bring that forward so you can just hold that, but we need them to take that out of the way. So Mark, just whilst you're making that cut, I'm going to remind the audience, if you've got questions, please send them through. If you've got what, sorry? If they've got questions, I'm reminding the audience, yeah, yeah, please sure. send the questions through to us and we'll transmit them to you. Okay, all right, let's go. Push blue. Yeah, there's a question uh, that from Aaron Malagi. Can I? No, it's going to die first. Okay, if you can grab that, if you can just pass us the home in there. Right, so we're now going to cut out tibia. So we got that there. Got that there swab to me, thanks. And me, if you can pass me another home in. You can hold that there. Oh, oh. I know you can do that. Okay. Robot determines the plane of the cut, uh, the depth of the cut. What about the range of the cut? Hold it. Okay. All right, let's have the... What was that, sorry, Miles? Uh, the robot determines the plane of the cut and the depth of the cut. What about Everything. the range of the cut? No, no, so it's not haptic. Okay. Yeah. Take that out to keep it in your hand. But this is a question from Arun Malagi. What about the uh, hip and knee alignments are you shooting for? It's size four degrees. What's yeah, so the, this, this was basically a, a, a pretty neutral knee. It went from three of varus to two of valgus. So I'm using the soft tissue alignment. It's the soft tissues to guide my alignment. Okay, if we rip just a cut here, so we've got a pretty much... Good cut. We're one mil out. We've got the uh, slope and everything looks good. Okay, so I'm happy to roll with that. Any questions at all, stage? Okay, so we now basically put the row back to the home position and prepare for the female. Hit home. Thanks, Mia. Okay, so can I have the saw back? Thanks. So at this stage, I use the, hand, the saw. I have another saw here just to clean up my tibial cut. Okay, let's have a rondure. Osteopan, thanks. Let me just flex that forward. A rondure, please. So, uh, unlock, uh, unlike a lot of the other robotic techniques, which plan everything right from the start, this is different. So what we're doing here is preparing the tibia. Uh, don't open your hands. And I can hold that, yep. Preparing the tibia and then taking out any osteophytes, the menisci. And so what I talk about is putting the, the tibia, the, uh, putting the femoral component in the tibia, in the total knee space. Okay, so if I can have a rondure, thanks. And what we've found, because we've done a lot of research this, is often these gaps will change after you've cut the tibia and take things out. Okay, so we can put that back there. Thanks. We can grab a bone hook. Thanks, Alicia. 
So this is the best way to address the back of the knee. There's a lot of questions about surgeons who go femur first. Just watch that array in there. I'm sorry, we should just be careful that array. Uh, a lot of surgeons don't think you can actually assess the back of the knee well with just a tibial cut, and that's not true at all. What does make it easier is that because you're doing an anatomic tibial cut, you're actually taking more bone off the medial tibial plateau than you would if you're going for zero. So if you saw the numbers in this case, for a zero tibial cut was 10 off the lateral side and only 4.5 where we took ace off. So this patient doesn't have many posterior osteophytes. So I take the minute guy out. Any tips for the audience, Clats, in detecting that little lateral geniculate vessel and how to stop it causing a post-op yes, Yep, I use a diathermy here for that. So all my resections are through the diathermy. And then I'll actually come back and clean that up and have a look for that. Okay, so just a little tip. So if, if I did have a, some posterior osteophytes, I'm going to run through how I do that. It typically is quite a big osteophyte that sits here on the lateral aspect of the medial femoral condyle. I'm a cruciate retaining surgeon, and that will put tension on the PCL. So I just go down here, flip that out. That then enables me to put my finger down the back and feel the posterior medial femoral condyle. And then I can feel any osteophytes which are present, which are not. And then I can feel around the back. If I think my capsule's tight, and I've got a, which I don't have in this case, a fixed flexion to form me, I'll just go and release the capsule off. Okay, I then go and check my tibia, make sure that I've got no loose bits of bone there. We then put in our sensor tensor. We have the sensor tensor next. So this is a device we developed in 2005. We've done over 2,500 cases with it. So if you can see it, it basically has two springs that are linked. And this basically enables us to, to look at the soft tissue tension through the full range of motion. I find it's very useful to put this in inflection. I've got my assistant with the bionics to put it, and then I can make sure it's well centered on the tibia. Okay, and then we release it. Okay, and what you're also able to do, of course, then, is to, is to reduce the joint. So I then re-look at my screener. Okay, and then we put it through a range of motion here. Right, and you'll see that my balance curve has changed quite a bit. So whereas we had a balanced extension gap before, we're now a bit loose laterally in extension. This is what we commonly find, and this is my concern about a lot of the robotic techniques, which plan knee looking at the soft tissue envelope before you've removed any osteophytes and before you've removed the menisci. So we now plan the optimal femoral component position for this knee with the tibia cut and it's ready to go. So we now go into our planning screen. Right, so we are too loose laterally in flexion. So what we're going to do is to put the in more varus. You'll now see I like to have a 10.5 millimeter gap and what that has done by putting it more valgus has reduced my cut. Remember here, that what we want to have is nine millimeters of the a nine millimeter resection. Okay, so we now got our ten point five gap. We've also changed the rotation of the flexion gap by cutting the tibia and putting the tension. So we're now actually a little bit loose medially in flexion. So I'm going to basically rotate my knee to optimally balance it. Remember, I like to have a two millimetre difference. And now we're a little bit tight, medially in flexion, so I'm just going to extend my component a bit. So what this technology does is give you the power to provide the optimal placement. So just to run through how we did that, you'll see there's a sequential stream going from left to right. On the left is the extension gap. So we've cut our tibia, so we can change the extension gap by, the, by changing the varus valgus cut of the distal femur. We then move to the middle screen, which yes, is the Mark, flexion. Just one second. Can we go back to the screen as you're giving this talk? Because it's actually helpful to look yeah, at the so we need as you talk. We need to have the screen That's online. It. Great. Guys. Okay. Yeah. So I want to just explain the screen in detail. 
So how we've planned this is that we have a sequential walk through the screen to balance the knee. On the left-hand side is the extension gap. We cut our tibia at two degrees of varus. Our acubalance graft, after ranging the knee with a tensor in, showed we were too loose laterally in extension. So we put less or more varus on the femur. So we've now balanced our extension gap by changing the femur to go to 2.5 of valgus. We then move to the middle, which is the flexion gap. We alter our flexion gap by rotating the femoral component. So we balanced our flexion gap such that we have two millimeters more laxity lateral inflection to enable the rollback of the femur. And then finally, on the right hand side, we have the equalization screen. So if we don't have our flexion extension gap balanced, we can change either the femoral component size. Your tune has three millimeter changes. We could do that, so if it's more than three, we do that, or close to a three change. Or, if we want to reduce our flexion gap, we flex our femoral component. If we want to increase our flexion gap, we can anteriorize it, but that's going to overstuff the patellofemoral joint. So I can put a combination of anteriorizing and extending it, so we keep our impact on the anterior cortex. So we've got the power to put the implant in the optimal position. I think that's the beauty of this technology, particularly for those of you who are manual surgeons. You're going to have a lot of information here for you to optimally plan things. So whereas in the past, if you had to release ligaments, it was a bit of a woman, a prayer as to where you got it right. Here, we don't release the ligaments. We let the knee sit within its natural soft tissue envelope. And you can see by doing that, we've got the tibia sitting at two degrees of varus, which is pretty anatomical. We'll put a bit more varus in the femur at 2.5. We're going to have a pretty straight overall alignment. 2.5 degrees of internal rotation of our femur. We've got pretty symmetrical gaps of 7 and 9.5 where the implant is 8, and we'll flex our component 4.5 degrees. Okay, so any questions about the planning screen and the philosophy to the panel? All, all good from my point of view. What about you, Nico and yeah. uh, John? Yeah. There's a question also from Aaron Malagi, so but you have answered it. So what was the purpose of doing initial planning then? If you change. The purpose of the plan is to get a well-balanced knee. Yep. And what and just what I haven't talked about is my boundaries. So I do have five degree boundaries. So I want to cut the tibia to a max of five degrees of varus and have overall alignment of five degrees. It was three, I changed in 2019 to five. My release rate was 6.5% when I had three. I've done no ligament releases since January 2019. Hmm. Okay, so we'll go ahead and yeah, cut I, the thing I have a question. I have a question about this uh, pre-planning. Yes. Yeah, yeah I, I see this patient has a, uh, looks like a mild uh, cartilage loss. But if you, uh, if you, uh, to a patient who have uh, who has my, uh, significant uh, uh, cartilage loss, how to evaluate or pre-planning this? Sure. So then you need to estimate the bone loss, uh, yeah. which is a little bit more difficult to do. But I also there are often some parts of the plateau where you'll have some cartilage, where the cartilage transitions to bone. But for those who have significant loss, like you'll have in China, then you need to estimate the bone loss. Okay, so let's uh, cut the distal femur. Okay, in here. Okay, let's have a check the cut. 
Okay, so we're very accurate with a 0.5 degree out. Well, I'm at nine, perfect. So we've and we're very accurate. Okay, that's great. Okay, so we can just grab a sucker. A second here. And you can just grab the Langen bit, but don't bring it into the field until I say. <laughs> And Mark, you made the point that um, if you register at the spot where the articular cartilage turns to bone, that tells you sort of roughly where uh, the normal bone is and you use a two mil uh, cartilage loss estimate from there. Is that, is that correct? Is that what that you do? That is correct. And what we've done is we've validated it. So I've got 590 patients where I've looked at, this is obviously using brain lab technology prior to this. We did what we, we, we collected what we got intraoperatively and then we compared that with a one-year long leg x-ray, and we showed that 96% of the time within 2%, 78% time within one degree. Okay. okay. So, Want to demonstrate here what you do is you complete the whole cut, don't go back and forward, go straight through. Okay, let's verify that cut. The, the saw blade, Mark, is it a standard saw blade or a thicker oh, it's and a bit stiffer? Thicker. Okay, quite a bit thicker. So we're just a little bit, oh, so we're just going to redo a little bit of that. Let's have that back to you. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. Okay, all right, let's push the blue button again. Glad. There's a question from Simon Covey. Is that at what effect do you see on of farsing and internally rotating femur to obtain the tibial femur balance on uh, petrofemoral tracking? Sorry, Nico, can you repeat that? Yeah, the question is what effect do you see of farsing and internally rotating femur to obtain a tibial femoral balance on petrofemoral tracking? So is the question, is there any concern with rotating the femur yep. variably? Is that the question? Yes. Yeah, so uh, we wrote a paper on this published last year showing that we had seven degrees of internal to eight of external, and it made no difference. If you look at that paper, our outcome scores are outstanding throughout. Okay, yeah. yeah. The paper has been published in the KSSTA. I saw it, 2020. Yeah. So, Thing, okay, push blue. So, so just to draw you out a bit more on that, Mark, on that issue for the Nico asked from Simon Coffey, yeah. um, uh, keep cut first and then I'll ask the question. Can we just complete the cuts while we're going to go Yes, 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 of course. Yeah. Yeah. Just hold the saw for a sec there. So I don't know if you saw, but uh, the, the zebra tractor went flying, so I just had to rescue it. There we go. That should be fine. Okay, go, Mia.
Okay, so we'll drop the robot. We're finished with the robot now. So, Mark, just whilst you're taking those offcuts out, um, to, to draw you out a little bit on that question that Simon and Nico have asked, um, we, we spent our orthopedic life dealing with implants that were manufactured uh, on the basis that they would be placed three degrees external to the posterior condylar axis, and the uh, that's the, the back of the knee, and at the front of the knee, the femoral trochlear uh, is set up in a manner to guide the patella, assuming that it's going to be externally rotated three degrees. But now we're putting them in kinematically, um, and for you, it's the parallel to the epicondylar axis, uh, sorry, to the posterior condylar axis. So just tell me what effect uh, did your study show that that had on the patellofemoral joint mechanics? Uh, none. Yeah, so I'm making a bit of a cheeky comment. So um, that... That wouldn't be like you to make a cheeky comment, Clats. So, uh, so part of the genesis of a tune was the LCS, which was not designed to basically sit in three degrees of external rotation all the time. That was a ligament balancing technique right from the start. Um, but having said that, I did use the PFC for quite a while, which was like that. Uh, but what I think the important, you know, there is that orthopedic folklore, thou shalt not internally rotate the femur. And having written a paper on it, straight off the template, um, there's very little evidence for that. And then I think if you just, you know, I think now we need to sort of think logically rather than just believe what someone said 40 years ago was gospel. This, this doesn't make sense. But what we're doing here is we are, you know, we've got a lot of technology now to help us balance that knee and show what the optimal balance is. So, uh, of time and thanks. So we basically have done, used this technique for a long time, balancing the flexing gap. I've been doing it since 2005. One of your things. The, uh, you know, the LCS surgeons have been using it since the 70s, and you know we have, we have we've had very good results. So. I think that's true. If you internally rotate the femur when it should be externally rotated, that's a real problem. But here we've got technology to optimally balance it. The tricky knee for a manual surgeon is the valgus knee. The reason for that is the loss is posterior lateral. So your posterior condylar axis is lost. Again, with this technique, we can accommodate for that. So, yeah, I think theoretically there could be an issue to say what we were trying to do is put them in three degrees of external rotation. But I don't think the implants were put for that. The reason for that is because that manual mechanical alignment technique presumes that every tibia is in three degrees of varus. So, and it's not. It's widely variant. And, you, and if you look at the large studies on this, you know we know that only one in a thousand patients has a zero, zero mechanical axis. So I think as surgeons we've got better than trying to do this at the same every time and aim for something that happens one in a thousand times. With this all this new technology, uh, we can really customise it and personalise it to fit the patient. Glass, there's another question, Glass, from Rami Soriel. He asks about uh, how much error can be introduced with the length uh, that the saw blade, and does it matter which saw blade you use? Yeah. So, so I accept the millimetre and a degree. Uh, and certainly you'll see there that we just had to do one slight recut on that and all these other parts were very accurate. So now I think there's been too much obsession with surgeons about alignment and, and too much sort of ignoring the soft tissue envelope. Um, the knee is just not two bits of bone. It has the soft tissue envelope around it and it functions around that soft tissue envelope. So I'm hoping this technology is going to just make surgeons think more about soft tissues and think more about leaving the knee leaving these soft tissues to be in their natural place and not be disturbed. Okay, can we have the, uh, so we use the cocktail here, so we've got a cocktail, it truly is a cocktail. I started using this in 2004, uh, having been at a course with Chet Renawat, and uh, we have local anaesthetic, we've got this controversial Kenacorp with no increased infection rate, we've got transamic acid, we've got vancomycin, we've got clonidine, and I think this is quite a game saver. Uh, while we're injected, the other thing I want to just talk about is tourniquet use. So I do use a tourniquet. Uh, and the reason for that is because we're using alternative alignment and not putting it zero, zero. However, I would encourage you uh, to read the study that's come out of Doug Dennis's group just this July in the Journal of Arthroplasty. They had 61 patients who were matched who had a tourniquet and did not have a tourniquet. What they showed was they had 30% better cement penetration with a tourniquet. The radiolucent line rate was 25% without a tourniquet. 
this is 11% with, and they had a 3% failure rate without a point of count zero with. So a lot of people quote studies that are time zero or two years. I want my cement mantle to last forever. So I'm happy to, when our tourniquet time now is 48 minutes and I've been talking for most of this procedure, so I think for a short tourniquet time, I'm happy to accept that to get optimal implantation. Okay, so this, might, this is a little cut just to fit the femoral component. Okay, let's have the rasp. Okay, so we're now going to size our tibia. Let's have a curved omen, thanks. And then a straight omen. So we get good exposure of our tibia. And so, Miles, this is when I look for the lateral geniculate. Let's have a swab, thanks. And I am quite particular about cleaning up, so I don't want anything impinging. Uh, let's have bonnies. Perfect. Mark, you don't have any trouble uh, using vancomycin locally like that? I do use vancomycin locally, and that my reason for that is uh, Simon Young, who you know, has done a lot of work on infections. Uh, it says most of them are coagulase negative staph, and we give um, kephalosporins, which aren't very good for that. So my rationale for doing that is to have local vancomycin for any coagulase negative staph and intravenous. Okay, let's have a seven to you. And I, I presume you soak your ACL grass in a vancomycin solution as well before whilst you're doing well, your I'm arthroscopy. A big fan of that, Chris. Yes, I've yeah, Miles. I was on that with Chris Futulo. So I've been doing that for well over ten years. Uh, Two thousand eight, I actually started doing it. And uh, touch wood, I have not had one ACL infection since I started using that. Interestingly, okay. I mean, uh, we we too uh, uh, do much the same uh, uh, with vancomycin for grafts, but uh, I've not actually ever used it as you have here uh, in your cocktail of injections. Interesting. I mean, to be quite honest, you almost need to be a microbiologist in this country and infectious diseases physician before you're allowed to prescribe vancomycin. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, okay, terrifying so look, VRE. So if we look at the overall alignment of this knee now, we're seeing one of valgus, one extension, and we just have a look at our... Can we look at the screen whilst you do... Uh, good. Yeah, so if you can see the screen there... And then and I can feel it. Feels pretty good. And one thing I really look for, so I've got a pretty nice balance here, but I can just see that my component, this is a really, I'm a, a CR surgeon, and this is a critical point. Um, you'll see that my tibial spacer is lying slightly anterior to the femur. That just shows my medial yeah. flexion gap is slightly tight. So what I do is just, we have Gilly's things, I just release the, the PCL off the femur until I see it start to move a little bit. And what I think happens is that actually enables it to heal back down in its correct position. So can we just see that, Mark? We're looking at the screen whilst you're diatherming the PCL. Yeah, so I've just gone diatherming the PCL, and I'm just going to do it slowly. And it's still sitting back just a touch, so I've got a little bit more to go. And I just go slowly so I get the optimal PCL release. So what you're demonstrating, there's an anterior draw at 90 degrees of flexion from a tight PCL, and you're releasing that. Yeah, so it was just lying. So now it's lying back against it. So that's I've got that sitting back there nicely now. Before it was just sitting up there, and now it's sitting nicely back. Okay, yep. and then I just look at my balance here, which looks great. Good, so I'm very happy. Yep. I, I do use the graph, but I actually, I, 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 I now feel it and see how it feels. And it feels really nicely balanced for a full range of motion. Yeah, what about... What about the uh, three, uh, 30 degree or 60 degree? Yeah, so if I put it 30 degrees, yeah. it doesn't actually, it doesn't give you a measurement, but you can see the graph there. Because, so if you can see the graph, at I'm at 30 now, and you can see the shape of the AccuBalance graph. So you can see I've got symmetrical. It's a bit like what, you've, what they've got with Rosa. So if I just do that again, if I go up to 30 degrees here, and I now apply a force both. You can see I basically am opening up this. It's symmetrical. And again, if I do the same at 90. So you can go through it any time and just sort of do what Rosa does here and have a look. Sometimes uh, some patient has uh, the paradox uh, tran anterior translation. How to avoid this uh, situation? The anterior translation of the tibia? Yes. At, uh, at, uh, no, 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 femur. 
a femur may, maybe at a 30 degree or a 60 degree. There oh, is, you mean uh, if I put it 30 degrees, is my, it's nicely yeah. balanced? So 30 degrees, you mean like you're doing a Lockman test? Yeah. I don't do that in my knees, but it feels really good. Okay. Okay, so now I'm just going to show you how I rotate my tibia. Marking pen. So you, if you can see here the crescent. You just need to go back so the, to the um, operating there's scene. A, there's a crescent on the femur. And so what I want is the middle of my femur to line up. Can you guys see that? I don't know if you can. No, no, Mark, we haven't. Oh, there okay. we are. So, so my line and the crescent of the femur is perfectly lined up with my square in the tibia. So okay. for me, I want okay. to have. Can you flex to me a little to demonstrate that, Mark? Because we didn't. We yeah, didn't so actually, what I'll do because we're finishing, I'll take the arrays off, and I do normally take the arrays off now because this, basically the navigation and the robotics is done. And I'll show you how because obviously my the, the, this implant has a cone, and so I couldn't get it in with the pins there anyway. So. So I'll just do that. If I do that now, you can maybe just have my marking pen again in a swab. So if you can see so that my using marking, marking pen there uh, in the middle of the trochlea, white, yep, let's yep. call it white side's point. Yep. So then, and then what I do is extend the knee. I'll try and tilt it a bit that way. And so what I want to see so is just, if you just uh, internally rotate the hip a little, we'll be able to see that. It's a bit stiff, but yep. but obviously. Can you sort of see that? Uh, yes, we can. Yep, can you guys thanks. see that? So yep. you'll see my line is in the middle of my square. Yep, so I know that's, a, that's a good view. Yep, got it. So in extension, I have perfect rotation. And we spend most of the time in extension. So then I then set my rotation. If it's out, I can change it. I have in the past been a big RP user. Uh, the moment I'm just doing all fixed bearing because I've we've collected a lot of data and I don't want to have my data mixed. Okay, so we're just going to look at our tibia. Let's look at the mallet, thanks. So, Mark, what about the situation where you size your tibia nicely and then you sit it and it mal rotates to the extent where you've now got some overhang? Oh, downsize my tibia. Yeah, it's comfortably yeah. downsize. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. with the attune, you can actually be two sizes out. That's not sitting in there. Right. So, you up or down two? You can go up and down two. Yes, just a question from Kang Il Kim. When before, okay, can you hear? One other little trick before we answer the question, Nico, is there is a tendency for all components to flex. What we've shown with this technology, if you flex the femoral component five degrees, you reduce the flexion gap by three millimeters. So when I'm putting my drill hood on, you'll see that I apply a, a anterior force. So I've got my anterior cortex lying against the anterior femur. So I don't have a flex femoral component. Good point. Sorry, what was the question? Yeah, it's from Kang Il Kim. You went before any release of soft tissue or ossified removal. Occasionally, we can feel a change of ligament balance after all the bone cut. Meniscal uh, cruciate ligament resection, especially in severe varus knee. So how the pre-cut or pre-release planning would not that be different to actual situations? So if I got the question right, so I cut the tibia and then assess the ligament balance. So you, you can, I mean, the only, if you've cut, it, cut the femur and the tibia and you've got it wrong, the only thing you can do is release the ligaments. I don't want to touch the ligaments. I want to leave them all in the natural envelope. So, so that's with this technique where we plan it as anatomically as possible. We cut the tibia with the plan. We then clean anything out the back, put the tensor and range the motion. Then we can determine the optimal femoral component position for the tibia how it wants to be. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. We still got you there, Nico? Yep. Have we got them? We've got a great view here, guys, and I've got to say it's going very smoothly. And, okay, uh, so we're now, I hope the audience is enjoying it as much as I am. Oh, that's good, Miles. Yeah, it's all going pretty well, thankfully. 
Right, so now we're going to basically put our tibia in place. So this is the segment that you need to have those pins out. So my pins, pins are out. out. My yep. pins are here, and, and they're going right through where I... Sure. So, Miles, what we talked about before was sizing. And what I do is I say, look, so I can see now that I've got nice sizing here and I don't want any posterior or lateral overhang. So if that was the case, I would downsize to a six tibia. Okay. Placing his posterior and lateral plane is typically popliteal impingement and uh, you're screwed once it's cemented in. So easy to fix when you're here, impossible to fix when it's in. Okay, so we're going to get our implants, guys. And your, your poly thickness, Mark, you've already determined that is a trial to six, but I do not basically determine my size until I've actually got it cemented in. So okay. we'll trial the six that worked well. Um, I can go down to a five, I can go up to a seven. Uh, with a tune, you have one millimeter increments. Um, that's been a massive thing for me. I was surprised how much difference it would make having the one millimeter increments. And I'll often change it. And maybe 20% of the time, I'm actually changing my implant. Most of my, my poly spacer based on so when, when you say six poly, that's a combined thickness of 10 mil, correct? That, yeah, that's the thickness of the poly. So it's a four millimeter tray with six millimeters of poly. So it's different dimensionature from what the other implant companies do. It's the true thickness poly. of the poly. Mark, you don't put any better than in your sluice? Yes, I do. I'll do that later, though. Yeah, so I let it sit. Uh, and while I'm waiting for the cement to go off, that's when I have my bedding sitting there. And what uh, dilution do you have the bedding? Or you can dilute it, but we just leave it in the way. Uh, You'll see 100%. How, we do how are we going for time? Uh, we've got uh, 12 and a half minutes. Oh, we're cruising. We're doing, we're doing fine. There's there's a Q and a session, but um, Mark, we've been feeding the questions to you. Um, Nico, uh, Wong Jong, have we, have we got any other questions that have come yeah. through? Yeah, there's another question, Miles, um, from Kang Il again. He said that a, a no soft tissue release. So is it possible in severe various or severe flexions, contractors need? In case naturally the ligament is more or less released after all bone cut and uh, circulate resection? Yeah, so when I say no releases, I don't release the medial collateral or the, the lateral collateral posterior lateral corner. We obviously do take the osteophytes out of the back, absolutely critical. We take in the osteophytes out the tension, the, the MCL and lateral structures. And there's a tight capsule posterior I release that. So when I say I don't release the ligaments, it's on the medial and lateral side. And obviously, I take the ACL out, so I'm definitely doing a ligament or a resection rather than a release there. So it's probably it's more the collateral side rather than the. Um, I think the, so. I sort of have to be a bit more specific about that. Uh, guys, if we can come around here with your cameras and maybe just show how we cement. So I think cementing technique is critical. Um, as I mentioned, we've done over, I think, 1,250 attunes, and uh, I have had no loosenings, and that's dating back to 2013. Uh, we've used uh, the patient-specific alignment since 2013 as well. Go for it, Neil. And which cement are you using, and do you add antibodies to the cement, Mark? Yeah, so smart set, so it's to use uh, total knees uh, cement with antibiotics. As you'll see here again, I'm pretty anal about it. Even though I've got a tourniquet and a nice dry surface, I want to have my surface super dry. So that's the use of your right elbow there, just pushing down, getting all that yep. fat out. Yep. And uh, you'll see uh, a lot of fat flow. So it, you know, it certainly amazes me. Despite the fact I've got a tourniquet and I really, and I'll suck this dry and I've got my swabs in here. I mean, he may not, but 
he's a bit young, but certainly in the older patients, it amazes me the geyser of uh, lipid you get coming out of these holes. Flat. You know that the age Atrium has the, the, the greatest uh, cementless uh, tibial component. So, you don't use it? Oh, it's not available for me yet, Nico, but I oh. think that's what I'm going to go to next. So, I'm um, certainly, yeah, we're going to go to cementless. Um, I, I particularly like the Affixium technology that's coming out soon with the fixed bearing. Uh, we've, we've got a lot of history in New Zealand uh, with the LCS cementless, which is good. So, first thing you do, as early as possible, is put cement on the back of the tibia. Uh, it's got a little S plus tray, has some little cement pockets in there. So that goes on nice and early. And I coat both the femur and the tibia. It's been well shown that the quicker this, or well, the sooner the cement goes on the implant, the better it heals, or the better it sort of uh, sticks. We then, I'm gonna grab a home in there, man. So again, we make sure we can see all the surfaces. We're anal here about basically making sure it's super dry. Mark, I think, I think you made a very important point there, Mark, that, that the sooner you get that cement onto the implant, both implants, the better it sticks to the implant. Exactly. Particularly these ones like this S Plus, which has little cement pockets, which are small. And the cement at that stage is, uh, you know, okay, so our camera guys around here, don't go away. And so I then push, you know, I'll wait for him to come around. Naughty cameraman disappeared on me. Um, so... And then I'm actually pushing the cement into those pockets there now. Right. Do, do okay. uh, mix uh, antibiotics uh, into the cement. Now, here we go. Okay. Here, we can put the camera on this and just watch that lipid. Out she goes. Little geyser of lipid. Out she goes. McDonald. And you've got some form of a trial poly in there at present, Mark? What's that, sorry? That pink, is that that's a trial poly well, or is that... plastic that just, it just protects that um, so you don't get much cement on the... Understood. Have a fresh swab again. So again, the hardest part to cement is the posterior condyle. So what I do here is kick that and take that out. Grab a ling and So I've got my, you can see my swab sitting in here, sitting on my posterior condyle. The other thing I do now is suck out any blood or lipid out of my lug holes. And again, it surprises me often how much lipid you get coming out of these as well. So you can see that lipid coming out. Okay. And then I take that swab and I fold it over and dry any lipid or blood lying on the interface. Do you mix the antibiotics into uh, cement? Uh, no, I don't mix it. It all comes pre-mixed. Yeah, so it's, uh, okay. it's antibiotic laden, so I think we don't have Magnetic. to Magnetic? Magnetic? Or other, uh, uh, other antibiotics? So this is, this is Smart Set, which is to Pew's Killies, please. Okay. So I just make sure I've got the cement sitting here. Anything now that's poking out the back, I get rid of. Okay, then I get my femoral component, and again, just put it down, make sure I can see my holes, and then I line those up. And when I put it on, I apply extension, so I'm pushing my femoral component up on my anterior cortex. I don't want to flex it to reduce my flexion gap. Yeah, do you consider it uh, the, uh, the, thing, uh, the thickness of cement uh, when you pre-planning uh, of the cutting and bone? Yeah, well, that's why I don't choose my final implant on my, my final spacer until I've actually got the cement metal. So I am very particular about... So I think if you're good, it's not quite sitting right. The best thing you can do is what down here is to actually just extend it. That'll give you a symmetrical uh, putting down. And then again, when you do that, the knee sits in its natural soft tissue envelope. So I'm not a fan of... 
So yes, I, I think it's important not to get the... Okay, so we're happy there. I then hold it there till it's bone dry, so we can have some, some pulse lavage. So we get a little bit of pulse lavage in there. Then we get the betadine moles. There's your betadine for you. And then I put more local anaesthetic, and this basically, I like this, as we all know, the, the nerve supply goes medial to lateral, so we put, and it comes from high up, so we put more local anaesthetic just along the skin on the medial side. This is the cocktail again, not just local? So this is just local. The cocktail goes deep, and I put it into the fat pad areas because... Uh, as Miles and I know, there's a crazy friend of ours called Scott Guy who got his fellow to scope his knee without any anaesthetic. And despite the fact he had a bit of patellofemoral arthritis, the only thing that really hurt was his fat pad. So the fat pad's very sensitive. So we then just let it cook there. I leave the betadine in for three minutes and then wait for that cement to dry. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question, sir. Actually about the, uh, the four-in-one cutting blocks uh, for the femur. Um, the, uh, what do you think in, um, like last, last week, they prefer not to do by uh, robotic, but more manual. So do you have any comment on it? Oh, so you're talking about the Rosa technique where they use the robot to apply the four-in-one cutting guide, Nico? Yeah. Well, yep. we, I mean, that's possible, but this technology has gone to a new level. You don't need it. And uh, this, you know, I think there's no question it's well shown there are errors in, in cutting through guides. Um, it may work well for you know, experienced surgeons like Rami and Sebastian Perret, uh, but in the hands of others, um, you know, all you need to do is get your fellows or residents to be doing some cases, and you know, particularly the posterior cuts aren't often that good. So that's possible, but that's sort of a, what I'd call robot light. Um, I think you better, if you've got the technology, to get the robot to cut the entire tibia and femur, which is going to give you a more accurate cut. And according to you, what is the uh, um, the learning curve like? Yeah, well, it's a bit, listen, it, it, I'm the wrong one to ask because I was very involved in developing this robot and also developed the, you know, the patient-specific alignment tibia first ligament guided technique. So for us, it was a very easy transition just to add the robot. Uh, I think for surgeons who are manual surgeons, there will be a bigger learning curve. Um, certainly, I know Depew and the other companies are putting a lot of effort into education. Um, certainly, well, uh, Nikio and I met each other in 2004 when we went to the first uh, navigation course in Perth. And uh, all I can say is we've come a long way since then because uh, it was all pretty basic. So I think there is a lot more education around. The, the learning curve is there, but I think there's ability now to do whole modules to show you what to do. Uh, shore bones, cadaver courses, uh, visitations. Um, certainly, Depew have an app, and, and I think certainly teaching this technology with the residents, the hardest thing for them is just getting their head around uh, the AccuBalance graph and the ProAdjust planning screen. So if you can play with that in advance, we've got some cases you can use this. Uh, it'll only become available in your country when uh, Velis is approved in your country. Uh, but that, I think, will be a huge advantage that's what I've just seen is uh, for anyone moving to robotics or navigation, there's just so much information that you get that you get that you haven't got in the past. Yeah. And it's just a case of understanding it, um, having a good workflow, and that's why we've worked hard uh, with the Vela system to have a, a pro-adjust planning screen where we've got the extension gap, get that sorted on the left, move to the middle on the right with the flexion gap, so move to the middle and then move to the right when we then equalise the flexion extension gap by changing femoral component size or flexion extending it. So I think if you understand the concepts and then you have an ordered pathway in which you determine the optimal placement of the implant, then it's a lot easier. So Mark, Mark, we're fun. just about out of time. Um, but I just want to, uh, on behalf of the audience, thank you and your anaesthetic and nursing staff and your cameraman and all the technology people. It's a wonderful uh, example of the attuned uh, robotically assisted knee. I really enjoyed it. Thank, and thank well you. done. Th thanks very much. Oh.
And I'd like to thank APAS to give me the opportunity to do it. Uh, I think it's amazing what uh, you've all done. I would have thought two years ago we'd be doing live surgery in India, New Zealand and Australia and beam it to the world. So well done. Okay, and just one final thing. We've got looks like we've got about uh, 50 seconds. Can you just show us the knee, the range of motion? No, uh, the cement's not dry. How long does it take? I refuse <laughs> to move it, and this is another point. But I <laughs> I'll take a video and send it to you. But I'm absolutely anal about uh, waiting for my cement to be rock solid, okay. uh, and I think there have yes. been some issues with early component loosening. We remind them that anything is possible. That their life is unlimited too. Today, I'm Dr. David Ravinsky. We're here to introduce the Cori Surgical System for Robotic Assisted Knee Replacement. I'm an assistant clinical professor at the University of Hawaii, and I'll be working with Dr. Narendra Vaidya, who is managing director of the Lakmanya Hospital System. And he and his group do approximately 5,000 arthroplasties per year. So, this is our disclaimer slide, and I'm going to focus on robotic assisted knee replacement, and how it really is a combination of computer-assisted design and CNC, or computer numeric control machining. So I am a consultant for Smith Nephew, OrthoGrid, and also VR. And we'll talk about how implant design dovetails with the robotic systems and how we do the surgery. It's clear that all our knee replacement patients want to perform high-level activities, and in Hawaii, specifically, that refers to surfing. And it's clear to me in my experience that you cannot get there with traditional implants and surgical techniques. We all are looking for the perfect total knee replacement every patient, every time. And this is why surgeons have been interested in robotic assisted surgery. And robotic systems all need to do three things, registration, planning, and bone preparation. And registration is getting the information into the computer. And there are systems that use a CT scan or an MRI. The disadvantage with this is that if you're using a CT scan, you're only getting the information about the bone, and the patient has to go through an extra test, which is extra time and expense for the patient. The best is probably digital mapping, where you trace the surface anatomy of the bone and get a cartilage map, and incorporating the soft tissue information for gap planning. The second step, once you have the information, is computer-aided design or planning, and this can be done preoperatively or intraoperatively. If it's done preoperatively, then it becomes like homework, and it may involve an engineer, and not all plans done preoperatively are flexible. I like to have my plan to have flexibility to do measured resection or gap balancing and have the flexibility intraoperatively to go from a partial knee to a total knee or combination. This is one system where you have to navigate a tibia cut and then do a complicated system to get the gap balancing information. And it's quite cumbersome and it's not intuitive. And then there's bone preparation, which is translating your plan into action. And there are some systems out there that are really navigation masquerading as robotics. And if you're navigating a cutting block or navigating a drill to put a pin to use a cutting block, that's not robotics. Robotics means that the end effector, the tool touching the bone, is controlled by robotic technology. Now, true robotics is an autonomous arm, and this is where the leg is placed in a jig and the robot mills independent of the surgeon. And this is scary to me because if there's any error in registration, you are causing harm to the patient and you're not in direct control. So most systems are semi-autonomous and they're using a saw or a milling tool or burr to prepare the bone. Now, any manufacturing system that uses computer-aided design for precise components is going to use CNC machining to mill out the components. They're going to remove the excess material to reveal the component. There's no system out there that uses in manufacturing a saw. And this is because a saw introduces error. The saw is anywhere from 1.3 to 1.5 or even 1.8 millimeters thick. So that's one error. 
And if you're navigating the saw, you don't know where the tip of that saw is. It can skive off the bone and introduce error. And if you have a robotic arm that puts a cutting block into position, that's great. But there's play between the saw blade and the cutting block in addition to the skiving. So you have this very precise plan, but now you're choosing a poor instrument to prepare the bone. And then the robots are linked to implants. So here's an, a system that, again, has a robotic type arm, but it's linked to a total knee system that not only is it primitive in design, it has a high rate of failure. So if you purchase a robotic system, you better really let the implant, because if the implants are no good, you're still stuck with the robot. So with the Cori system, the registration is digital mapping. So we're chasing the three-dimensional outline of the bone. And then we have a three-dimensional model pulled up from the database. And then you refine that model to match the actual cartilage surface and bone surface of the knee you're working on. We then range the knee with stress on the MCL and LCL, and we gather ligament tension information throughout the full range of motion. The planning is then very intuitive. It's done interoperably by the surgeon on a touch screen that you operate yourself. You can incorporate gap balancing information and it's very fast and it's flexible. And I'll show you some of the many applications, but it gives you a lot of information you can get through the screens very quickly. And finally, bone preparation is true machining. It's true computer numeric control machining where you have a handheld milling tool that very efficiently removes bone where the metal's going to go. If you look in the top right of the screen, you can see the tip of the burr going in and out. So the robot knows exactly where the tip of the burr is, and you literally cannot color outside the lines. So this system is about the size of an arthroscopy tower, has a lower cost of ownership than other systems, and is very flexible. So I can do a uni, I can do a PFJ, I can add a uni to a PFJ, so I have this flexibility and I can make this decision on the fly in the operating room. You can do cases like this, very complex failed tibial plateau fracture. And I only have to remove a little bit of hardware because I'm using a mill to prepare the bone. I couldn't use a CT scan to get this information into the computer because of the artifact. And now I've done basically a revision technique with cones and stems, and you can even do augments. Here's a case with a uni that we've revised to a total knee using the Cori system. And again, we're maintaining the joint line exactly where it is. And we have all the benefits of robotics now applied for revision surgery as well. The Cori system is attached to the largest and most wide variety of implants on the market, including the Journey family, the Genesis 2 system, the Legion system, and the Anthem system, as well as the Stride and Zook unis. I use the Journey 2 BCS, and this is a kinematically designed implant. So you can see the oblique joint line on the AP, and on the lateral, you can see how the femur is directly over the tibia. And this system allows and enables posterior lateral rotation as you go into flexion. So this really helps patella femoral tracking, as you can see. So this is a very advanced implant. The instrumentation for total knee for me is two trays, because we're eliminating all these jigs and a lot of the steps of the total knee. So Going from six trays to two trays decreases significantly our cost per case, and I'm much less dependent on my surgical technician for the workflow since I'm doing much of my work myself with the robot. And it's very, very efficient. So exposure and cementation are parts of the procedure you can't really make shorter. That's part of doing the case no matter what instrumentation you use. But the core of the case, the part that you do with manual instrumentation, and for me that's pin placement, registration, planning, and bone preparation is literally 10 to 12 minutes. So my total knees are just about 30 to 35 minutes. And I think that's a very reasonable amount of time to do a total knee. So when you're picking a robotic system, you want to pick one that has a variety of implants, that has the best implants possible, anatomically designed implants that are kinematic. The combination of computer-aided design and CNC machining gives us the versatility, the precision and efficiency that we're looking for. And all this combined gives us great patient outcomes. And here's one of my patients returning to surfing, which is something that he absolutely loves to do. So thank you very much for your consideration. And I'll turn this over now to Dr. Vidya. Hello, everyone. And greetings from Lokmane Hospitals. I'm Dr. Narendra Vaidya from Pune, India. And today I'm going to talk about the efficiency of Puri handheld robotic system. So we have been, this is my uh, standard disclaimer and uh, from Smith & Nephew. I'm a consultant there, and uh, 
This is our Lokmani hospitals where we have been using a handled robotic Navio system since last uh, five odd years, since 2016, when it was launched in India first time. And uh, we have done uh, a, a lot of cases on the handled Navio system. Last couple of months, we have been using the Cori system since it has been launched. And it has uh, shown a lot of efficiency with the handheld robotic system with Navio, as well as now with the improved efficiency with the camera and handle system, which already we have heard in the previous talk of Dr. Lowenski. Uh, it is a faster camera, a faster and um, aggressive milling device, which adds a lot of precision and uh, the efficiency in OR with the uh, handheld device as well as the space efficient um, uh, uh, devices and the screen also. So I, we have developed three protocols for different type of deformities. Uh, we do a lot of bilaterals. So depending on the case, we do either mechanical alignment or kinematic alignment or hybrid mid path regime. So in this particular video, we are going to see um, particular this particular case, uh, 84 years male with a virus deformity. Uh, which is a simple deformity and in which we are going to do a mechanical alignment with a minimal or no soft tissue release. So let's uh, start with the video of this case. Um, uh, this deformity, which is actually a, a very mild deformity as far as our scenario goes, you can use any approach for this. In this particular case, we have used the medial parapetal approach, which is the most common what we use, but you can use any approach of uh, preference, midvastus or anything like that. The first mandatory thing which one has to do is to remove the osteophytes right up to the back of the MCL. So that is the most important thing to release it. The pin placement can be uh, outside the wound like in this video. I put it in the AP direction, three finger breads above the superior pole and three finger breads below the tibial tuberosity. But some surgeons can put it in the wound also on the medial direction. As the arrays can have about 180 degrees movement, you can put it in the in the wound also. And uh, the, really the visibility of these arrays is really superb. Once this is done, then uh, we are ready to actually see it, how it is visualized in the OR. This is the setup in the OR. You can see that it is really efficient with a tab which is occupying very less space in the OR and entire space free for the surgical team. The surgeon can select his surgical preferences. Now, in this first is whether the surgeon wants to keep uh, so collect the surgical, you know, the knee laxity or skip it. Now, in this particular case, I am skipping it, but you can do and when we are doing a kinetic alignment, you can collect it. You can collect the rotational axis by manual or right side line. This particular case, we can use the PCA. Uh, the resection depths can also be customized as per the case. If there is a flexion deformity, you can increase the femoral resection or decrease it in a, uh, whenever there is a recurvatum. Uh, you can use anterior or posterior referencing guide. So it, it suits as per the patient's demand and patient's clinical condition. Uh, one has to ensure that the tibial and the femoral trackers are visible throughout the range of movement. Uh, take some time to ensure that these both trackers are visible so that actually we don't miss out when we are actually doing the budding as well as uh, doing the assessment of the ligament throughout the range of movement. We have to fix these two small pins in the femur and tibia, ensure that this is outside the actual budding area and they don't move throughout the surgical procedure. They are well fixed, so then they don't move during the budding procedure. Uh, these are registered and then with the handle device, which will be actually doing the mapping part of it and registration part of it. Uh, the registration actually takes very less uh, time as far as um, uh, the registration goes. These trackers are then registered, which are fixed bony point in which in the malleola are registered, like in any navigation or Navio uh, users, it is very much conversion procedure, medial lateral malleola the tibial entry point, the knee center, the femur center, and then we are ready for uh, the other uh, the hip center collection. Uh, it, uh, once it is done, you can use uh, either leg holder. I don't use a leg holder. You can use leg holder or you don't use it. Uh, ensure that the hip is not lifted. Then you can collect the neutral leg position and then take the leg toward the range of movement. 
this is a non stressed uh, 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 range of movement and this particular case we are doing a mechanical alignment so you don't require stress range of movement at this particular moment uh then the rest of the things are pretty simple uh the, the mapping is very fast in cori the uh, mapping happens in a sort of a spray painting type of thing it uh, maps the real time virtual image of that particular femur and tibia you can see this is a fast forward sort of a video but actually it takes hardly 30 seconds to 40 seconds to map the entire femur you can map some special points like epicondyles the notch point in the femur the knee center or whatever the surgeon feels like there are different colors you can have the special points marked on the femur as well as the tibia and uh, uh, ensure that the adequate points are mapped if you don't map uh, adequate points the cori robot will not allow you to go further so <clears throat> all the adequate points are mapped on the femur and it rotates also to show that all the areas on the femur and tibia are adequately mapped once this is uh, femur is done uh, we move to the tibia and uh, move this uh, tracker it is really, literally a very simple thing uh the femoral rotation can be adjusted again here uh, according to the pca or on the right side line on the tibia again the simple uh, procedure of moving this tracker so you don't need any ct scan don't need any mri this is a virtual uh, real time mapping and uh, uh, creating a real time image of the native bone it tells you about the size it tells you about the slope it tells you about the deformities so it's really a very good actually uh, tool where it tells you about the entire knee uh, structure so uh, we don't need to do all the uh, uh, ct scans or any other imaging technique uh, there are two types of uh, planning images which is given to the surgeon these are sticky images where you can see the actual implant placing or these are line images where you can see that uh, the, how the implant is going to sit, uh, sit. now uh, you can see the uh, ap images or lateral images and you can see that half a millimeter sort of uh, uh, accuracy is there one click actually measures half millimeter and you can plan your caps you can plan your flexion extension you can see now this red thing popping up which uh, warns a surgeon about potential notching you can increase the flexion by 1 degree the default setting is about uh, Uh, 3 degrees. So in this particular case, I have kept it at 5 degrees. You can adjust the varus valgus to 1 degree, 2 degrees. Uh, your ligament balancing can be actually measured, so you don't only depend on your feel. Your slopes can be adjusted. So you know, nothing is left to imagination when you are using the handheld robotic system. Your bone cuts can be all burr, or you can use these cutting jigs. uh you actually now initially i used to use this tbl jig for the initial cut uh to remove the sclerotic portion but now with the cori system you can actually all burr it with a equal or better efficiency and this is a new handled uh, uh cori hand piece you can see that the trackers can be moved uh, all the direction so it doesn't come in the uh, way this grip which is uh, we all surgeons are very much conversant with power grip and you can see the burr coming out about 12 mm and cutting aggressively so even if you do a all burr technique for the femur it takes hardly 3 4 minutes for burring entire femur and uh, it is absolutely precise doesn't remove any normal bone protects all the soft tissues ligaments and has a tremendous accuracy so you can see this is a, a slightly fast forwarded video but you can see it doesn't damage any of the normal bone This is a virtual image which is uh, given to the surgeon, where uh, the red is three millimeters or more, the blue is about two millimeters, and the green one millimeters, and white is where we want to be. And uh, uh, entire femur, actually, you can remove the bone. Actually, you can see from all the directions how the bird is removing the bone, and precisely you can remove entire portion. You can move on the top also, change your grip. and from all directions very precisely the handheld device of cori removes the bone from the all the areas and uh, you can see within 3 to 4 minutes of real time it it can remove the bone from all directions so you don't have to depend on the saw which can actually stive on the uh, stive off from the sclerotic part of the bone or it can dip in the bone which can give potential errors 
or the saw can you know uh, damage the soft tissues so this, it is always you know a very precise and a safe tool to have the handheld burr uh, compared to some of the systems which will be using uh, a jig placement or uh, the saw and have a potential uh, error or potential damage and you can see a beautiful surface which is given by this handheld uh, milling device and uh, precise absolutely completely precise sort of a milling procedure you can check the cuts always with a digital angel wing which is provided now in this particular uh, case i have done uh, uh, two lug holes to take a pilot cut for the tibia but you can now with a more and more experience with the cori hand piece now i have not i'm not using these lug holes and directly do a milling of the tibia and you can equally or more efficiently do this in earlier experience when we took this video we used to do a, a sort of a cut a pilot cut which you can see that uh, we to remove this was done basically to remove the subcondral sclerotic bone this was not a final cut but uh, this gives a sort of a ease to burr out bone uh, from the tbl side but now the with a more experience with the handled robotic uh, coating system and the aggressive burring i don't use it now and i completely burr uh, right from beginning and it takes about 4 to 5 minutes for me to burr the entire tibia and you can see that now equally efficiently you can burr out uh, the tibial uh, surface uh it doesn't uh, one thing one has to remember is that when we are burring tibia the uh, handheld uh, device doesn't see the femur so you have to take care of the posterior condyles of the femur and when we are doing femur it has you have to take care of the tibia and uh, um, once that is done then we are ready to uh, do the further preparation you can see that the preparation is spot on no errors and that is the beauty of uh, the handheld robotic system that every case the results are reproducible you don't see any errors you are spot on whatever you planned whether you did a mechanical alignment whether you did a kinematic alignment whether you did a hybrid alignment whatever you planned you always end up delivering it and that is the beauty of this particular system which is very efficient in or which is very efficient uh, in hands of every surgeon we have got a large team of surgeons and uh, i have seen that in every uh, surgeon whether he is um, whatever experience he has got equally efficiently the surgeon is able to deliver this type of result where you can see a absolutely perfect graft post operatively uh, rest of the things are standard uh, protocol uh, one has to remember that since it's a milling device you have to give copious lavage to remove all the bone dust which is there in the joint the cementation technique remains standard and um, we use antibiotic cement uh, always remember to remove the uh, uh, tracker devices which are still seen inside because we have kept it to check the final alignment fix the poly final alignment is checked and then we uh, see the graph again you can see whatever we uh, planned kinematically and our uh, mechanical alignment you can see the physiological opening of lateral compartment to about 2 uh, millimeters on stress views and about 1 millimeter on the medial side and whatever we uh, planned we always end up in delivering it so i think to summarize we always this is a very efficient uh, device milling gives you always a great perfection and uh, the efficiency in or and i think that is what every surgeon requires so this is the post operative immediate post operative x ray of this patient uh, and what i would like to say is that this is how we can get always uh, consistent reproducible results in everybody every surgeon's hand and that's where the uh, advantage of robotic uh, system core lies uh, i think uh, that's all i want to say at this particular time thank you very much Dr. Vidya, that was excellent, and I love the presentation. And I think what's helpful about Corey is what you see on the planning screen is what your post-operative X-ray is going to look like. You have a very great comfort that what you see is what you get. So thank you all for taking the time to join us today to talk about Corey Robotics Total Knee Replacement. I hope you have a good rest of the session. So I'm glad to be with you live, and this is a fantastic meeting with a lot of interest in robotics. 
And I think what's unique about Corey, it's highlighted in this short video, is we have multiple implants. This is a large family of implants that's available to our users. And you can use a traditional design implant or a kinematic implant. You can use traditional mechanical alignment. You can use kinematic alignment. So there's a lot of flexibility. And this intraoperative flexibility is really key. So I can do a uni. I can add a PFJ to a uni. I can decide that I'm going to do a total. There's even a bicruciate retaining total knee, which is unique on the market, and a bicruciate substituting implant. And we can even do revision surgery very nicely with this system. And I think it's important to be able to do gap planning with range of motion data collection throughout the full range of motion from zero to 150 degrees. And this is truly computer-aided design combined with CNC machining with excellent sub-millimeter precision. You're definitely losing precision when you're using a saw. And if you want three degrees, you're going to get exactly three degrees using the handheld milling system. And all this comes in a small footprint and improved efficiencies. I think what prevents technology from getting adopted is that we lose efficiencies. For me, a uni is 20 to 25 minutes. It's one tray. A total knee is 30 to 35 minutes, two trays. So now I have improved efficiencies and a better surgery, and I have access to better implants. So all this is gonna give us the outcomes that we're looking for in our patients and let all of our patients have outcomes and achieve the high levels of activity that they're striving to achieve, including activities like surfing, which I think is the greatest test of any total knee implant or technique. Because you need to have full range of motion to pop up on the surfboard and ideally proprioception to manage the more complex turns like bottom turns and off the lip. So thanks for letting us share the Corey system with you. Please go check it out when you have a moment. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. So good morning. Yeah. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, this is now the time for uh, uh, an exciting session about uh, uh, unique compartment and replacement. I will uh, co-moderate this session with uh, Quang Dao, and we're going to have uh, uh, six excellent talks with uh, Gabriel Barron, Kevin Plancher, Chris Dodd. And uh, we're going to have uh, then um, uh, some time for discussion on this exciting topic. So we're going to start first with uh, uh, Gabriel regarding uh, the indications for Unicomp. Gabriel. See you. Thank you very much for your kind invitation. These are my conflicts. Uni have higher revision rates compared to TKA in different joint registries. Most of the failures occur in the first five years, and the cause of that could be technical errors or lack of selection criteria. The main factors that affect the outcomes are surgical experience and volume, the surgical indication to perform a refined surgical technique and the patient's related factors. There are many publications that show that experience or volume up to 20% or a number of units up to 23 cases per year per surgeon does achieve the similar results in terms of survivorship of torture and replacement. And in this cost-benefit analysis, we see that volume up to 10% is beneficial for the patients. Otto Robertson from the Swedish Register concludes that experience is not just to perform a refined surgical technique, also is to select properly the adequate patient. These are the classical indications that were published by Rito Scott and Stuart Cousin in 1989. We got a monocompartmental wear at one side of knee, stable central pivot, and middle collateral ligament, age less, of more than 60 years, and weight less of 81 kilograms, a stable knee, no bone loss, Patients not involved in strenuous activities and a deformity less than 10 degrees of virus or 15 degrees of virus and must be corrected. Age, well, we know that patients younger than 55 years have better similar and sim, the better or similar functional scores and outcomes than middle units in older patients. But the revision rates are higher in National Joint Registry and it's not published by the cohort study of experience group. Also, younger patients may not achieve the good result because they don't match their expectations that they have before the surgery. Octogenary patients are safer with a uni. Those patients have 
less com comorbid less uh, complications, lower rate of revisions, lower rate of complications compared to TK. So it's a safe procedure for all their patients. This is the data from the Oxford group. They compared to two national registries, and they showed that the uni experience in younger patients is similar to the revision rate in TKAs of the registries. But also we know that patients under 55 have higher revision rates compared, compared to olders. In contrast, TKAs in national registries also got a higher revision rate. So we need to have the indication of a uni instead of a trolling replacement in a younger patient. We need to balance the higher satisfaction rate with a higher probability of a revision in the uni group. Also, the revision of a uni is a much simpler procedure, have lower complications, lower morbidity, and lower cost than a revision of a total new replacement. And here we see, in a systematic review, that age under 60 is a major factor that affects outcomes in units. BMI, there are many controversies about how much BMI we can tolerate, but we would see in, in studies who are not biased that BMI over 32 is associated with lower functional scores, revision, or complications. Here we see a multi center study with surgeons who are using mobile bearing knees, and they found that functional scores in these patients are lower using, the, uh, using this score in the patients compared with the non obese. Next lecture will be on anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction combined with a uni, but the main indication in this case is for the younger patient who is active, who got a bone and bone severe disease of the medial side and, the, and got symptoms from instability of the anterior cruciate ligament. Chondrocalcinosis is not a contraindication. The outcomes and the results in survivorship is similar to those cases where primary diagnosis was an OA or osteonecrosis. Angular deformity also is an issue. If we can, if we do surgeries in patients that more deformity than 10 degrees of virus and 15 degrees of virus, we can lead to overcorrection, undercorrection, or instability. Most of these patients, those deformities are correlated with collateral ligament laxity, bone loss, and they got a higher chance to have component incongruency. If this occurs and it's more than five degrees, it could lead to instability and an early revision. For years, I've been the discussion how much wear of the Pachago femoral joint we could tolerate to indicate a middle uni. The Oxford group have published many of these studies, and they found retrospectively and prospectively that medial size Pachago femoral wear is not a contraindication for a middle uni and achieve similar results to the patient who don't have the Pachago femoral wear. And this has been corroborated by many studies using mobile brains and fixed bearing means. For Sadat also, and the severe wear of the central or lateral patella or trochlea is related to lower clinical and functional scores. These patients have increased pain climbing on the sentence stair, and lateral wear of the patella femoral joint is a major contraindication for amyloid uni. And as we see here, it's correlated with poorer outcomes in the systematic review. A group of Japan found the smaller patients who have received a mobile bearing knee and cemented, who have a metaphysical virus of the tibia, have a higher risk of a fracture or osteolysis of the implant. They saw that the medial eminence line, that's where we put our surgical cut, if this line dissects the middle tibia, the risk is higher of a fracture. Patients with partial loss of cartilage also have been the focus of the last five years. And we know that this patient could achieve similar functional results than patients that are bone on bone and have received a medial uni, but they got a higher remission rate mainly because of what we know, what it's called unknown pain. But what we do with this patient have been for several, several years in pain, and they don't have indication of a bone and bone uni. So the patient's a treatment gap. That's a lapse of time where they had the disease, they had symptoms, and they don't have indication of arthroplasty. And Dave Moran and the Finnish group found that a relation between the medial and lateral size uh, high, sorry, the middle and lateral height of this joint space is crucial. Medial units could be used if there is a middle compartment height is less than 40% compared to the lateral compartment in a preoperative AP weight bearing view. And their results are similar to those patients who are bone and bone. Also, MRI is a very, it's a very useful tool in these patients because it's very specific and sensitive. 
to the patients who have severe wear of the fall, fall of fever. And we did a uni after seven years of pain, and she has been out of pain for 10 years. So in summary, surgical indication is key in unis. Patients younger than 55 years have better functional scores but higher revision rates in the registries. There are no difference in survivorship in patients older than 60 years, BMI less than 35, or chondrocalcinosis. Medial patellofemoral wear doesn't affect functional results. And lateral wear of the patellofemoral joint is a major justification to indicate a medial uni. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Kevin Planter from New York. I'm going to share with you the ACL deficient osteoarthritic knee. I think an option is the medial UKA. It's still the right answer. Osteoarthritis uh, affects the knee most often. Adults greater than 60 years of age. You can see in the United States, 6 million individuals are affected at 65 years or older. Worldwide, about 23% adults are greater than 40 years of age are affected. In China, 81% of adults greater than 59, and in Europe, about 40% of adults greater than 16 years of age can be affected. The risk factors are many, but three major risk factors are meniscal deficiency, ACL deficiency, and malalignment. I'd like to pay attention for a moment to ACL deficiency. In ACL deficiency, it's chondral damage that occurs. Up to 80% demonstrate radiographic osteoarthritis from five to 15 years post-injury. And there's a longer time uh, between injury and reconstruction. If that occurs, 16% relative risk increase occurs in problems for the patient. Think always concomitant meniscal tears in an acute ACL up to 82%. It's the lateral meniscus that tears more frequently. In chronic ACL tears, 96% of the time more frequently, it's the medial meniscus. Nonetheless, ACL injury and abnormal joint space with a joint space with decreases quality of life and increasing of pain. ACL deficient knee, remember, increase anterior tibial translation. So the cartilage wear pattern is very different. It's postromedial. ACL intact knee, mechanics are preserved, cartilage wear pattern, classic, antromedial. That's what we think about for a uni. And an ACL and meniscus tear in general, 80% develop osteoarthritis within 10 to 15 years. And so people say, great, if that happens, total knee replacement. It's successful. It's good. But is it? Is he going to make this shot? 10 to 20% of patients after a total knee arthroplasty are unsatisfied. Reasons are somewhat elusive. Sometimes we do know. But the most common indications for revisions are big deals. Infection, aseptic loosening, instability, periprosthetic fracture. It's great. Maybe. It's good, but it's not perfect yet. So if this patient is bilateral medial compartment osteoarthritis with bone on bone seen here, I, I don't want to put in a total knee. My patients want to know that they have the same goals that I have. I want to expedite return to work. I want to expedite return to re recreational activities. I want to restore to near normal joint motion, and I want to restore near full functional physical function. I want to prevent further degenerative disease in the opposite, opposite compartment. The unis have an advantage. They preserve bone stock, patellofemoral, opposite compartment. They have near normal kinematics, low morbidity, improved range of motion, decreased costs. Most of us here now in the U.S. are doing outpatient or 23-hour stays with long-acting anesthetics. And the average recovery time is about 121 minutes. If it's overnight, it's about 1.2 days compared to a total knee of two and a half. That's a, a tremendous decreased cost. But the problem was the traditional indications of the dogma for unis were very strict. Age greater than 60, minimal pain at rest, flexion contractors less than five, deformity less than 10, intact ACL. Of course, contraindications were relative then, but still problematic for obesity, tricompartmental disease, medial collateral ligament insufficiency, hemophilia, hemochromatosis, chondrocalcinosis. And so many times people just put in a total knee. Today in 2021, I think there are expanded indications. We've written about isolated unicompartment knee pain, failed conservative treatment, angular deformities less than 15, but correctable 
passively by physical exam, range of motion with a flexion contracture less than 15, and definitely allow ACL deficiency as long as there's no anterior posterior instability, but there's medial lateral instability present, kind of like falling into a pothole. Our guidelines, less than 15 degrees flexion contracture, pain, we're pointing. This patient is pointing to the lateral side. The x-ray says that it's bone on bone medial. This patient will fail a uni. And that's why we use the one finger test. Anyone that puts their hand over the knee, that's not a uni patient. They have to, for medial compartment arthritis, have pain going downstairs, not pain going upstairs, point to it, x-ray shows it, passively correctable. Ligament stability, as I said, AP instability may not be present, but passively correctable varus and here the valgus stress test to assess the integrity of the MCL is key for our medial uni. But remember, as in total joints, 19% fail. Don't miss the lumbar spine issue. Don't miss left, in this case, hip osteoarthritis giving referred knee pain. We have to listen to our patients and do a better job. We owe it to them. Remember, if you're getting x-rays, AP view is great, but look at this AP view on the right knee and then look at the Rosenberg view. Suddenly bone on bone, PA view, 45 degree flexion, essential for interpreting a uni. Three foot standing films, essential for mechanical axis determination. Postoperatively, we like DVT prevention, thigh high anti-embolic stockings, cryotherapy, um, range of motion initiated immediately, goals of rehab, restore the normal knee mechanics. I won't strengthen till commencing at six weeks for the hips and the core and quadriceps. And six months, return to all sports, no restrictions, skiing, tennis, anything you want, activities of daily living, jogging. I'd like to share with you about the ACL deficient knee. I'd like to break some of the dogma. This is an article that is impressed in the British bone and joint match pair analysis comparing UK and ACL deficient ACL intact knees. Here you can see how did we do it. Match cohort, two to one match, 76 ACL intact, 38 ACL deficient, equal male, female, equal BMIs of 29, 28, 65 years, plus or minus 10. Survival, 10 years. The registry say no, 97%. Median survival was equal for ACL deficient, ACL intact at 16 years. Failure rate, absolutely had some. One in the ACL deficient, 2.6%. Two in the ACL intact, still 2.6%. I believe very acceptable compared to a lot of other procedures. No significant difference between groups, Lacoste, Lysham, Womack, VR12, ACL deficient knees, the achievement of patient acceptable symptom state, meaning they said they can do anything they want and love it. Pass of Lacoste in sport, ACL deficient, 87%. There's no total knee study that does higher. Achievement of past Lysham, 85%. ACL intact, achievement of past Coos, sport, 81%. I don't think they're as motivated, those. The ACL deficient bees seem to be more motivated. They're going skiing. And achievement to pass light show, 90% in ACL intact knees. Tegner levels, what they do in sports, median four for ACL deficient, ACL intact. But we had max scores of skiing, jogging, running, tennis, eight of a Tegner, never impacting the prosthesis longevity. So I come here to you today and say unis with an ACL deficient knee needs proper patient selection. No anterior posterior instability. No pivot shift is seen in those patients because the capsule kind of contracts with the arthritis. You need to listen to them. Where do they point their finger? Does it feel like it's falling into a pothole of the medial side? And there is not an absolute contraindication for a uni ACL deficient knee. Follow those recommendations. I think you're going to love it. And so, by the way, if you're fearful, do I do total knees here, a valgus knee? Here's a total knee, and we straighten them up. So I do do it, but today's talk is I want you to invest in unis when you can accordingly. I want to thank you. I wish you great health and safety as we're all struggling through this pandemic. It's Kevin Plancher from New York. And I send my love and wishes to you and your family. Thank you.
This talk uh, is about uh, robotic assistance for partial knee replacement. When we're discussing partial knee replacement and robotic, currently you have two options. You have one uh, with a burr when uh, you rely only on bone morphing to uh, make the plan and then execute the plan. And you have one uh, where you use a burr and so, and you rely on a 3D planning based on a pre-op CT scan. These are currently the two main options, and these are the two where you have evidence and publications. But are they all the same? That's a question. When we discuss new technologies, we, we should not consider them all the same. And that's very important that to understand every robot is different, and the results must be analyzed separately for each technology. Whether it's 3D pre-op or bone morphing based burr or so, and if you're using a dedicated inlay implant or you're using standard implants. I had the experience with both technologies and I will first discuss uh, the one based on um, bone morphing. First, you have to know there are evidence that these two systems are more accurate than conventional systems. There are cadaver studies showing this very clearly and you probably have uh, two times less uh, mistakes when you're using robotic. Then you have evidence, and we worked on that regarding the interest for um, accuracy for the positioning of the implants, also for the short-term you know, outcome and uh, improvement for that, and also for the you know, more challenging situation where people who are you know, uh, trying to perform sport activities as well. So all this is important, but what's more important when you use new technologies is to make sure there is no specific complications. And with these technologies, you have also evidence that there is no specific complications related to robotic assistance. And because you get more confidence, of course, this technology allows you to push the envelope and to have uh, more challenging indications like bicompartmental or even tricompartmental surgery. Then the other one, Meko, based on uh, 3D pre-op imaging, you have a lot of publications also proving on clinical studies that it's a, a tool increasing the precision for medial partially implant placement. Also, you have level one study uh, on uh, the accuracy and evidence showing that the, uh, the percentage of knee uh, with component position within two degrees of the target value is significantly improved with this technology of uh, uh, Meko. The learning curve, of course, uh, is always something to discuss, and for uh, this you have evidence that around 10 cases are sufficient to reach the steady state time. But what's very important is that there is no learning curve for accuracy and positioning of implants or alignments, and there are really nice evidence coming from uh, uh, Faris Adad uh, team, and uh, he presented this recently also in the ESCA meeting. This is a very important topic, no learning curve for the accuracy of these systems. Also, the efficiency, uh, always a concern and discussion regarding the time, extra time. And with this uh, system using a saw combined uh, with a burr, actually, the efficiency of the system allows the surgeons to uh, reach the same time. So it's time neutral, or even you can save some time when you're considering uh, using this technology for partial new replacements. Excellent level of evidence from several teams. It's always important to consider it's not only uh, conceptors who are you know, advocating for a technology, and now you have level one, level one studies showing that uh, this technology is providing significant benefits. Also, the security uh, of the system, thanks to the haptic control, uh, and also publications showing there is no soft issues or bone injuries due to this uh, technologies because you know the boundaries thanks to the pre-op uh, 3D planning. Post-operative pain uh, because of the technology and all the topics we discussed you have also uh, publications showing less uh, post-operative pain with these uh, uh, technologies and also as I discussed for uh, the Navio with the Meco you can extend indications with bicompartmental uh, new replacement. The lateral uni is uh, a topic I also really uh, like, and uh, the MECO has some publications showing the interest to anticipate the positioning to help the surgeons to uh, reach the right you know, uh, positioning of the implants using this uh, robotic technology. Then 
something that is uh, very important, of course, is the survival. And uh, you can see that uh, with the, this technology, the survival rate at three years uh, is improved. You have data from several teams and several continents showing that. And also the numbers uh, here with big you know, study with large numbers, more than uh, 13,000 MECO UK, you can see that the survival rate is six times better at three years follow-up. Then when we're discussing the, these uh, other publications here from Andrew Pearl, with at uh, six years follow-up, 97% survivorship. And uh, I like this graph because it shows that with every different publications, the uh, revision rate is always less than 3% uh, at five years. And if you compare with my uh, own experience and publications, you can see that it's definitely an improvement compared to uh, the survival rate with Navio or with standard instruments at the same follow-up. Then if you go to the registry, uh, you can see that the, the um, uh, Reptoris, which is the implant that is uh, implanted with uh, the, 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 the MAKO, uh, is doing better than the other options in the Australian registry. And um, also publication showing the benefit with the pre op CT uh, that uh, this is allowing uh, better uh, positioning and better sizing of the uh, implant when you're using this technology. Regarding uh, health economic data, uh, we just had a publication on that, the systematic review and benefit of the robotic technology for revision rate, length of stay, analgesia management, inpatient cost, and also physiotherapy. And this is the very recent publication from Martin Rush at the American Academy. A hip and knee surgeon association meeting, and uh, you see that at around 200 patients at 10 years minimum for a 98% survival rate, 97% satisfaction. So excellent uh, function and uh, survival at more than 10 years follow up. So the conclusion, you have strong evidence in favor of robotic partially. It's accurate. Uh, it provides better functional outcome, excellent survival rate, and the registry data are in favor. And I think you can say today that the city-based planning is also a very significant improvement. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you. Uh, we now uh, proceed with a talk on the uncemented Oxford uh, unicompartmental replacement and update. By way of disclosure, I received personal and institutional support from Zimmer Biomed, which directly impact upon this talk. We introduced the cementless 15 years ago to address the commonest causes of revision in registers, aseptic loosening and pain. If you look at the bottom right x-ray, you can well imagine an inexperienced surgeon revising this if the patient turned up with pain. This is physiological, it's not loose. We introduced the cementless using a randomized controlled trial comparing it to cemented, similar functional outcome and a markedly decreased radiolucent line. You tend to get an x-ray top right showing excellent fixation. I'll talk about cohort studies uh, in a minute. And the NGR is only recently beginning to separate cemented and cementless results. So in 2019, we undertook a comparative clinical study comparing the two. Our uh, patients are followed up by an independent physio. Because of a comparative study, the preoperative scores and demographics were the same. The revision rate, reoperation rate, and complication rates were identical between the two. The study was powered for the Oxford knee score. And the Oxford need score for cementless was 43, 41 with cemented. If you look at the uh, Oxford knee score categories, you can see on the right, more excellent with cementless and fewer poor with cementless. We did a comparative pain study using the ICOAP, which is a validated orthopedic pain score. And as you can see here, there were very low levels of pain with the cementless less than half that of the cemented. The largest differences were in no pain at all, shown on the bottom left, and in moderate and severe. We did a multi-center cohort study, looking at our first 1,000 Oxfords. This was published in 2017. First review, with more than one year follow-up, showed no complete radio distances and only 7% partial, matching the randomized control study. Second review at 12 years showed a survivorship of 97%. This was no difference from our published a thousand cemented, so we need NJR data to tease out the differences. So in 2020, Mohammed looked at 40,000 Oxfords. He compared cemented and cementless. This data is raw and unmatched 
and shows a lower revision rate with cementless. This is possibly related to surgeon volume. We then looked at uh, case load versus revision rate. Cemented and cementless were combined. Ten-year survivorship significantly better with a higher case load shown in green, more than 30 oxfords per surgeon per year. Case loads significantly higher in cementless suggest more experienced surgeons using cementless. This could explain the difference, so matching is essential. So a matched cementless versus cemented, 10-year survivorship, using propensity score analysis matched on 18 factors. Large numbers of cemented and cementless oxfords, confounders were thereby well matched. Cementless in red has a 10-year survivorship of 93%, cemented 90%. There were significant differences in the reason for revision. If you look at the left-hand side of the histogram here, cementless in red, you can see large differences in loosening, pain, and lysis. Together, the risk is halved. If you look at the right-hand side, small but significant increase in periprosthetic fracture when using cementless. And this histogram shows the revision rate for cemented and cementless with different case loads. 10-year cumulative revision rate. If you look at all the uh, case loads, the cementless is less than cemented. Low case loads on the left-hand side, high revision rate whether they use cemented or cementless. So the surgeon should either stop using unis or aim for a usage of 20% or more. Medium or high case load surgeons should consider using cementless because it's lower than cemented. High volume surgeons with cementless have a 97.5% 10 year survivorship, which is similar to total knees. I mentioned tibial fracture incidents. In Europe, it's rare. In the NJR and looking at readmissions with HES, the revision rate with cementless is three times that with cement, but it's low at 0.26. In Japan and perhaps in other Asian countries, it's much higher. We need to have careful surgery or other solutions. The anatomy in Asia is very challenging. Not only do they have small patients with small tibi, there's also an incidence of medial condyle overhang shown on the right-hand side. You can imagine that after a uni here, there's significant loading medial, which may predispose to fracture. So looking at very small uh, sizes, A or AA, and or marked medial overhang, a third of Asian patients seem to have this combination. And look what happens to the fracture rate, very high. If they have neither of these two anatomical uh, variances, then the fracture rate is low at about 1%, which is acceptable. We therefore recommend cemented tibia in very small A or AA tibias and or marked tibial uh, medial overhang. Cementless is possible in the rest. And we use cementless in all from femurs. It's not a problem. So looking at the NGR, the current status, this graph shows the 10-year survival and number of implantations per year for all unis with 10-year data. You can see top right, the Oxford cementless has the best 10-year survivorship and is the most commonly used in the UK. The number of cementless Oxfords is rapidly increasing. The cementless Oxford survivorship appears better than cemented. So in conclusion, the cementless Oxford has been used for 15 years and is well understood. Cementless compared to cemented results in quicker and easier operation, better fixation with fewer radiolucent lines, better clinical outcomes uh, measures, particularly less pain, the revision rate is a quarter less because the revision rate for loosening of pain is halved, but there is an increased rate of tibial plateau fracture, so great care must be taken when preparing the tibia. Surgeons doing more than 30 oxfords per annum, cementless, have a revision rate similar to total knees. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Kevin Plancher, and it's my honor to present Optimizing Unicondyle Knee Arthroplasty or Any Arthroplasty for Day Surgery, Time to Forget the Hospital. It's about patient optimization, and I'd like to share some of our thoughts. I want to thank APES Asia APKS for this conference. It's exciting to share with you today. What do we know about ambulatory surgery centers? We know the consumer demands it. Patient satisfaction here in the United States has risen tremendously. We know we can lower the costs with improved delivery of care uh, with uh, moving to the ambulatory surgery center. We also know that sadly so the pandemic of COVID-19 has created the urgency here in the United States. Think about your computer. Is it the same computer that you had 10 years ago? We need to improve the hospital setting and the surgical setting. So how do we begin? We assess, we anticipate, and we analyze. And if we do that, 
we will come out ahead. And most importantly, your patient will come out ahead. Look at the charges, 40 to 70% less for the same procedure, cost savings for the patient, the employer, the health plan. Think about Medicare in the United States and ambulatory surgery centers for arthroplasty. It's 20% below reimbursement for inpatient. So you would say, as you look here to the right and see the differential in spine surgery and arthroplasty, why isn't it come? Well, hospital lobbies prevent change to ambulatory surgery centers and that movement. It is time to analyze because without it, you can't justify things. Outpatient total joint arthroplasty is not new. It's been performed since 2001. Early series have demonstrated efficacy, economic analysis that shows patients and insurance companies with higher profit margin, hospitals lose revenue. That's why it doesn't happen. And safety, most importantly for patients, minimal complications are seen with high safety factors at ambulatory surgery centers. Efficacy, comparable. Study after study, clinical outcomes compared to hospital-based total joint arthroplasty. So where's the starting line to anticipate the issues? Well, it's with a great primary care physician teaming up with a terrific anesthesia team, and you as the orthopedist have to be technically skilled. But most important, you have to risk stratify your patient for their comorbidities. We have to look for diabetes, coronary artery disease, hypertension, preoperative anemia, any coagulopathy, any BMI greater than 40, any psoriasis, any untreated obstructive sleep apnea, because that's associated with early medical complications, patients with narcotic dependence, and anyone that doesn't have good home support, it must be analyzed. Patients must be highly motivated. Caution to the wind for those in chronic pain or people with high anxiety because it's predictors for possible failure. What is that predictor of adverse a serious advance or readmission? Look at that odds ratio, 13.13. If you don't realize that the patient had a previous MI, CVA, renal failure, DVT, pulmonary embolus, and sepsis, you need to be careful. Some of the odd, other odd ratios are listed here. Notice smoking is still one, female gender for this type of surgery, and more importantly, age. Here's a study of 1,012 consecutive primary total hip and total knee arthroplasty. Close to 7% of the surgeries required major interventions, 84% of them greater than 24 hours postoperatively. And what were they? As I just said, complications greater than 24 hours postop. Odds ratio of 9.71 for congestive heart failure, COPD, cirrhosis. It is key, patient selection, patient optimization, and you need to do this to help your patients to succeed, and you will in turn. So how do you stratify a patient? You could use the American Society of Anesthesiologists, the ASA classification system. It's not really sensitive or specific. You could use the Charleston Comorbidity Index, not sensitive or specific either. So try the outpatient arthroplasty risk assessment score, originated in Indiana, validated at NYU, and successfully anticipates outpatient safety. Identifying and anticipating high-risk patients is essential. The red flag for opioid abuse is there. Look in the patient history for nicotine dependency, age less than 45, lower level of education, how about aberrant behaviors, like an early history to refill requests or previous opioid consumption? Do you know that previous opioid consumption proves less satisfaction with pain relief post-op, greater pain intensity, and high-risk failure for multimodal regime? But patient education is key. It will alter and influence the pain perception, decrease opioid use, will help you manage patient expectation. Perhaps show a two-minute educational video. It's been shown about two and a half times more likely to discontinue opioids than a control group. Understand the expectations. Explain things in simple terms because we as orthopods, we're really good at a lot of things, but we are so poor in clinical empathy shown in study time after time after time. Speaking of multimodal pain management, anticipate 
preemptive medications, modern anesthetic techniques, periarticular injections, a comprehensive pain regimen, limiting opioids, avoiding nausea and vomiting, will design it for a successful early discharge program with a very happy patient. So periarticular injections, I encourage them. They're blocking local nerve conduction. They have a local anti-inflammatory anti effect. It is technique dependent, so learn how to do it, and significantly reduces post-operative pain and narcotic use. An excellent adjunct to peripheral nerve blocks without associated weakness and or any therapy restrictions. Physical therapy is integral, consider digital solutions. Maybe it's in-home, perioperative PT programs. You have to assess the home. And you do that one to seven days post-op. Transition them, though, to outpatient. Maybe it's a web-based physical therapy. Equivalent outcomes have now been shown in studies to outpatient physical therapy and knee range of motion and functional outcome scores. All of this facilitating same-day discharge so the therapist meets them in the recovery room with decreased costs for the episode of care. So final thoughts today for patient optimization. The role of the ASC, the hospitals you know, must house the COVID-19 positive patients. So ASCs can lessen the burden of COVID-19 patients because those that are negative can come to the ASC. There's a higher demand by patients for outpatient surgery. Think about rescheduling all inpatient surgeries to outpatient if possible. Minimize exposure of asymptomatic patients. Have additional screening protocols for COVID-19 tests, strict preoperative interviews, meticulous selection and optimization and stratification for medical risk. Assess, anticipate, and analyze. Because if you want, like this little girl, to dance in the rain and not get wet, you need to be smart as she has a beautiful umbrella to protect her. And it's most important for the success of our patients. I want to thank you and remember to focus on the present. Don't dwell on the past. Never commit fully to the future with careful reflection because no race wins at the beginning. I wish you all good health as we all work our way through this pandemic to you and all your families. This is Kevin Plancher saying thank you. So now we have uh, some minutes for discussion and uh, we have a lot of questions to ask to our faculty. Uh, I will start with uh, Gabriel. Uh, Gabriel, can, can you explain to us precisely as a pre-op uh, radio radiographic assessment, what's, what's your usual, you know, uh, pre-op X-rays you're using? Do you use MRI? Do you consider, you know, some other imaging? Well, uh, first I use conventional instrumentation, so uh, I, I don't need most of the time a CT scan. I use uh, regular X-rays, AP, lateral, a Rosenberg view, an Axel view, and a long-standing film. MRI, no MRI, very rarely. Just in patients who have lost, uh, partial loss of cartilage. Okay, I, I have a question for you as well, Gabriel, and the rest of the faculty. Now, we're trying to really push the envelope for uni compartmental knee replacement. With rheumatoid arthritis, we have better management in terms of medical management, and these patients are being pretty well managed. Uh, are there any of you pushing that envelope and starting to do unicompartmental knee replacements in rheumatoid patients? Uh, no. Chris? Yeah, I, mean, I don't want to have the risk. <laughs> I mean, if you look at the, the number of patients out there with anteromedial osteoarthritis, it's huge. The number of people who have uh, a picture that uh, is uh, suitable uh, following a rheumatoid uh, diagnosis is very, very rare. It's a bit like ACL and unis. Why look at these rarities? Let's concentrate on the vast majority of people who have anteromedial osteoarthritis. Exactly. So to jump on this this comment, Chris, you, you, for this patient, what's very common is to you know to question the patellofemoral joints, and uh, you you guys in Oxford have you know I think excellent you know uh, guidelines and recommendation regarding how we should consider the PF joint when we are making the decision of a medial uni. Can you summarize uh, your thought on that? 
Yeah, I mean, we've looked at clinical uh, issues, we've looked at the site of pain, we've looked at intraoperative assessment, and uh, we've looked at uh, preoperative x-ray assessment. And uh, essentially, as was very um, you know, beautifully put um, by Gabrielle, if there is a lateral bone on bone uh, or lateral joint space narrowing, which is very rare in anterior osteoarthritis, less than 4% of patients have anteromedial osteoarthritis and lateral bone on bone or lateral joint space narrowing in the patella. So in those patients, it's sensible to do a total knee. But if, if you look at everything else, certainly bone on bone immediately, uh, and if you look at full thickness cartilage loss in the trochlea, that there is no impact uh, upon the, um, the results. So 4% of patients, you need to take care of the patellofemoral joint. In the rest, uh, with unis, you don't. Chris, uh, a question about this. How much deformity, you are a very experienced surgeon, how much deformity do you accept in the medial side? Do you, do you get patients with more than 10 degrees or some, osteo, or, or some bone def deficiency of the medial side on, on the, for the medial uni? Or 10 degrees is your, your maximum to, to do a uni? Yeah, I mean, I think that's really interesting. It's a bit like, you know, how much flexion to capture. It's a bit like sort of the overall alignment. Uh, we used to complicate matters, but actually in the end, if you look at the x-rays and you diagnose this very common pathology of anteromedial osteoarthritis, the deformity is very rarely more than 10 degrees. The flexion contracture is never more than 20 degrees. So all these other things that we worry about tend to fall into place. So in the end, uh, I would suggest that the surgeons don't worry about these other things. They look at x-rays in patients coming up for knee replacement. And if the patients happen to have uh, the uh, diagnosis radiographically of anteromedial osteoarthritis, those patients can, uh, those surgeons can think uh, uni. And they needn't worry nearly so much about deformity and about flexion contracture and about alignment because that will all be taken care of in the diagnosis of anteromedial osteoarthritis. It's just a question on the lateral compartment. Uh, we, we sometimes get MRI scans for the lateral compartment. Is a lateral meniscal tear a contraindication? Uh, osteophytes contraindication? Or a little bit of arthritis in the lateral compartment is something that you avoid doing a uni on? Yeah, a really interesting uh, question on the lateral side. Um, we heard about all the pain having to be uh, on the medial side, uh, the patient pointing to the medial compartment. And, um, you know, most patients do with uh, AMOA, but occasionally they have uh, lateral pain. Uh, we have only really ever looked at the lateral side using stress x-rays. So, uh, unfortunately, I can't really comment on the MRI uh, other than to say uh, two things. First of all, MRI is very sensitive and non-specific. Uh, and secondly, uh, many patients, as they get older, uh, with AMOA, and you can look at this if you do post-mortem studies, they will have uh, lateral, um, some of them will have lateral meniscal tears, some of them will have, os many of them will have osteophytes, uh, and um, some will have partial thickness cartilage loss, uh, and yet they didn't know about it. So I suspect uh, as long as they have AMOA, the lateral side, you know, it becomes much less important. But, but the, the evidence is not strong there, apart from stress x-rays. If you do a stress x-ray and the lateral side is either normal in thickness or it's not, then the results tend to be very predictable. If I want to add something up for that, uh, just published in the Journal of Arthroplasty this week, I think we received it today, was a Korean article about with MRI, with asymptomatic meniscal tears of the lateral side and unis medial units and there was no difference in pain or survivorship with this patient. And also you published a, a paper on, on chondral damage, uh, small damage on the lateral compartment, on lateral femur, and also there were no differences between patients who have not or they, they have a damage on the lateral side. So uh, asymptomatic damage, small damage, or asymptomatic meniscal tears of the lateral side are not contraindication for a medial uni, in my, in my view. A question for Gabriel and for Chris uh, regarding the BMI. What, what's your current limit regarding BMI, if you have any? Um, for me, it's not just a number. <laughs> it, it also depends on the activity. If it's a patient over 35 with lower activity, older than 70 years, and with a lot of comorbidities and 
and mostly over 40 for me is a contraindication. Even we are using stems in these patients, we are using total. So I care about the bone quality of these patients. But for me, 35 and good function. Yeah, yeah, as you know, we looked at this uh, principally by uh, assessing um, American patients from the Midwest. Uh, and we are beginning to catch up with them in terms of, of, of obesity. And, and what we find, found was that there was um, no correlation between BMI and survivorship. In fact, the ones with the best survivorship were the heaviest patients. And that's probably because they don't do very much. They go from the refrigerator to the sofa. I mean, they have to be careful, really, and being facetious. But... Um, there was no correlation. Um, and, and obviously, a, uh, what we did find was there was a huge difference in the delta, the change between preoperative and postoperative Oxford scores. The ones that were uh, really uh, heavy actually had significantly improved changes in score. Uh, and as you know, a total knee in a heavy patient is a hugely difficult operation. So, I mean, it seems to us that, um, you know, based on the data and the evidence that... Um, BMI is not a contraindication and the surgery is simpler, but obviously the surgeon needs to be experienced and the surgeon needs to be committing to unis and doing a significant number. Sebastian, question for you. With, with robotic surgery, we are able to place our components in a more precise and accurate position. Are you trying to replicate or reproduce the patient's anatomy in terms of slope and coronal alignment as well? Yeah, with the with the systems uh, currently available, you, you can uh, you have a direct understanding of the patient's anatomy, and uh, it's 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 completely true that uh, we're trying to replicate the anatomy uh, of the patient, and um, actually with pre-op imaging plus intra-op assessment of the remaining cartilage, uh, you are really understanding very well what uh, you know the 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 anatomy of the patient and. Um, these these tools are providing us uh, some additional information. I mean, th th that's just a tool. I, again, when I'm talking about robotic, it's not, I'm not trying to change uh, our understanding of partially, but it's uh, uh, helping us, you know, to achieve the goal. And uh, yeah, regarding the slope, trying to maintain the slope and um, yeah, to restore the the pre-op anatomy, uh, still get some some boundaries, but uh, I do push the limit a little bit. Yeah. So Seth, of, can I ask a question and extend it to um, Chris? And that is, you know, there are surgeons that are watching, like myself, who've been doing maybe cementless Oxfords for 15 years and happy with outcomes, but then you see results continuously, like Sebastian presented, of Robotic UKA. And now we're starting to think perhaps if we, like I've been using robotics for total knee replacement for a year and a half, Perhaps if we change to a robotic platform and may have to change the implants we use, whether our patients would be better off. Interested in your thoughts on that, Chris and Seb. You want to go first, Seb? Or... <laughs> yeah, I can try. <laughs> no, no, yeah, we're not going to. I'm not trying to challenge the the implant, you know. And and I would love to be able to use the technology to to use to use the Oxford uh, Uni, but. Um, yeah, I mean, you're right. And because you're changing the technology, if you have to change your implants, it's a big deal. It's like changing the approach for the hip and changing the implant you're using. And if you're satisfied with uh, what you've been using for 15 years, I, was, there's no, I think there's no good reason to change. But uh, I found for the fixed bearing implants, using robotic has been a significant improvement, for sure. Chris? Yeah, I'm you know really a fan of robotics. Uh, you know, I think it's clearly the future, uh, and in many instances, it, it, it's the present. And it really is a question of uh, you know the implant, I think, to a certain extent. And Seb is alluding to that, and it is also in great part uh, due to surgical experience. And it seems to me, as Seb was saying, that if you're getting great results and you're doing big numbers, then whether it's fixed or mobile. I see no reason for you to invest in, in, in a robot unless you're a great researcher. However, you know, if you're beginning, uh, if you're somebody who is, uh, uh, you know, worried about uh, unis, uh, worried about component alignment, then undoubtedly robots give you great component alignment. And um, I think particularly for an implant that is very sensitive to component alignment, then it makes a lot of sense to consider using robotics because they're, they're, they're certainly prime time. But... Uh, you know, it seems to me that if, you know, if you're using an implant which is forgiving a component malalignment, uh, then it's not necessary. 
Thank you. I have a question from Dr. Kang Yu Kim for the faculty. You have different indications between UKA and HTO. Start off with you first, Gabriel. I think there are different patients. I think the patients who's active with a partial loss of cartilage and gut deformity, virus or virus deformity, is involved in strenuous activities or have heavy work. Uh, HDOs and EFOs have uh, demonstrated that are cost benefits surgery. I think this this group of patients are an osteotomy beneficial. For the patient who is not as active and is not bone and bone, uh, and is bone and bone, sorry, I think the uni is a great uh, surgery. I think they're not similar patients. Maybe in some area they are they are together, but most of the times they're not. It's not the same indication for one or the other. I don't think that's it's not challenging me. Sebastian, I agree that the, the discussion could be between partial and total, but H uh, two for me are young patients with a, a constitutional virus deformity on the tibia side and. Uh, uh, usually they are not bone on bone, so that's not the, not the same patient. And um, yeah, I've, I've improved increased my number of portion lists, but it's uh, related to decreasing my percentage of total lists. Didn't change my uh, HTO practice. And thanks, Chris. No, I've got nothing else to add. In entirely agree. They, they, they tend to be different patients. I got a question for Chris. Which are your exclusions for a cementless uni? Which patient you are not going to a cementless uni? That's a very interesting question. Um, when we first introduced the cementless, we wanted to compare it with cement. We did the randomized study to make sure that there was no glaring problems uh, initially. And our primary outcome measure was uh, radiolucent lines. So we had a massive reduction in radiolucent lines. And so we, were, we felt comfortable about that because of this propensity to tend to uh, revise painful units with a radiolucent line. And if you look at all registries, that's the, the issue. So we then began to look at um, you know, the issue of indications and you have to do many more numbers and complications, you have to do uh, numbers. So we got into cohort studies and then you know, the uh, yeah, numbers. And we realized that unless you did it to everybody uh, and offered it to everyone, you, you really couldn't um, you know, uh, say that there were any exclusions. And uh, we slowly ramped up. We began to give it to everyone, uh, little old ladies, clearly with osteoporosis and uh, soft bone. And what we found was that there were no contraindications. Uh, you, there didn't seem to be any subgroup of patients that wouldn't do well. I mean, the, I think a, a, a medial is different to a total knee because you tend to load on the medial side. Uh, and obviously, if the lateral side is not a uni, not a uni, in other words, you, you're not doing a total, and there's no problem. But with a total, you get medial loading and you get lateral lift off. So cementless totals need to be pretty good, and they are certainly coming back. I think in totals we failed cementless. So uh, to answer your question in a rather a long roundabout way, um, you know, there are no uh, patients that we don't offer the cementless to. We do it in all patients. You have, we have one last question. I would like to ask maybe Gabriel regarding uh, sport activity. What, what do you accept for your patients? What, what, what are your potential contraindications regarding sport activities? Well, in contrast with uh, Kevin Blanchard's lectures, for me, I always explain to the patient that a uni also is an implant, that load and activities will affect, could affect uh, the outcome. But I always tell the patients regular issues about don't doing strenuous activities, playing football, basketball, or jogging. Many of these patients, they are not taking care of what I say. And sometimes I found my own patients playing football in, in my own JCC club. So my issue is I explained to them that it's an, that's an implant. I don't want to go for any further risk, but I allow them to do whatever they want. Well, thanks a lot, Gabriel. Thanks a lot, uh, all of you, for the great discussion. Fantastic talks. It was a great session. And now there is a great debate coming. And I'll hand over to Seb Parrot, who's going to animate the debate for or against robotic assistance. Thanks a lot, and enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you Thank very you. much, Seb. It was a great session, guys. Congratulations for this very interesting discussion as well. And now we're going to have a, a real debate. And I would like to acknowledge that the organizer of the EPAS, as usual, have been visionary. 
because the debate is going to be England versus Italy, and it's a reminder of the Euro Cup final. How did they know that? It had been so good that they were able to guess this uh, competition. We have uh, on uh, one hand uh, Professor Chris Todd from Oxford showing us that we can do a very good unicompartmental knee arthroplasty without a robot and that the result can be good on the longer uh, term as well. On the other hand, we're going to have the uh, uh, Italian professor, Professor uh, Fabio Catani, showing us that the robot is the, uh, is the key point to get good long-term results with unicompartmental neoplasty. Let me tell you that there are two former uh, past president of the European Knee Society. They are unicompartmental knee expert, and they are both very interested in new technology. Now it's time for them to give us their argumentation. And please, after this debate, I'm going to ask you to vote for or against robotic to improve shorter and longer term results for unicompartmental neoplasty. We're going to start with Professor Fabio Catani showing the interest of robotic in unicompartmental neoplasty. Please, can we play the uh, talk for Professor Catani? Good morning, and thank you very much for inviting me this, uh, to this prestigious uh, symposium. Uh, I would like to talk about the use of robotic assistance that improves short and long term outcome of unicompartmental arthroplasty. Uh, I have to disclose because I'm consulting Striker and receiving consultant royalties uh, related to robotics. Uh, we're going to talk about how robotics uh, has been applied to unicompartmental knee arthroplasty um, almost 10 years ago. Uh, we're going to talk about early functional and rehabilitation uh, improvement. And um, we uh, look at the old literature and um, um, we found high volume of papers on early outcome, clinical outcome and survivorship, uh, early meaning two years. Of follow up, uh, low volume literature on mid term clinical outcome survivorship, so five years minimum, and no long term studies uh, published so far. Uh, if you look at the early functional outcome, this paper uh, published by Professor Adad group uh, demonstrated the reduced post op pain, uh, decrease in anti requirements, and improved maximum deflection of discharge. Uh, with the uh, reduced mean time to hospital discharge of 28 hours. Uh, if you look at the full up of two years, uh, we have high patient satisfaction uh, in 84% of the cases uh, and also less revision rates uh, compared to conventional surgery um, showing 90% at minimum of two years uh, and several papers uh, um, uh, also has, uh, have been looking at this data. If you look at the minimum five years, uh, meet the term clinical outcome survivorship, um, we, look, uh, we found higher survivorship uh, compared to conventional unicompartmental arthroplasty, so more than 97% in uh, five years. Uh, excellent clinical outcomes, uh, forgotten joint, more than 80 in almost more of 50% of the cases, and COOS uh, score uh, more than 84 uh, immediate unicompartmental uh, arthroplasty and uh, more than 85 in lateral unicompartmental arthroplasty. Uh, patient satisfaction is a liquor scale, uh, more than four in 84% of the cases. Um, also, this paper at five years is showing very nicely, uh, is the only RCT available that uh, will find no statistical differences between. Uh, uh, the robotic arm uh, assisted uni with the manual unicompartmental arthroplasty, but interestingly, um, with the robotic assisted uh, unicompartmental arthroplasty, we're lower intervention rate uh, with 0% of revision compared to 6 or 9% of manual group. Uh, as you can see here, uh, two revision to total knee arthroplasty and uh, four possible. Uh, for possible infection, meniscal tear, lateral, and pain for and being treated but with uh, atrophy. Uh, we've been comparing our results for revision 
uh, comparing with the same follow-up with the mobile bearing or fixed bearing as, um, as you can see here from the data that we found a lower incidence of revision for aseptic loosening and most importantly uh, for OA progression. Uh, same in incidence for pain infection and post-traumatic uh, uh, reason. So in conclusion, uh, robotic arm assisted unicompartimental arthroplasty is associated uh, with improved early function rehabilitation and outcomes over manual uh, unicompartimental arthroplasty. Uh, we found high rates of patient satisfaction in minimum two years of follow up and reduced revision uh, compared to conventional uh, UKA. High rates of patient satisfaction, forgotten joy, a minimum of five years. Higher survivorship rate at minimum of five years of follow-up uh, compared to mobile and fixed bearing uh, reported in the literature. And the only RCT that have been shown uh, comparing conventional uh, to robotic-assisted uh, surgery, at five years, no clinical outcome differences, uh, but lower reoperation uh, rate in favor of robotic-assisted unicompartimental arthroplasty. Thank you. I'm now going to argue against the routine use of robots in partial replacement. By way of disclosure, I received personal and institutional support from Zimmer Biomet, which impacts upon the, this uh, talk. So in 2019, Faris Haddad, shown here, who's a great proponent of the robot, published his early results uh, using the robot and compared it to his manual Oxfords. And you can see uh, a number of different outcome measures. The robot is much, much better, and all of these are highly statistically significant in terms of discharge time, pain, straight leg raising, and physiotherapy. The question is, is this really due to robotic technology? So here we have uh, the Oxford experience uh, using the same outcome metrics. And as you can see, this was published in 2019, significant numbers, 1,000 cases. About a quarter of our patients go home as day cases, so the discharge time is much less. Pain the same. Uh, our patients achieve straight leg raising much, much quicker and require little physiotherapy. So what is the technology? Is it some wonderfully new robot? No, it's expectations. Clearly a major impactor on outcome. So the best evidence comparing the two comes from Glasgow uh, in 2017. A randomized study looking at Mako versus the Oxford. Medium error versus planned. Uh, of com for component positioning, uh, two degrees for robot, four degrees for manual, significantly better. But this is uninterpretable because there was no preoperative planning for the manual. The Oxford's evidence-based acceptable range for component positioning is plus or minus 10 degrees on the femur because it's a sphere, and plus or minus five degrees on the tibia. And as you can see in green, uh, the manual did much better uh, when looking at all component position. And the newer instrumentation, microplasty, it's markedly better, and this was shown from India by GABA in 2018. So if you look at the uh, results, this is a mean Oxford score, robotic in red, manual in blue. You can see early, up to one year, the robot has better early results. Uh, this may be due to expectations or soft tissue involvement. By five years on the right-hand side, there's no difference. Uh, by two years, many other studies have no difference either. So certainly there is no positive impact of the robot beyond about one to two years. Looking at revision rates, comparative studies, Blythe in the study I've just mentioned of five years, no failures with the robot, three with the manual, clearly favoring the robot, not significantly so, and 20% lots of follow-up. Wong showed the robot higher failure, whereas Cool uh, showed significant uh, numbers of robots doing very well with 0.8%, manual 5.3. Non-comparative studies, Klebold, uh, a multi-center robotic study, significant numbers, 3% uh, revision rate, clearly an acceptable 0.6 per annum. Karate showed the opposite. His initial experience with the robot, 11% failure rate, clearly unacceptable. Mohammed, uh, doing a systematic review of 8,000 Oxfords, showed a revision rate of about 0.7% per annum. So there's no evidence of a definite advantage for the robot. And worryingly, the Steiger in 2020 has shown a three times higher robotic infection risk uh, in the uh, Australian Joint Registry. So we need to look at this in more detail. 
What about time and cost? Well, there's little information. But clearly, initially, uh, the robot is going to be more expensive. You need additional staff. There's preoperative uh, templating and uh, CT, which is expensive. The setup time and disposables are more expensive. And even in experienced hands, operative time is 10 to 20 minutes longer. The total cost per case varies, perhaps as much between 3,000 and 6,000 US dollars. However, there is data now appearing uh, as to how to make it more cost effective. And obviously, if you increase volume, the robot becomes more cost effective. But you need to get up to about 100 cases a year, which very few surgeons are achieving. You need a very low revision rate, which can be challenging. And of course, day case surgery uh, will positively impact it. But of course, most manuals are going home as day cases. What about other factors? Well, marketing, there's a perception by patients that it must be better, and this is supported by marketing. The robot is common in environments where there are many surgeons in competitions such as Australia and US. And obviously, many hospitals are now making the decision to buy the robot because they expect increased activity, which isn't necessarily the case, and savings due to early discharge. But as we've said, uh, many manuals are going home on the same day. So in conclusion, currently the robot is unnecessary and expensive. There's no need to use the robot unless you're in a competitive market or having difficulty with surgery. It's an expensive research tool. And for those of you who don't believe the evidence, you can still get a second-hand Mako on eBay for about $100,000. Good luck. Thank you. So Chris, uh, you are uh, online for the discussion, and um, we had a question earlier about the uh, alignment on unicompartmental neoplasty. And my question to you, Chris, is that we know that alignment is uh, has an impact on the survivorship of the implant. Do you think that we can achieve this alignment without a robot, the proper alignment of uni without a robot? Yeah, I think it will clearly depend upon surgeon experience. Um, and I think there may well be, although we don't have evidence for this yet, there may be some differences between fixed bearing and the mobile bearing. Um, in terms of, of uh, surgeon experience, if you haven't got much experience, then there's evidence to suggest that your component alignment uh, clearly is going to be many more outliers and less predictable. But Equally, as you get more experienced, there is evidence to suggest that your alignment gets much, much um, improved. So again, it comes down to experience. Um, as you know, and as I tried to tease out in the talk, with the mobile bearing, because it's a sphere, the um, degrees of malalignment are much, much wider. So on the femur, it's plus or minus 10 degrees, uh, and on the tibia, plus or minus 5 degrees. And it has no impact at all. Uh, on component uh, survivorship. So um, I don't know, it's going to be very interesting. And, and it seems to me that what one needs to do is to begin to look at this in more detail. But I am a fan of the robot. It's fantastic for research at the moment, and I think it's the future. Thank you, Chris. Uh, uh, another question, and I would like to remind you guys to vote on the uh, poll that is uh, available for or against. Uh, and please uh, uh, do not hesitate to start voting because we have to uh, name the winner. And uh, I can vote, you all can vote online directly. Chris, uh, we saw initially that the success of the robot was related to the fact that surgeons who were not uni user started to become uh, capable of doing uni. Is that the only way to get to uni? Because not, of, not everybody got a robot, you know, and uh, 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 uni are still great implants. So can you kind of reassure the uh, people that can't use the robot but still interested in uni? Well, that's definitely true, Sam, and a, and a very important point. The vast majority of us will not have and won't have access to the robot. All that one really needs to do is ask a, a couple of questions. If you want to get all the advantages of unis and to get good results in the long term, then you need to commit to unis. All the evidence would suggest that you need to look at patients coming for knee replacements, and aim to uh, do at least 20% of them uh, as unis. And many surgeons will do more. And all you have to do is uh, look to see whether they have the radiographic features of antremedial osteoarthritis. And up to 50% of patients attending for knee replacement surgery will fulfill that criteria. So there are ample number of people uh, who are suitable for unis. So start off slowly, you must get to 20%. And it's very easy to do, and it's very quick to do it as well. And then you will get good, predictable, long-term results with unis. 
Thank you, Chris. Another thing that we see very often in the uh, literature or in the report, and it's going to be my last question before uh, naming the winner, is that uh, the only business model uh, that can justify the cost of the robot is for the surgeon to jump from total knee arthroplasty to unique compartmental knee arthroplasty. From your data, Chris, we can still achieve that without uh, a robot, correct? And it's very, very short uh, answer. Yes, that's entirely true. You don't need a robot to get up to 20%. What you need to do uh, is to look for the patients. They see you, but you don't see them. Chris, I have to interrupt you because there's a draw. There's a draw again versus uh, Italy versus England. What is going on, guys? What is going on? So unfortunately, uh, we don't have the time for the extra time. We don't have the time for the penalties. So it's going to be a draw. And there's still up, uh, open room for discussion. And I like that because... There's a uh, proponent, there's people against. I would like to thank you both for your great talks. Congratulations. And I end over for the rest of the meeting. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So, so we're, we're about to go live, guys, but everything's okay. Clap, you happy? And if you need to talk to me, mate, just, you know, fit hand up, whatever. I'm, but I'm just mean, if there's a drama. And if there's any drama, guys, we're just going to say we're going to go offline yep. for a moment. Gen That's gentlemen, you are, you are now live to the audience, gentlemen. Thank you. Okay, welcome, everybody. Um, this is the live surgery, and I'd like to introduce the moderating team first. Uh, myself, Rami Soriel from Sydney. Um, my co-moderators will be Chan He from Shanghai in China, and Parag Sanchetti is joining us. Uh, from Pune in India. Um, we are awaiting Yong in Korea, but um, he's got a technical problem. So I welcome Parag and Juan He uh, to the moderating panel. And I'd like to extend a thank you, obviously, to the surgical team over in Perth in Western Australia. Um, Dermot Colopy, as a surgeon, will be conducting a total knee replacement um, on a gentleman. Uh, he wants me to run through some of the um, preoperative x rays. He's doing a um, if I can just share the screen. Can I be enabled to share the screen, please? Andrew. So he's going to conduct a total knee replacement using the Mako robot. Um, he's got uh, a medial parapetal approach. He's already made the approach. They're just waiting for us to um, be able to join them. Dermot, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. We're on. So Good on you. Okay. Yeah, you're, you've got you're my feed on live. Yep. Why, why don't you... Uh, just We've got the x-rays. I haven't not? shown the x-rays yet, but waiting to share screen. Okay. But okay. Uh, you might want to do a few introductory words. Yep. So welcome, everybody. Yep. Thanks very much for joining us all today, guys. It's uh, nice to be able to do live surgery since we can't see each other in place. So this gentleman's a 60, so this is a 75-year-old gentleman. He's a retired manual worker. He's worked hard his whole life, uh, and his knees borne the brunt of that. He had an open meniscectomy as a 25-year-old and has developed advanced medical department osteoarthritis as a result. He actually is quite impressively arthritic with a significant various deformity and lateral tibial subluxation. You'll see that on his x-rays. He also has coexistent gout, and you can during the case you'll see that he's got uh, quite a bit of contracalcinosis and he's got a, a couple of gouty tophi in the prepatella bursa, which I've already tidied up. Rami, can you just share this? You have the x-rays, Rami? Yeah, I am, but it's not allowing me to do it. Okay. Okay, we might talk through it, and then when you get yeah, the yeah. slides up, we'll have a I'll look show and see. Them later. Yep. Okay. So if we zoom in now, guys, to show you the extent of his arthritis. So I've done a preliminary medial papatella approach. That's my standard approach for all knees, even severe valgus knees. I'll use the medial parapetella. Uh, this gentleman's got advanced arthritis. He's, he's got a, a long-standing absent ACL, as you can see. He's got quite large notch osteophytes. He's got about 10, 12 or more degrees of fixed flexion, and his range of motion's only perhaps 100. We'll see that soon with, once we put the navigation pins in. So we're using a, a robotic system from Mako, from Stryker, and we'll talk through some of the nuances of that. I know you've seen some of the other surgeons earlier today uh, using some of the other systems. So if people can see our plan, I'm going to go to the Mako plan. So as part of the, this is image-based planning, and the patient has a preoperative CT scan, and that CT scan then is formatted to give a three-dimensional model of both the femur and the tibia. We'll stay on the femur for the moment. So that's the 3D model on the AP and on the, the axial view. And you'll see four dots, three pink dots and one blue dot. So they are dots that you choose 
the, the points of the bone where you want to take a reference point for measured resection. So the most distal points of the distal medial condyle, distal lateral condyle, and the most posterior points of the medial and lateral condyles are chosen as our, if you want old-fashioned, that's our joint lines, and we are then going to perform measured resection beneath those points. I'll show you the tibia as well now, the model of the tibia. And you'll see this gentleman has quite advanced medial compartment wear with some medial, uh, some, some large medial-sided osteophytes and quite a, uh, an eroded anteromedial uh, tibial plateau. So we'll go to the model. So once you have the model, we then go with Mako software to, to, to devise a preoperative plan of the surgical case we want to undertake. So we can choose the depth of resection. We can choose whether we are going for a mechanical aligned a knee, a neutral mechanical alignment, or whether we're going to do an anatomic-based um, model, a kinematic alignment model. And so in the top left picture, you see the coronal uh, picture of the femur. And if you see at the very top, it says five degrees of uh, 0.5 degrees of valgus. So this patient has quite a neutral lateral distal femoral angle. So he's only got perhaps half a degree of valgus there as, as his native femoral valgus uh, uh, distal joint line obliquity, whereas on the tibia, he's got two or three degrees of tibial joint line obliquity, as you can see. So we are measuring on the tibia to take seven millimetres from the lateral plateau and seven millimetres from the medial plateau. If you go to the 2D view, you'll see that a little better, that we are, that's a coronal uh, two-dimensional image there uh, showing what we're going to resect. Um, if we go back to the 3D picture, please. Is this okay, Rami? You happy with what we're doing? Yeah, it's good. It's good. Yep. So if we look at the top left-hand picture where you'll see the coronal view, three-dimensional view of the femur, so we have chosen a size 5 femoral component. If you take the component off the bone, we'll remove the green virtual component, you now are getting an impression of what your virtual femoral resections are going to look like. So I can tell two weeks before my surgery what my grand piano sign is going to look like because you can plan that off your preoperative CT scan. So if I go for a size five femur, that is going to be my resected bone appearance. If I drop to a size four femur to simulate what that would look like, you will see now that it will notch considerably. So ordinarily we would say, right, that is not ideal. But if we alter the distal femoral flexion angle, if I flex my femoral component, I can change my distal resections. And you'll see now, if you look in the top right-hand picture, you'll see that there is flexion two degrees and there is an anti-clockwise arrow. So if you watch top right picture and top left picture simultaneously, you'll see that as I add more flexion to the femoral component from two degrees to three to four, to five, my grand piano sign now is more acceptable if we take the component off again. And so many surgeons would say, I like that appearance more than the first appearance I had. And this is the beauty of, of this is how it is on the table for us to adjust our resections or, or alter our components because we can see real time what the cuts are going to look like before we do the cut. So you get That's pre resection right. information. Yep. Just a question, and obviously when you want to get on with the surgery, don't let us interfere yep. with that. But yep. uh, two things. One is what do you accept on standard for flexion of the femoral component? And two, how much time do you spend preoperatively uh, doing the planning as opposed to accepting the default? Yep. So most uh, males are between sort of one and, and three degrees of, of flexion usually, depending on how, how broad they are front to back, and women probably between three and five. But I'm happy to flex them up to six, even seven degrees if that avoids overhang and if I still get acceptable, uh, you know, anterior coverage. What's cool, with, if, sorry to use that term, but if we put the component on and go to 2D, if you look at the top right-hand picture, we're going to scroll now in two dimensions through the femur. So we're, we're looking at the medial femoral condyle on the top right picture, and we are scrolling across the femur 
Now we're looking at the trochlea, and now we're into the lateral condyle. So you can get a determination now, not just of what your condyles are going to look like, but for the first time ever, you can actually see what your trochlea is doing. So if we come back to the mid trochlear view, so that view right now, top right picture, you can see the green of my prosthetic trochlea surface, and you can see the pink of the original bony surface. So for the first time, you get three-dimensional image three-dimensional information on the depth of your trochlear resection and whether you are actually under-resecting your, your patellofemoral joint, you know, and overstuffing it, or whether you're actually over-resecting it and weakening your quite extensive mixing. So when I'm sizing a femur, I don't just take into account the breadth, the width of the component like you do with conventional sizing, but I'm now taking information on the trochlear position, whether we resurface the trochlear or not. So I'm going to get going if that's okay. Yeah, Excellent. that's cool. But Excellent. how much time does it take? Yeah, I reckon it takes three minutes or four minutes to review a plan. If, you're, um, if your MAKO technician has already had a look at the plan and they know your preferences, literally I reckon it's it's less than five minutes of quick look. Before. So I will see my next case before I do – I'll just look between cases. It doesn't yep. take very long. Okay. So we're going to put some pins in now, guys. So Good. We'll have got, a look at have a look yep. at that. Picture and also I want to introduce Professor Yong In from uh, South Korea, who's just joined us on the moderating panel as well. Welcome, Yong In. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Yong In. So hi. hi guys, hi Prof, how are you going? So we're going to put some pin, pins in the tibia and pins in the femur. So my, my the tibial pins I'm putting through stab incisions. My assistant's just placing a stabilising guide. I'm using 3.2 millimetre pins, so they are a little narrower. They have a little more flex but they also are smaller in the bone and they have a lower risk of fracture. So I think, you know, a, a, a diaphyseal fracture is an unforgivable complication of navigation. Therefore, the smaller the pin, the better. So I'm going to pre-drill the bone so that – I'm going to pre-drill the bone so that it's – so you can see that okay? Yeah, we're so, seeing very, very clear and the resolution is very good. So I'm just pre-drilling. you yep. is uh, obviously – is this specific to Mako that you've got to have the pins away or is this your choice to have the pins away from the incision? My choice, yeah. Okay. Yep. So the the proximity to the, uh, the joint surface means you're more likely to encroach on the, the trajectory of the robotic saw. So if you do a, a hand-navigated um, technique, you know, if you're using just computer nav, not robotics, you can alter where you hold the saw. When you're doing robotics, it's the robot that brings the saw in. So the robot will not change its uh, preferred position, yeah? So we're going to put some dia some femoral pins in now. So I'm going to put dia – so I had diaphyseal tibial pins. So I'm going to do the reverse in the femur. I'm going to put some, some pins through the incision in the distal femoral metaphysis here. So we're changing the orientation. So you may my arm may be in the way, but I'm coming right, through right. the medial side. We're here, sitting very nicely. Yeah, very in the nice. supracondylar region. And I'm going to bring them low. So they're, they're, they're sort, of, sort of 80, 85, 90 degrees to the vertical so that they're crossing the femur and they're not going to hit my neurovascular bundle. How proximal they are, Depends a little bit on whether I'm going to do a PS knee or a CR knee. If I think I'm going to cut a box, then I need those pins to be a little more proximal. We're now going to put navigation arrays, so trackers on those pins. So these are just the same as any navigation system. These are passive rather than active. So, so your, yep. your approach, um, Dermot, because you've already done the approach, how much, I mean, this is a various sneeze you've indicated, not severe, but how much releases have you done in the approach, particularly Good. in the yep. medial side there? Good. So I've, I've done exposure rather than release. So I, I, I'm clarifying that because I think all of us, when we're doing an exposure, we add a bit of release in. If we think we're going to need it at the end of the case, we'll add that in the beginning. Whereas for the, the robotic cases, and if I'm doing an anatomic plan, a kinematic sort of plan, then I'm not necessarily trying to get that leg back to neutral you know a constitutional errors knee to get it to neutral is hard work as you all know so i'm not coming all the way around the medial side in anticipation of doing a release so i'll do a modest exposure of that top joint line sort of enough to get the osteophytes but not enough to do a release yeah does that make sense to you yep all right so have we checked everything guys yeah so i'm just gonna so now we're going to register 
the centre of rotation of the femoral head. So just like with any nav system, now I'm now, now going to circumduct the femur to get centre of head as it's predicted. Then I'm now going to register the malleoli, the medial and lateral malleolus. Just rotate me out a bit. So these are just correlating my bony landmarks to my computer registered landmarks. So there's a checkpoint I've already placed in the femur and a checkpoint in the tibia. Are these checkpoints? Are just secondary references. Are they just screws you put in or? Yeah, they're small screws. Have you got a spare checkpoint? So I'll show you. But so, we, so we've now registered the anatomic landmarks of femoral head and malleolus. Now we're going to surface map the femur. So if you're using a conventional navigation technique, we would surface map the articular cartilage surface. MAKO is registered off CT scan, so it's registered off the bone, not the articular surface. So I'm actually going to register the subchondral bone. So I have a navigation probe here that is sharp that will punch through cartilage to register on the bone surface. So in the screen, you can see the 3D model from MAKO, and there are 40 points distributed across the distal femur, which are I'm going to give 40 points to the computer for it to make a 3D model of my anatomy and it will morph that to the 3D model of the patient's CT and match the two. So I'm going to register 40 points now around the femur. So I'm punching through synovium. So you don't need to curate away cartilage on the surface. You just punch no. through it with a spike. Yep. So this is this is sharp enough to go through my um, my drape. So you've got to be careful with it. But yes, this is a very sharp point, and I'm going through cartilage easily. And you feel the the resistance of the bone. And the greater, you follow the, a, yep, the greater you the spread of those forty more, points, um, the more accurate we are. Yep. Are the forty points can they be anywhere, or are you following but, a specific pattern? No, they're giving you areas where it wants to go but I can actually put them wherever I want. But the greater the distribution, the wider the area of distribution, the more precise the 3D match I'll achieve to be more accurate. So I'm taking some from in the notch. For this gentleman, they may be actually not as accurate as some because he's got very large overhanging notch osteophytes, which may be hard to, for me to get across here. So I've registered 40 points now. So the green dots say I'm within 0.5 of a mil of what the CT scan says I should be. So that's very accurate. The yellow dots are between 0.5 and 1. So that's the error of my I'm just that's the error of my um, the precision of me the, punching through bone. What we'll you're doing here dinner. is is validating the bone morph model from the BT scan Correct. Is that right? I, I, yeah. I've given the I've given the cat the computer 40 points and it matched the two. It's giving me five points to, to correlate. And so that's just a secondary check now. So I'm going to the tibia now and I'm going to do the same on the tibia. I'm going to use the same sharp probe and take 40 points on the tibial surface. If you put all 40 points within a centimetre, you will be very precise with that model for one part of the model, but you could be skewed in different directions. And so the greater the spread, the less opportunity there is for the model to be inaccurate. So that's why we'll spread these 40 points as widely as I can on the accessible bone surfaces. And because it's a sharp probe, I can actually punch through the medial soft tissue sleeve, which I'm going to do now. So I'm actually now going through the medial retinaculum and the, the medial sleeve to get to subchondral bone. That's the beauty of being of having the sharp probe. So I'm now registering the tubercle. And it'll now give me my, my precision there. So lots of green. Which, is, which means I'm accurate, and then I just need to take a couple of points to validate it, and I'm happy to move on. Okay, let's move on now, guys. So we have matched my, my anatomy to the CT model in the computer. So what you're seeing now is real-time matching now. So as my knee moves, 
we have split screen. As my knee moves, you'll see my model move. So my model there is moving. So you're now seeing a virtual surgical case, yeah? So my knee is moving and my model is moving on the 3D model. So we can now get a real projection of how the femur and the tibia will relate to each other. And as you can see, this gentleman's tibia is laterally subluxed, yeah, from his arthritis. Mm -hmm. So I'm, the next step I'm going to do is to establish what his soft tissue laxities and tensions are and try to recreate what his normal soft tissue tensions are. He has quite a number of osteophytes, which I'm going to remove because the osteophytes... So before, take... before you remove them, um, Dermot, yep. what's yep. his preoperative um, hip knee angle yep. um, so, and overall alignment? Yeah, yeah, but I'm, if I take the, the osteophytes off, but that's him resting now. Put all, So... So if, if I don't do anything now, this yeah. is how he looks on the table. So he has so he has a 19 millimeter lateral gap. So that means right now the distance between my projected cut surfaces will be a 19 millimeter gap. So a 19 millimeters for a triathlon knee is a nine millimeter poly with an 8.5 millimeter um, femoral component. So I need I need 17.5 or 80 millimetres to fit everything in, and I want a millimetre replaced. So I need 90 millimetre gap. Yeah. On the medial side, you can see he's lying in significant varus, yeah, because on the, the the numbers on the top right say yeah. that he's at nine degrees of flexion and he's got eight degrees or nine degrees of varus. So yeah. that's his resting hip-knee ankle alignment as it is now. So I'm going to put a stress view on. So if I do a valve of stress now, if I push as hard as I can, I can open his medial side up to 19 and his limb varus goes from nine varus, middle numbers on the right-hand side of your screen. So he's 10 varus there. With a valve of stress, I can get him to one varus. So he doesn't correct to neutral. So this gentleman is either constitutionally varus or he has contracted medial soft tissue structures. But he's also got osteophytes that may still be tending him because you've not let me remove them, Rami. Yeah. So when I do, we may get another millimetre and another degree of varus, yeah? But if I do nothing, I can open his medial side to 19 now and his yep. lateral side I can open to 9.5 or 20. So his soft tissue sleeve is not too bad because I can stretch him and get it. So our plan is actually going to be pretty accurate for this gentleman, yeah? Yep. Then if we bend him to 90, that's him at 90. And again, the lateral number is 18. So if I do nothing, I can fit 18 millimetres between the cut surfaces. But look at his medial side. Yeah, 12 millimetres medially. And I bet you that medial flexion number is not going to open up as much as the, the medial extension number did. So at 90 degrees, I'm now going to do the same valgus stress test here. And I can turn 12 degrees into 18. That's me pushing as pulling as hard as I can. So a maximal valgus stress at 90 degrees, I can get 18 millimetres in. So he almost balances. Yep. Now I'm doing a varus test and he's 19 millimetres on the lateral side when I do a varus test. So I can almost get balance gaps with him without doing any adjustment of my plan. So that's fortuitous, but let's take the osteophytes out and just check that. So if you want to talk for a little while, I'll clean up my osteophytes. If it's, that's yep. okay, Ram. Yep. You can fire questions while I do that, yeah? So we notice uh, that the knee's not bleeding at all, so you've got very good anaesthesia there and it's very hypertensive. It's, it's, it's not. It's I've got <laughs> terrible anaesthesia. I've just got a tourniquet on, yeah? Okay. So, um, Yong-In, maybe you want to comment, use of tourniquet. Uh, I know we talk about it every now and then, but, um, you know, your your approach and Juan He, your approach uh, in your practices. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm Yong-In. Uh, uh, thank you very much for this uh, operation. So you do the maximal vagus stress test in uh, extension and flexion, yep. and uh, you are balancing for the medial uh, tightness is already done, or you need to do the medial balancing after uh, pong cut? Yes, I'm going to do. Um, I'm hoping. I think this is a philosophy. We haven't actually talked about what I've planned, so we'll, we can do that before we we do the next step. But my, um, I'm. No longer doing neutral mechanical alignment. I am doing const constitutional kinematic sort of planning. So I'm, I've am i placed his tibial component in a couple of degrees of varus because he looks to be anatomically varus, as most males are. And if I had not put his tibia in 2.5 2 degrees of varus, then he would be quite tight on the medial side. 
And if you wanted to do neutral mechanical alignment for this patient, you would have to do a medial release. Okay. We can simulate that. What's cool is we can simulate that. So I've, I've removed most of his osteophytes from the medial tibia. I've removed most of them from the medial femur that, I can, that are accessible. He still has some posterior osteophytes. You can see it on that MAKO model. If we split the screen and see it on the MAKO model, there are some osteophytes up behind the, the on that lateral view of the model. You can see there's osteophytes at the back of the femur. So they may be giving us a little bit of tension of the posterior capsule, but if I'm honest, that won't affect things too much at all. So I've removed the osteophytes. So and this is now what I'm going to do for real now. I'm going to reassess the, his alignment. On the screen, you can see four – just take that off. Just go to single screen for a moment. You can see four numbers at the bottom of the screen. There's an L and an M, so it's lateral, there's medial, and there's extension and there's flexion. And I'm going to fill those boxes with the gaps I create. So I'm going to do a maximal stress test now to establish what my maximal medial gap will be. So I'm doing a Valga stress test, and my maximal medial number is 19, and I can get to one degree of varus. So I'm going to put 19 in the bottom, in the top right numbers, that's that box. On the lateral side, I can get to 20. So I've got 20 degree, 20 millimetre gap and 11 degrees of varus there. And I've got 9 millimetre gap and zero varus there. So those numbers we're going to record. And I'm going to populate that box in the bottom right corner. Because when I want to change my components to balance my gaps without doing any surgery, without doing any soft tissue release, I'm going to use those numbers. So I've now got the knee at 90. And I'm doing the same. I'm doing my real Valga stress test now. So I can get to 18 with two of Vera. So that's my maximal medial gap. And I can get to 19 and 12 degrees of Vera on the lateral side. So four numbers that I'm now going to put in the bottom. So what are the numbers I want, guys? 18 and 19. So do you enter those numbers yourself or is it automatic? So, um, so this Someone. is a good this is a good criticism of Striker, yeah. That the software isn't quite perfect for this part of it yet. We copied this the software off the um, yeah. We copied the software. I'm getting told I'm running behind by five minutes. So, no, you're but, okay. Yeah. You're okay. You're doing well. Uh, it wasn't a criticism. It was just no. A I know. I know. Really, no, so. it's, me, it's me telling them it's a criticism. Okay. It's 18 guys. Is that what I'm tasting? I want 18. So what I'm trying to do is to Stretch just internally rotate me, that'll give me more. So, yeah, I'm just struggling a tiny bit here to get my 18 on the bottom. But, but yeah, somebody remembers the gaps. But if I can record them here, if I can trick the knee to give me 18, so just call it 17, and I'll remember that. So, 17 medial and 19 lateral was right, wasn't it? Yep. And then in extension here, okay, in extension. I want 19 and 20 in extension, yeah? So cool. just a question, Dermot. I mean, yep. you've planned a two-degree varus cut. Yeah, uh, 2.5. So that's is a, that making you a bit tighter, do you think? In... Might make so. This is what I'm – so my numbers, just so I'm just – so i got 19 there and 20. I'm just checking my numbers. And I've got, yeah, 18 and 19 there. So, yeah. So I have – so if we look at those two numbers on the bottom right corner there, yeah, I have a tight medial side. So my medial extension number is 19, which is one millimetre tighter than my extension number. So I need to release the medial ligament or I need to cut more there in the tibia. And on the flexion numbers, I have 17 or 18 there on the medial flex number and 19 on the lateral flex number. So, again, I have a tight medial ligament. I need to release the medial ligament or I can cut one degree more varus on the tibia and I think with one or one and a half degrees of varus on the tibia, I'm going to make my medial numbers 20 and 19 and that will be almost balanced. And then my flexion numbers, if you see, are tighter than my extension numbers. You okay with that, Rami? Yeah, yeah I can hear you. So I have a slightly tight flexion gap. If I anteriorize my femur one millimeter, I will I will equalize those gaps. So I am now going to do pre-resection balancing. So I am going to balance the knee, not with soft tissue releases in 10 minutes time. I'm going to balance the knee now before I make my cuts. Yep. So I am going to put one degree more varus in the tibia. So you can see on the, the cursor there is on the medial 
it's on the, the lateral plateau of that box. That's where the pink dot on the tibia would have been, my, my measured resection dot. And I'm going to take three degrees and make it four degrees with the expectation my numbers will jump up. So if you look at the numbers again, we'll go back. So I've got 2020 on the top there. Are people happy with that? Yep. Yep. And so now if we go back to three degrees, undo that. Good. Now we're back to 19. If I put the degree various back in, I'm 20 again. So I have achieved a balanced extension gap with no soft tissue release, but just with a minor modification of my tibial varus. And now on the tibia, I'm slightly tight in flexion. So I'm going to anteriorize my femur one. So if I move my femur anterior one, my bottom line jumps up. So I have 20, 20, 20, 19 now. So I am half a mil tighter on the medial flexion numbers. And I'm going to redo my gaps again. So just go to gaps, take the cuts off. So I'm going to, now that I've moved my tibia and my femur to balance my gaps, I want to see if I'm balanced. So I'm going to once again do a extension valgus stress and my medial number is 20. Yep. I'm going to do a varus twist. My lateral number is 20. I'm at 90 degrees. I'm going to do a valgus stress and I'm at 20. And I'm going to do a various stress and I'm at 20. So I have 20 millimeter gaps in all four gaps. So I have a balanced knee now if I go forward with this plan, which is my intention. Let's just look at that anatomy because I have modified that three dimensional plan we made. So I'm going to go back now before I commit, I have the opportunity now to reassess whether I like that picture or not. And if you look at the top left picture, if we take the component off, yeah, that grand piano sign looks a little small for me. Yeah, I'm not re – you know, some of my medial femoral flange will be not contacting the bone. So I might actually now downsize my femur one, and instead of having a five, I'm going to have a four, and I'm going to flex it like we talked about before. So flex it to four degrees. And, and I think that now, if we take the component off, that now looks like a nicer grand piano sign. So I'm, I'm happy with that. And if we look at the middle picture at the top and go to two dimension, yeah, and if we scroll up and down, if you watch now, you're seeing whether that medial component is, is overhang, whether that femoral component is too big or too small. And it actually looks pretty good. Looks okay. So I'm pretty happy with that. So I have modified my plan. I have downsized my femur. I've anteriorized my femur, and I've put more varus in the tibia. So all of that is pre-resection balancing. And I think if I go forward with this modified plan, I will probably have 20 millimeter or 21 millimeter gaps on on all four, you know, uh, gaps without having to do any soft tissue release. Do you aim to get a slightly increased flexion space to your extension space? No, I don't. It depends what my. So this gentleman doesn't hyperextend. Yeah. So his he, he was. Let's have a look, guys, quickly. He's four or five, I think. Or what? What? He, or not, he was nine or something like that. Yeah. So he's seven flexion. So he's not hyperextending. So I reckon if we go ahead now, he will end up with completely balanced gaps. And I want my medial flexion gap to be the tightest gap of all. I want a snug medial side. That's normal for the knee. The lateral flexion gap is looser than the medial flexion gap, and a snug medial side is, I think, you know, kinematic and physiologic. Yeah. So that's that's my thinking. But if we go to the the plan. If we go back to the anatomy, if we plan this gentleman to be a, a mechanically neutral plan, then my tibia would be zero degrees and he would be three millimetres tighter on the medial side. But by cutting three and a half degrees of varus on the tibia, I have loosened my medial flexion and my medial extension gap and I have avoided the need for a soft tissue release and I'm still within you know, quite an acceptable hip knee ankle alignment. His, his planned limb alignment is only three degrees of varus, which you know it's constitutional. Yeah, that's that's what what's I'm the limit of what you'll take it to with respect to tibial varus? Uh, okay, so it depends on the weight of the patient, the age of the patient, the bone quality. I, I'm just going to, as I go off questions, I'm going to go to the next stage. Right, just give one sec. You going. guys talk for a sec. So okay. let's go. We're going to go with that plan. Yeah. So we we, we execute the plan. So I'm going to bring the robot in now, and we're going to execute that plan. Hey, you can keep talking in the background if you want. Young in, can I ask you um, your approach to alignment, uh, mechanical, kinematic, inverse kinematic, restricted kinematics? What do you do? We're talking. You'll see the robot now coming into the screen. We're bringing the robot into from the my side of the patient. 
Yeah. Can you see that there, Army? Yeah. Absolutely. We so can the see robot's that. moving in, and we just position the robot so it's in the best position to execute the cuts, and then we'll talk about that. Have so, you done any pre-registration with a robotic arm, or is this it? This yeah, that's is, all been done before, yeah. Oh, that's so, been done. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. What sort of time point. does that take, just so we all yeah, know? It, it, it happens between going out to scrub and coming back in. Right. So i just got to give some direction here. Come out your miles south. Andrew, can you, you move the patient right, your way? Can you sh- no, no, don't move. Uh, the, Andrew, don't move the patient. Move you, because otherwise the cameras are all out. It's come you distal, distal, the distal, the distal, 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 distal. Grand piano sign, but... Uh, it looks like the, the femoral uh, component ML size is uh, narrower than uh, patient uh, femoral size. So, how yep. about the ML size of femoral component? Yeah, well, I think I think I think yeah, I can live with that. I think it's it always a like, compromise. It's like narrow because you downside the femoral size. Good. Well, why don't we go back to the plan? We can. Design, but let's go back to the plan. Yeah, ML I, size I th- looks like a uh, slightly narrower. Yeah, so if we go 2D, go 2D. So, yeah, let's look at the middle picture here. So if we scroll down now, so the top middle picture is showing you that, so I, that's, to me that's only a millimetre and a half inside the medial cortex and maybe mm-hmm. one millimetre inside the lateral cortex. So I think no matter where you put your prosthetic components, you're compromising your joint line or you're compromising your trochlea or you're compromising your bone contact or you're compromising width. I think of all components the, the width of the component has least bearing on the outcome because it's a prosthetic design it's not an anatomic so i don't think there's any downside to being a little mm-hmm. narrow okay. so we're going to but yep you go on dermot we yeah, yeah, well, yep, in the background yep. okay that's good so that's cool. going in just to that question yeah. do you think there is a problem having a ml width that's not quite matching the patient anatomy when the ap yeah. width really is critical to balance does yeah, it worry you uh there is no evidence but uh uh, in my practice, I try to match the AP and ML size of mm. uh, uh, patients, uh, if possible. But mm. uh, by uh, downsizing the femur to get enough anterior uh, surface, it looks like a, a narrower than the, the real fem- femoral size. But uh, I'm trying to match the ML size also. And okay. uh, I, I, I agree with that. Yeah, guys, I'm just going to keep going. But that's, well, we, I'm going to make a noise soon. So I'm going to show you now. That, so we have... A pre-operative plan that we've modified, and we've we've modified the plan to achieve pre-resection balancing. So now I'm going to execute that plan. I brought the robot close. So this is the cool thing about the robotics: is I have planned a femoral resection, and the robot will give me the precision, you know, within sort of half a degree and half a mil of the the plane of the cuts I want for the femur and the tibia. So it achieves this by so that the, the robot has a, it has a zone of control over the saw blade. And if you look at the screen, the Mako screen, the Mako screen, just magnify up the Mako screen. So the Mako screen, you can't see the saw at the moment. I'm going to bring the saw into view. So the saw is the blue saw. Can you see it moving at the top? We can see so, it. So there's a yellow box around the femur. So that is the zone of stereotactic recognition between the, the robot and the saw, or between the computer and the, the saw, yeah? So if the saw is moved outside that yellow zone, it disappears. So the robot will not control my saw at the moment. If I turn it on, nothing happens. Mm-hmm. If I move the, ro- the saw into within that zone of stereotactic control, now the robot will actively align my saw blade to the plane of resection. So I'm going to turn the saw on now. You'll see on the you'll see my saw move to execute the plane of resection of the distal femur. So I'm resecting the distal femur. I'm going to show you that sideways on. So that's the side view. The green line you see is the line the plane of the saw blade and the blue is the saw blade itself. So my saw is, is aligned to the haptic plane for the resection. And my, once the robot's got control of this, I cannot move it outside that line. I'm pushing, and the robot will not let me move that saw blade. So I'm going to execute a cut now on the lateral distal condyle. Yeah, so go to the other view. Go to the... So you're seeing the saw moving... So 
Clear. He's got quite sclerotic bone, so I'm just getting a little bit of sclerotic bone off the end of the saw blade. You guys seeing that okay, Rami? Brilliant. Yep. When you're using that, do you feel yep. like you're controlling or is it moving? Can you – you no, it won't move at all. No, right. it's got no resistance in the plane, yeah. So the harder I push it, the more likely you'll try to push it out of the haptic plane. So – so it's it's the lighter you are with it, the more efficient the cutting is paradoxically, yeah. So that's my distal femoral resection there. So we'll check that cut. Andrew, can we just move that picture in picture up to the top right hand side, please? So it's um, away from the operative field. Which one that? So is that me, my one? No, no, yeah. no. I'm just talking to the uh, okay. TV guys. So I'm going to go on to the next cut now. Yeah. I'm just going to clean the saw blade. Yep. Yeah. So we're going to go on the, the posterior condyle resection. So there's two saw blades you may notice here. There's, this saw is 90 degree saw, and then there's a conventional saw as well. All of the cuts are at different planes. So there's two different saw, hand, saw attachments. So, Yong In, while he's doing that, and Chuani, um, do you want to comment? Do you guys do standard mechanical alignment? Do you do kinematic alignment? What's your approach to uh, restoring biomechanics and knee replacement? Yeah, uh, I still use a mechanical alignment uh, principle. Because uh, as we know, the, the kinematic alignment concept is very nice, but uh, we have many deformed patients. So uh, trying to uh, keep the uh, patient original alignment is not, not that much uh, ideal. And also, uh, we can make uh, a ferrous alignment. Uh, so sometimes, so uh, I'm trying to uh, keep the mechanical alignment uh, uh, still out. I, I don't do the kinematic alignment yep. principle. Okay. Shwani, can we keep the surgery in the center speaker view, please, uh, Andrew? Thank you. Shwani, do you um, follow mechanical alignment for your knee or are you kinematic alignment? You're on mute. Uh, in a severe... Oh, okay. okay. Sorry. I agree with uh, agree with um, uh, Dr. Yang. Um, I try to keep the mechanical alignment. Um, I maybe a ninety degree cut on the tib uh, the tibial side and um, expand the se severe virus or vacuous knee. I will lift a little bit uh, one degree or two degree virus uh, on the, the femur. Uh, so I try to keep the mechanical diamond. Mm -hmm. So anterior cut. So again, you see the haptic control now. So the blade's where it was for the posterior cut. Now that the robot's going to take control of that and align the, the saw to the anterior cut, anterior flange cut. This is the only comment maybe about intra incisional pins, Rami, is that your pins can encroach on the haptic of this cut, but you've got to place your pins out of the plane of your femoral resections, yeah? Yep. You know, that's intuitive, but, you know, you put your pin in before you modify your plan, so you've got to allow for where you think your plan will be. But again, you see that picture of the, the saw is wrong, the saw is brought, the robot is bringing it into the plane, and the robot will not let me now deviate from that plane. Uh, 
Right. Yeah. Keep talking, Rami. I can hear. Yeah, I was just thinking. Um, you know, you're making the five cuts um, consecutively here, right from the start. Um, do you stop and validate at any point? Do you look at your extension gap? Do you reassess your flexion gap at any stage, or you just once yep, you've made that in, yep. initial so, uh, decision, you go for it? Well, to, to, that's the whole real, you know, beauty of previous action balancing is. So indirectly, you're asking how how, how accurate is the predicted gaps, and yep. does your predict are your predicted gaps delivered at the end of the case? Yeah, is what yep. you're sort of asking. Yeah, correct. And so in a normal knee, as in a standard knee, you know, a knee from Australia, not a, a real knee from you know other countries sure. where they have real deformity, then I'd argue, yeah, ninety. Five percent of the time, we will not need to do a secondary cut. The only time that your pre-resection balancing may be inaccurate is if you have very bad fixed flexion deformity or enormous posterior osteophytes or a very limited range of motion. They're the only times that you may want to do a preliminary tibial cut, as you sort of imply, and just make sure that you're not, you know, you've got accurate. So I'm, I've just got a little bit of a high spot there. Just come, I'm going to come across here. So. Um, so the delivered gaps are pretty good, yeah. So I've not. It's rare that I will need to go back and do a secondary cut. Yep. And yeah, so that's that's the precision. That's pretty good now. So it's point one deep. It's point one valid. So that's the precision. Pretty good there, guys. Yeah. So I'm going to do those osteophytes, posterior osteophytes. How are we going time wise, Scott? Uh, you're still okay here. So you're validating yep. each surface or just one of the surfaces and that carries across? No, no it, it does not carry across. It's a good question. So I validated distal, I validated flange. I don't mind if my anterior so, – so I validated distal, I validated anterior chamfer. I have not validated the anterior flange only because I don't mind if that's a bit proud because it will give me enhanced press fit for a, for a press fit femur. Whereas the distal cut, I want to make sure I'm not proud because if the distal cut's proud, the component will sit off and you won't have bony contact on your chamfer cut, yeah? Yep. And I'll validate the tibia, yeah? So my fem my, I'm happy with my femoral preparation. Yep, you okay with that? You happy we move on to the tibia? Yeah, we're yep. cool. Okay. So we're going to do tibia now, guys. Please. Yeah. I have one question. Yes, please. Yeah, so you just uh, push your saw to the bone. How, what, what's the feeling you like? You feel? Well, you got to come down and visit, and then we'll get to have a feel. So it, it's the same feel as cutting soft bone with a normal saw. You know that feeling where it glides through the bone. Whereas if you're cutting sclerotic bone, we tend to push hard on our saw, and you get that bouncing sort of feeling, and that's when we get blade skive. So the robot won't let you skive, and the harder you push, the more you'll fight. That. So less pressure on this blade than anything else, but but it cuts quite normally. You will find that there's no difference in the feel. It's very similar to a normal saw cut, yeah, cutting in softer bone, yep. So I'm yeah. now going to go to the tibia, yeah. So we've got to check. We're validating the, the, the blade tip. Hang on, I may just – yeah. I have a question. Yes, please. Um, in severe, severe uh, cases, you only – uh, some huge in osteophytes on yes, the yes, posterior, yep, uh, yep. posterior nofemur condyle. Yes, yep. Um, after you cut the posterior condyle, you, you, if you, you feel a little bit loose than, than you're planning, how yes. do you do that? So, so, yes, good. So sometimes in those, you know, what I would call, a, you know, bad knees, we may have to use a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, guesswork or experience to say, okay, I think the medial gap is still tight because of the inaccessible osteophytes, and therefore I will intentionally allow the medial side to be one or one and a half millimetres tighter, knowing that when I clear those posterior medial corner osteophytes, when I clear that posterior femoral osteophyte, I will gain another half a mil or a mil. I think that's, you know, surgical experience as we all have. Uh, and, and, yeah, I think so certainly, yes, I will accept a little bit of residual medial tightness, knowing that when I clear the posterior medial corner of osteophytes, I'll gain some medial soft tissue, you know, looseness. We okay with that? So I'm going to do a tibial cut now. So the saw is 45 degrees to the plane of my tibial cut. So when I use the robot now, the robot's, you know, the, the saw is inside the control of the robot. So when I, the, the saw is now rotating to the plane of the tibial cut. Yeah, everyone's happy with that. I'm outside plane. 
So the robot is doing that, not me. Now I'm pushing. I can advance the saw. I cannot move it north or south. I cannot rotate it, yeah? So the haptic plane of control is very tight. So I'm going to execute the tibial cut. So I'm cutting 20 millimetre gaps on this patient. So 20 millimetre is usually a 10 millimetre poly or maybe an 11 millimetre poly. So I could raise this gentleman's tibia one mil and cut a 19 millimetre gap, but I don't mind if I put 10, 11 or 12 mil poly in. I think that's all the same. So I'm going to cut the tibia now. So, so Dermot, eye. are you watching the screen as you cut? Yep, I am. Feedback, or are you watching the saw and the patient I'm doing, getting the I'm feel doing of both. it? I'm doing right. both. I'm doing both. But, yeah, I've got an assistant, an experienced surgical assistant with me, Craig Pickering, and we, our rule is both of us can't be watching the screen at the same time. So someone mm. has to watch the soft tissue because now I'm cutting the lateral tibial plateau. Yep. My saw blade is against the edge of the, me the medial edge of the patella tendon. So if I'm not careful, in theory, I could move my saw across that haptic zone yeah. into the tendon, yeah? So Craig's keeping an eye on the medial soft tissue sleeve when I'm doing the medial plateau. He's keeping an eye on the patella tendon, and he gives me a nudge. If he's awake, he gives me a nudge to, uh, to be careful of the patella tendon. But being honest, that haptic zone of entry, so I'm wiggling my saw across this corridor of entry, that stops me hitting the patella tendon, and my medial sleeve over this side is I'm, I'm inside my medial sleeve when I do that. So I'm pretty yep. confident once I've entered the bone that I will not encroach on soft tissue. Yeah? Now, obviously, um, the robot can't see the patella tendon or extensor mechanism, so that's your input. Yep. Um, but I also know because of the robot, when I mean, your assistants are away from the table, you're holding a retractor with one hand and you've got the saw on the other. Yep. Um, obviously, there's a limit to bringing them in because of the need to communicate with your camera. No, it's not. My assistant's pretty much in the stand. So if we pan out, get my assistant's standing where your assistant stands, yeah? So Craig is on the um, – so Craig's just standing at the bottom of the patient. Now just walk to the top of the patient, Craig. You'll cross over. Yeah, so that's Craig standing at the yep. foot end of the table, but he's standing in the normal position as you would if you're navigating. My scrub yep. nurse in the normal position, yeah? So sure. I'm getting told I'm 14 minutes behind, Rami, so you're killing that's me. That's right. You've got um, right. 25 minutes. I'm sure right. you'll get that's it done cool. by then. All right. So we've, we've executed the tibial cut. I'm going to now remove the, the tibial cut bone surface. Question from the audience from Muhammad. That is, when it comes down to it, you make the cuts and you extend. Um, do you go for balance, to get your balancing and alignment, do you adjust your bone cuts and go back cut more or do you do ligament releases at that stage? Good. So if, if we have a, if I have, if my executed cuts give me poor gap balance, I have the option of doing both. And it depends really on the knee or it depends on how much I have am prepared to move my components to adjust that, yeah? So there's no knee that you can't do soft tissue release on yeah. and there's nothing wrong with doing soft tissue release. But you, if you're releasing normal tissue, I think that's unnecessary. And if you're releasing medial ligament because the patient is constitutionally varus and you're trying to bring that patient to being neutral and they have never been neutral in their whole life, you're releasing a normal structure. And if you've got a tight posteromedial corner, then the commonest solution to that is either a major medial release or a PCL release. And so the reason most surgeons doing PCL releases is because it's easy to balance the knee. Mm. And you know, Aaron Malaji is a friend of mine. Aaron was with me on the on the one of these meetings this morning, and you know he sees knees that are far more deformed than I do. So his need to do you know PCL resection and balance with PCL resection is greater than mine. But I would argue that in USA. Britain and Australia, we are taking out a lot of normal looking PCLs just because we are not. Uh, so, what you're telling me is you predominantly um, see us in inserts, or I'm assuming? Yeah, yeah. So, I think the beauty of this is, yeah, that you can, you don't need to take the cruciate. If you've got a normal cruciate, I'm trying to keep that normal yep. cruciate if I'm Good. trying to have a kinematic knee, for sure. Yeah. Young in. CRPS, constrained, medial pivot. Uh, I have no experience with a medial pivot knee. 
You have no experience? Yeah, no so experience. You do CR or PS? Uh, I prefer PS. So you can uh, have some experience in uh, um, uh, ultra congruent polyethylene. Mm -hmm. I have no experience with the major people uh, system. Okay. Shwani, uh, I do PS and uh, mid pivot. Well, I'm, intri I'm intrigued by medial pivot in the sense that I think it is good to have a medial, you know, to have medial, um, you know, the normal need yes. is that medial condyle stays in its place till 100, 110 degrees and then starts rolling back at 100, 110. So in a artificial need to replicate that is, uh, is we think, you know, desirable. It's not always achievable. So the medial pivot philosophy, therefore, is to constrain the medial side through zero to sort of 100 and then let it roll up the, the, the posterior lip after 100, 110. So I think that is a, an attractive concept, but I don't know whether prosthesis alone will guarantee that every time. And a, a, a snug medial gap with an intact PCL, I, I think probably is better than, you know, a mechanically aligned knee with PCL release, MCL release, and a little bit of looseness on the medial side, yeah? So, you know, I'm intrigued by medial pivot, does, you know, philosophy or medial constraint. And, I, you know, to be honest, I think it is, you know, an option. These are, option. Um, sorry to interrupt you. So they're your medial and post-remedial osteophytes to remove? Yeah, them. yeah, that's right. But I'm not stripping down the bone. I'm, I'm trying to stay above the, the sort of the, the ligaments, yeah, and just sneak, just take the bone, yeah? Right. So we'll show you a bit of PCL here. So the beauty of your controlled tibial resection, your haptic zone, is that you don't encroach on the origin yep. of the PCL, yeah? So I don't know if you guys can see that, but... We can see very clearly. It looks Yeah, yeah. Good. So, I mean, it's it's not the best PCL, you could argue mm. that, because yep. it's actually all intact, yeah? And yep. I've got bone around. So I'm happy with that. I'm going to check my tibial resection now for precision, and then we're going to go and mark the femur. We're, we're happy to rock and roll off. So my tibial cut there on the screen, so top right, not so we got make a screen. Yeah. So the top right says I'm within 0.2 of a millimeter of my ideal cut, and I'm dead on for varus valgus. So that is a pretty precise cut. I'm pretty happy what, with that. That's what better than slope not. are you aiming for in the tibia, considering Good. you're using a CR insert? What yep, are you aiming yep. for? So I'll look at the patient's anatomic slope. Sometimes it's hard to tell that, especially on the deformed knee. So this gentleman had a very badly deformed medial side. So I'm just going to bang my femur on while I'm talking. But, yeah, we'll look at the slope of the medial and the lateral plateau and try to pick the two. Um, and then if I replicate the normal slope, I think so up to sort of four and a half or five degrees tibial slope I'm happy with. So if you see, I've now got the femur on, yeah? We're going to split screen, show me Mako. So the robot knows where the bone is. The robot does not know where the prosthesis is. Mm -hmm. So I want to know whether I have medialized or lateralized my femoral component. So I'm using my probe and I'm placing my probe on the center of the prosthetic trochlea. And if you look at the Mako screen, top right screen, go to full full size Mako. But I'm looking there at my mark, my probe. And my probe is sitting in the center of the model. And so I think where I put the femur on the bone matches where my model is on, you know, where I plan to. So I'm going to mark that now. If we go back to, to the bone, I'm going to mark that because that's the correct mediolateral position. And I'm going to do the same on the tibia. So my tibia, my, you know, um, AP axis of the tibia, because I'm, I'm aligning to the medial edge of the patellar tendon, yeah, Kagi's line. So if you look at the bottom middle picture, my probe is lying in the exact front to back AP axis of my plan, and I'm going to mark that on the bone. You see what I'm, so yep. what I'm doing is just making sure I'm replicating the same position of my components because yep. that has a bearing on the precision of my, my gaps. So I'm now going to clear bone at the back of the femur. And is the... Um the aim to reproduce the position of the femoral component yeah. because you're undersizing in the ML dimension, uh, does it matter if it's... Um, it. say, say again, Rami, I missed the start of that. So your plan is to centre it. Is that because you've chosen a, a width that's undersized? Um, no, no, but I think... balance or... A, you know, I'm just trying to put the, the, in my my plan, when, the, when you're looking at your virtual gaps, your virtual gaps were dictated by the high point of your model on yep. the distal femur. So if I translate my femur, the high point of the femur is in a different position and it may give different gap tension. So all I'm doing is reproducing what I planned for so that my, 
my projected gap should be delivered. Yeah. Good. So that's all. I don't think I'm, you know, if I'm looking at my marks there, I'm not crazily narrow on that femur. Look at my marks. Well, I reckon that's pretty yep. cool. Yeah. 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 I'll just get the bone out the back of the lateral side. And then we're, we're, we're going to do a trial with my trials on. Yep. So we're going to do the tibia next, guys, please. All right. So what about tibial fixation? I'm, I'm hybrid. Everyone is happy with that. So what implants are you using here, um, Dermot? So this is a triathlon, is that what you mean? Yeah, and I'm just going to use the CR cemented base plate. Yeah. Right. So you got my picture there. So can you see Yeah. So we on – what picture are we showing? Yep. So I'm just going to put my tibia on. Yeah. Sorry. So, again, I'm going to align my planned – I'm going to align my tibial trial to the plan I have for the AP axis, which will give me, again, mediolateral position and external internal rotation position. And that should put my real component where my trials were predicted to be. So tibia's on. I'm going to have a poly. So give me a 10 and 11 poly. So, Luke. So I'm going to put a 10 millimetre poly on, CR poly. Yeah, and this may be... You know, right, maybe a mill loose, maybe a mill tight, yeah? Again, my goal was to have my – my goal – I'm happy to have my medial flexion gap, my tightest gap of all for, you know, kinematics, yeah? So we're coming out straight now. So give us the side view of the leg, guys. So I'm, I'm now just going to try like I normally would. So I'm not necessarily looking at the screen. I'm looking at my knee here, but – that leg looks straight to me, and if you look at the Mako screen, so go to large screen Mako, the Mako screen says I'm three degrees of flexion. I'm at three degrees of varus, which is what we planned. So if you look at the numbers on the right-hand side of the screen, three degrees flexion, and I can push the knee into one degree hyper extension. So that's pretty good. I planned three degrees of varus, and at the moment my leg is in three degrees of varus. I'm pretty happy with that. Yep. My projected gap was 20 millimetres, yeah, at the start of the case. And the gap, the gap I'm looking at on the screen there is 20 millimetres median lateral. So I have delivered the same gap I planned with a 10 millimetre poly in. I'm now going to do a stress view. So I'm going to do a valgus stress. I'm push, and So my medial number opens up one mil. So I go from 20 to 21 and I go from three varus to neutral, yeah, to zero. My lateral number is resting at 20 and goes to 21 and goes to five of varus. So I have one millimetre and one and a half uh, degrees of play medially and laterally. I might go one more mil to, to be slightly snugger. Now I've got the knee at 90 degrees of flexion. Yeah, so that's 90. I planned for the knee to be in three varus and is in three varus. I planned 20 medial number and 21 lateral number thereabouts or 20, and I'm pretty close. So my medial number is 21, so I can get one more mil medially, and my lateral number is loose, yeah? So the lateral flexion gap is always loose, yeah? Now that all those osteophytes are removed, so I'm going to go up a mil. I reckon he'll take an 11 millimetre poly here. So that's what I'm going to have, guys. I reckon you start getting that stuff ready, yeah? So I'm going to shake a 10 out. I'm going to put an 11 in. So your limb flexion is at three degrees. Uh, what are you aiming for? So again, I missed that one. My Your, your overall limb flexion, that's your residual flexion, uh, position in extension um, is okay, three good, okay, degrees good. because yeah, yeah. you're upsizing the insert, so that'll tighten it in extension a little bit as well. Yeah, so, um, so let's see, yeah, and also it depends if I'm cementing or not cementing too, yeah, that'd yep. be a fair point too, yeah. So, so, so yeah, I reckon I'm nervous of, of I'm, I, I still don't know what to do for patients that are naturally, you know, loose and hyperextend before the case, yeah. I don't like hyperextension, but that's another millimetre in extension, yeah. So he's gone from a 10 millimetre poly to an yep. 11 poly. Yep. So my limb flexion is still pretty good. I'm four degrees of flexion there. So, he, so you're happy with that. It's good. And I can't push him in a hyperextension yep. now. I'm pushing hard. My medial number is 21 and I can get 22. My lateral number is 21 and I can get – so I've got less play now and I'm happy yep. that that's snug. <coughs> At 90, yeah, I'm three degrees various planned, three degree delivered. My medial number is 21 and I can't – yeah, I can just get 22. And my lateral number, I can get 24. So I'm happy that that is a pretty balanced knee with numbers that were almost identical to what we planned. And the cool thing here is if you look at the lateral view, I now want to assess my lateral flexion laxity, yeah? So if you have 
sagittal laxity. Yeah, if we have, you know, a, 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 an unfilled medial flexion gap, or if we have a loose PCL, I should have draw. But that femur is, and I'm now trying to pull forward. I cannot anteriorly translate that femur. I don't know if you see me there, but I'm pulling, and yep. that medial condyle is not moving. You may say I'm too tight on the medial side, but I, I want to be snug and have a balanced, snug knee without needing to be medially constrained. So I reckon I'm pretty good there. So is I'm going to go with those way, numbers. You call with them. Is that the means that you also assess your PCL function uh, using the screen like that, Dermot? Well, I, I reckon it's cool to see whether you've got a tight PCL. It's interesting to see the tight PCL. You'll see mm. it rock up and you can then yeah. high thrust it, yeah? Okay. Well, I've got to keep rocking here a bit. No, yeah. keep going. There's yep. two questions uh, from our audience. Um, Mark Baker's asking, how much posterolateral tibial overhang uh, will you accept, particularly is it a, a symmetric tibial base plate rather than asymmetric tibial base plate? Yep. So so, so mediolaterally, I, I'll accept maybe one or something like that, but virtually none. Hmm. Yeah, and that's what – So you want We've got a different feed going on there. Something's going yeah. on with the feed there. Uh, yeah? Parag, I think we can hear you. Um, is that, the is other that thing your is, wife? Is that your wife in the background, Ron? No, mate, I'm in the office. Uh, Professor yeah, Kangil, yeah, I've heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Kangil Kim has a question too, and this is this is a good question, Dermot, um, because a lot of people will be watching who are familiar with navigation, and um, his assertion is that once you insert the cutting guide after some planning – um, you can use the saw. What's the real difference between modern navigation and robotics? Isn't this just yep. a form of modern navigation? Yeah, it is. I, I'm, I, I think there's two things. I think precision navigation, so if you have enhanced navigation, if you have on-table feedback, if you navigate your flexion gap and your extension gap, yes, you can achieve just about everything except a controlled saw cut with precision navigation. But the precision of a single cut with a with a handheld navigated block is still less than a robotic precision cut first time around. You can recut with nav yep. and cut repeatedly, but your precision with your first cut is less with nav than it is with. That's been shown in a cadaver. Model. We did some cadaver studies at the start to, with with um, blocks. Yeah, yep. but I think it depends on the, the the experience of the surgeon. I think all surgeons would agree with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I just got to concentrate. I'm going to do the patella now, mate. Go yep. ahead. Uh, I'm just looking at my teller and all four right uh, CRPA five cemented five eleven. CRPA. Young in, do you uh, resurface patellas in all your patients? No, uh, very rarely I do patella. Almost oh, ninety nine percent of my patients uh, I do patella. Yeah, yeah, so. so who do you choose to resurface the patella in? Yeah, uh, preoperatively uh, subluxated patella or very uh, severe bone deformity with the bone cop copy. Then I do uh, resurface, but uh, otherwise I don't do patella. I just remove Except some salty tissues and tidy up. Chuan He, are you a patella resurfacer? Yeah. Do you mix? I do selective uh, patella resurfacing. Um, maybe one third in my patients I resurface in the patella. So who do you resurface in? What are your indications? I, I will. Uh, Check the um, patella uh, track uh, after uh, 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 um, and uh, um, if the patient uh, with the um, inflammatory uh, disease, I will receive the patella. So, okay, cyanobitis, mm -hmm. inflammatory arthropathy, you'll do resurfacing yes. in all those patients. Yes, yes. Very good. But, but, but the problem is in China, uh, some patients uh, have with very small patella. So uh, I'm worried about the patellar fracture uh, and uh, other complications. So um, was that that they're very thin or they're very sclerotic very small. and very yes. er eroded? Yeah, very small. Yeah, very I small. agree. That's a, that's an indication for me not to resurface. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anything smaller than a 27 mil, you know, I won't resurface. Yeah, as in that's the the smallest component we have. So we're gonna. I'm just gonna wash the knee now and do a cemented patella. Yeah. Okay. I didn't get any criticism about not having the robot cut the patella. I was waiting for that. No, so. no, no. We don't want to criticise you, Dermot. You're under enough stress. We just want to see you put the implants in. So a question from the I'm audience. Of, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> from Muhammad again is, um, look, if, you've got, if you're a little bit loose after you've done your trial polyethylene yes. insert yep. um, from what you've planned, do you just accept that or – do you upsize your polyethylene or do you do more releases? I, I do everything the surgeon that asked the question does. If I'm unhappy with my post-resection balance, yes, because the robot predicted pre-resection balance 
and then I then assess my balance with the trials in like everyone else does. Yeah. I may do a partial soft tissue release. I may upsize my poly from one size to the next. In extreme cases, I may be yep. forced to do a, a PCL route, but the, the number of times I do for the deformity I get here in Australia, yep. we do soft tissue release in 5% of cases. Okay, yeah, I'm going to give you a time call because we've got about eight minutes to go. Good. I'm so cementing you know. that. Yeah, yeah, Tommy, I was running okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, so because you're cementing, it's a bit of an issue. Um, but if you went <laughs> cementless, it wouldn't be a problem. Uh, Parag, you want you to ask me a question, do, please? You told me to do yeah, a hybrid. So, so. Dermot, great surgery. You know, I don't do robotics yet, but uh, looking at you, I'm going to start. I saw Rami also the other day. I think it's an exciting thing. Well done, surgery. The question I have is, do you always do robotics in all your cases or are you selective about choosing patients yep, for doing good, robotics? Good question, Prague. Good to talk to you. Um, so at the moment, yeah, I'm, I do it on all comers. If I have patients with poor soft tissues on that medial tibial skin, then I'm nervous about putting pins through that skin, so I may not. If I have grossly osteoporotic 95-year-olds, I will not. But otherwise, I'll do them on all comers. So mm -hmm. extreme osteoporosis and very poor soft tissues that I'm nervous to put pins through, yeah, I will do a conventional knee on that patient. Yeah. And is it robotic or is it just a navigation? Or it's no, if, I, if, if I'm going to navigate, I will do a robotic. So if I'm happy to put pins in, I'm, I'm happy to, to do a robot. Okay. Okay. So I'm so going to put some local anaesthetic in now, and then yeah, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do the rest of the local at the end. We'll get on and do yeah. the, 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 um, the the tibia for you guys. Yeah. Yeah. So you always do the patella first, or you? Uh, I do because while I'm doing the patella, I'm then letting the, the local. I'm doing the local anaesthetic. Yeah, but you know, Rami's rushing me a bit here, so you know. So yeah, I'm putting. So, so to your point, I did ask you to do a hybrid as a demo, and I appreciate you doing that. So your routine go-to surface preparation: Are you cementless, hybrid, or cemented? Yeah, so I'm I'm hybrid for probably 65, 70% and cement less on, you know, 25, 30%, yeah? Right. Okay. And that's, you know, males with good bone would be my, you know, anyone who's osteoporotic, I'm not. Age brackets? Yeah, but again, age just goes with bone quality rather than, you know, their yep. birth date, I reckon, okay. yeah? So it's bone quality, not birth date, yeah? Yep. So we're going to cement, we're going to mix the tibia in a minute, guys. We'll just get it, we'll just get in. I want to put the parts in to show the final balance. Eh? When you do a hybrid, the cemented tibial component goes in first and then the uncemented femur. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, I'll cement. So I'll do the – while the patella is setting now, I'll put the, the, my local up the back and we're mixing the cement on the tibia as we speak. We've got large yeah. – and then – yeah. So without, without distracting you, obviously you've kept the robot – the navigation tools all in as I do, so we can get a final look once the two implants are yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, we do that for, yeah. Do you think that's important, or can we do without it at this point? Get it well, out. Well, I think it depends. Way? It depends on the surgeon and whether they're keeping data, and you know. So we've kept data on every single robotic knee we've done. We've got pre and post resection numbers on every knee we've done. So we've actually got quite a good database of, yeah. of that. But no, I think technically, if you don't care what your final number is, I yeah. choose my. Um, poly on, on my – so we're going to mix the tibia now, mix it. I choose my poly on my trials. I don't do my, you know, components and then choose it. I find that my trial will be the, – you know, that my trial poly and my real poly are the same. Yeah. Even if I'm cementing, I'm not scared that I'll go down a size or up a size. Sometimes yep. some surgeons tell me they want to trial with the parts. You know, I've, I've not had that, you know, my whole life I've just yep. – So at this point you've moved Mako away, obviously. Uh, it's yep. well out of the way now, correct? Yep. Um, yeah. It's still it's behind me, and in yep. theory, can I have a correct? In theory, it could come back in for me if so I once needed you've it. To. Moved it. Can you actually bring it back in and reset? Yeah, you can. Yeah, because oh, you can. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because the robot is just the, the, the yeah. So the I, I can bring it in at any time. Okay. So long as I've still got my trackers on, yeah, my anatomy is still the same. The computer's still the computer. If you like, the computer doesn't know the robot's not beside me. Right. Yeah. Okay. So there's just a little cyst here on the medial side. Yeah. So look, you know, the Mako is one of the first in our country of what, five, six years ago, and you're an early uptaker and you're obviously still using it. So just a quick um, analysis of why are you using it and why are you still using it? So two things. The, the reason to move to it was the recognition that 
imprecision of conventional instrumentation, I think, is no longer acceptable, you know, in this day and age. To, to say that you use a technique that is four or five degrees wrong sometimes, I think, is unnecessary with the technology we have available. So I think imprecision is no longer acceptable. Yeah, you may get away with it, which is the argument for people using conventional saying the registry shows there's no benefit. The question is, is whether imprecision is necessary or acceptable or whether we should be more precise. So precision is one. And then also acceptance that constitutional virus is a real thing. And so to, to, to try to put knees in at mechanically neutral seems wrong. And the ability to do pre-resection balancing, I think, really is the biggest thing that sold it to me. Yeah, pre-resection balance means I can achieve a balanced knee without unnecessary soft tissue release. Yeah. Thank you. You got a couple right? of minutes to go. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll hammer it down, and we're there. But maybe you can just put the tibial component, and then put the femoral line. It should be done. It's looking good. Doctor Koloki. Yep. Uh, thank you very much for a very nice surgery. So compared to another robotic system, the your system has a big advantage by using saw because uh, on other systems uh, I've been watching uh, use a. Uh, uh, Burr. 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 Yeah, burr. Yeah. It's a very, uh, I had a big advantage. Have you any experience with the uh, burr cutting? Well, we do. The, the, the preparation for partial knee replacements with the Mako system it started with a burr, and preparation for femoral components with partial is re required for a burr for these components. So, yes, I've used the burr, and the burr for these knees is a bit slower than a saw blade generates a bit more bone debris than a saw blade. So I'm my preference is a saw blade at the moment, but in the future we may not have components that are planar. We may have femoral components that are you know, curved and we may have tibial components that are curved. So I'm going to put the poly on, we'll extend the knee, and then you'll see my final numbers and then you guys can go home, yeah? But, yes, I use the burr for partials and the saw for totals, yeah? So the real yeah, theme is going on now, and then we'll just get the numbers for you. So, bang, bang. you got a cement femoral component, obviously. Yeah. So, yeah. Bang, bang. So, the so legs kind of come out now. So, on the screen now, the robotic screen, that's the finished product now. So, we have a leg that's resting in three flexion. We have three varies as we planned. We have 20 millimetre gaps as we planned. 21 millimeter medial, 21 lateral at 90 degrees. Yeah, it's it's slightly that's 0.5 millimeters greater in flexion. Yeah, so yep. and and that balance is pretty good, guys. So again, sagittal stability there is very good. If you look at that tibia, it's not moving on the medial side; it's rotating, it's pivoting medially, but not translating. So that's great, guys. To me, that's a finished product of what I wanted to create at the start, and it delivered it. So Dermot, well done exactly on time and the whole thing is you've planned it beforehand you've used a tool to deliver exactly what you've planned uh, we appreciate your time and your team's time delivering to us virtually thanks very much mate we're going really to nice. sign it's off really well done guys on. thank you well mm -hmm. done nice Ex extend to demonstration well thanks done, very guys. much thank everybody you. thanks Dermot. thanks See you guys. See thank you thank you much. thanks young in thanks Shwani. thank you thanks Barak. thank you you still there rami Hello everyone, and uh, today the session 15K and the new session. I'm Kazutaka Sugimoto from Tokyo, Japan. I feel great honor at this honor to this opportunity. And I and uh, Dr. Asa Siddiqui moderate this session. Primary knee session looks good, feels bad. The first faculty either computed assisted to the asprosty and the candy came from Korea. Surgical treatment of spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee based on his pastorosity. Tomoyuki Saito from Japan. 
Why primary torneal splasty fell in 2021? Fabio Catani from Italy. And explain pain following torneal splasty. Yang Ying from China. Anterior pain after torneal splasty who need secondary pateral surfacing. And Chuan He from China. How to improve satisfaction after torneal splasty? Patient factor, prostate factor, sur and surgical technique. Wang Zhang from China. Systematic approach to evaluating a problematic knee. What does the evidence tell you? Arthur Sergei and uh, from Pakistan. Stephanie Stiffness after torneal splasty, prevention, etiology, and treatment. Chris Momo from United States America. So, and after that, we have a 10 minutes of Q&A. So please keep in touch Slido if you want. Okay, please start with the Kanzi King. Good afternoon. My name is Kanzi Kim from Gyeonggi University, Seoul, Korea. Today, I'd like to talk about computer assisted total arthroplasty in overview. For computer assisted TKA, we may expect improvement alignment and gap, and we want to decrease complication or operation time, and finally, it should improve outcomes. Computer assisted total arthroplasty has various types. Since I have used most these systems, I'd like to talk about all the systems in detail. First, I will talk about navigation. In early meta-analysis, the Mason he reported significant improvement in component position and mechanical alignment in CAS DKA. On the contrary, Bowens in the same year they reported few radiographic advantages in CAS to conventional technique. It's controversial. Meanwhile, recently published the systematic review reported that there is no constant benefit in alignment and there is no benefit at all in PROM, a range of motion and complication or reoperation in navigation systems. Another meta-analysis published from Korea recently, they also concluded there is no significant difference in clinical or radiological results between computer assisted navigation and conventional total arthroplasty. So most of the studies in navigation-assisted TKA is strengthened in coronal alignment, but with the exception of few, we found that CAS does not provide better clinical with long-term outcomes. The other advantage, I think, is uh, good for extra deformity. I also reported, and as you see, this is very difficult when you use the conventional instrument system. Otherwise, we can perform the corrective osteotomy first. So using this navigation system, we can obtain very good alignment and balanced knee. We also reported in difficult knees, such as hemophilia, using a navigation system with good clinical and radiological results. Let's move to patient-specific instrument. We can make this kind of patient-specific clean guide using preoperative MR or CIST-based system. However, Current data did not support routine use of a PSI in terms of a clinical and radiologic benefit. This midterm study also reported no difference in survivorship and clinical outcomes between PSI and conventional systems. So I think currently PSI system has been almost disappeared in the market. Let's move to robotic TKA. In the past, we used active robot systems such as Robota, but nowadays passive and tactile robot systems such as Mako, Nebio, Valis, and Omnibotics are used. This is initial study of active robot systems. They reported less outliers and post blood loss in robot side, but there is no difference in range of motion in this course. Rather, longer operation time and longer skin incision in robot side was observed. We also reported robot-assisted TKA in severely deformed knee, such as hemophilia, with good 
radiologic and clinical outcomes. But when we performed the long-term studies, after performing robot assisted TKA in osteoarthritic knee, we couldn't find any improvement in clinical radiologic outcomes compared to conventional TKA. Also, other systematic review reported the results are inconclusive in clinical scores or complications. So, currently, robot system has been moved to passive and haptic systems, thereby surgeon-controlled interactive robot arm for astroplasty. This is a systematic review about MECO city-based robot arm systems. They say there is a reliable procedure because it reduces the post-operative pain in implant position with equal or slightly superior improvement of the functional outcome, but it's only one year result. Also, systematic review reported improved accuracy and patient reported outcomes after using Robodam assisted TKA. Based on our experience with the robot system, while autonomous systems have fallen out of favor, haptic systems with technical improvements become widely used. But more studies are needed whether robotics truly improve the long-term outcomes. Let's move to last topic, the sensor. It's a wireless measuring tool of compartmental loads of trial and real implants. Actually, it's a very new one. So far, many studies, including our study, did not show any improvement after using sensor compared to conventional techniques. Dr. Berek concluded no proven clinical benefit after using computer-assisted TKA in his systematic review and current meta-analysis compared among navigated robotic PSI or standard clean guide, they concluded no superiority over standard clean guides. And there's no reason to use these special approaches because the high cost, more learning curve, and high risk of complications. This is my take-home message. Although CAS has a theoretical advantage to conventional TKA, there has been no supporting data regarding overall clinical and radiologic outcomes. Additional cost, prolonged operation time, and risk of a pin site fracture are inevitable current limitations. Passive, haptic robot system seems better than other previous robot or CAS systems. Furthermore, in case of extra-articular deformity, hardware in femur, deformed anatomy, CAS would be a viable option in these cases. CAS system is constantly evolving and it requires fundamental grasp of advantage and disadvantages. So far, I think it looks good but feels not that effective. Will the next generation be better? I hope so. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank President Udiparama for inviting me to this meeting. In this session, I'm going to talk about a joint preserving surgery for spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee, SONC, based on the histopathology. SONC was first described by Orbeck in 1968. The characteristic clinical signs are acute onset pain, which is intense at night, and marked joint swelling. Women are more susceptible to the disease than men. Recently, much attention has been directed to the disorders of subchondral bone as a possible etiologic mechanism. However, the cause of the disease is still unknown. Therefore, the histological examination was carried out by using tissue samples taken during surgery. The histology shows that fibroblastic cell infiltration forms a granulation tissue with many vascular formations and inflammatory cellular infiltrates. The lamella, lamella bone matrix is quite thin. These findings suggest that the interosseous pressure may be high, and the bone marrow metabolism may be activated 
inside of the region. Using tissue samples from the articular surface to bone marrow taken from 11 cases, the location of abnormal region was studied. The result indicated that all uh, regions were located within the depth of less than 5 mm from the subchondral bone, indicating that these regions are closely associated with disorders of subchondral bone. Sunk uh, mainly affect the medial femoral condyle, and the other compartment are relatively healthy. Knee function is well maintained. Therefore, sunk is a good candidate for high table osteotomy. Considering above mentioned matters, osteochondral autograft transplantation, mosaic plasty was carried out as a concomitant procedure with opening wedge high table osteotomy. In this procedure, two or three osteochondral grafts are implanted into weight bearing portion at the cartilage defect, and the multiple drillings are carried out around the osteochondral grafts. Additionally, opening wedge high table osteotomy is performed using a tone fix plate and wedge shaped hydraulic apatite blocks. To elucidate the effect of mosaic plasty to Sonk's region, clinical outcomes and cartilage status were evaluated in comparison with bone marrow stimulation by drilling. And the relation between the region size and the post-operative cartilage status was investigated. 57 patients with thunks were treated with these operative procedures. There were 27 patients in drilling group and 30 in mosaic group. No significant differences were found in age, gender, and the question of the staging between the two groups, except for region size. Clinical outcomes were assessed by Japanese Orthopedic Association score. In JOA scoring system, zero point is allotted to severely disabled knees and 100 points to normal knees. Radiologically, a pre- and post-operative femoral tibial angles were measured. Post-operative status of articular cartilage was assessed by arthroscopy, according to cartilage repair assessment by the International Cartilage Repair Society at the time of plate removal. Overall repair assessment was done according to total point. Concerning knee alignment, preoperative 183 degrees of FTA was corrected to postoperative 168 degrees. The mean JOA score was improved at postoperative two years compared with preoperative values in both groups. There were no significant differences between the two groups. According to overall repair assessment, cartilage status was graded as normal uh, or nearly normal in 41% of the drilling group and 90% of the uh, mosaic plasty group. The results suggested that cartilage repair in mosaic plasty group significantly better than that in drilling group. This scatter uh, diagram is showing that relationship between the re region sizes and the ICRS total scores. The drilling group showed that repair with normal or nearly normal was observed in all less than four square centimeters of region size. On the contrary, mosaic plasty group exhibited that repair with normal or nearly normal was independent of region size. This is a case of 75-year-old man with a left knee affected by osteonecrosis. At the time of the index surgery, 
there was a large cartel defect expanded to whole articular surface of the medial femoral condyle. In two years after surgery, the defect was covered with white reparative tissue. The reconstructed articular surface had a round and smooth shape. In conclusion, firstly, histology indicated that so-called sunk uh, may consist, consist of highly activated bone marrow region. Secondly, sunk region exhibited a good capability to restore the damaged articular surface by release from overload due to high tuberosiotomy and the surgical treatment of cartilage defect. Thirdly, opening wedge high tuberosiotomy concomitant with mosaic plasty provided normal or nearly normal cartilage repair irrespective of region size. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you again for letting me participate in this great symposium. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, about uh, this lecture on why primary total knee arthroplasty failed in 2021. Uh, I have no disclosure related to the topics. Uh, in 2030, uh, in worldwide, uh, total knee arthroplasty will be more than 3 million. And so, total knee arthroplasty revision are expected to increase. Uh, total knee arthroplasty failure and subsequent revision uh, is a costly problem and also is uh, substantial for patient morbidity. The mechanism of total knee arthroplasty failure will change over time because also uh, we have been seeing changes over time. Why? Because demographically evolving naturoplastic population, uh, there is introduction of new surgical technique and technology and implant in addition to the market for next generation implants. And so it's critical that this question about failing of total knee arthroplasty is repeatedly studied by various studies designed in multiple clinical settings in, in the next future. If you look at the number of revision, we can see that there is a slight decline of knee revision rates from 2OA. And the, 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 the most important reason probably because the improved survivorship as a result of clinical feedback and improved adoption of evidence-based practice. If you look at Swedish knee arthroplasty register, we know that cumulative related risk for total arthroplasty revision is diminishing through the years and is stable between 206 to 2018. Again, we see here clearly that the CRR in the last 10 years is lower than in the period between 89 and 88. And also, the absolute distribution of total knee arthroplasty revision has diminished between the same time uh, and the same periods. And this is uh, also another important uh, related to the improvement on surgical technique is that results of the different Swedish units have become more similar. If you look at the National Joint Registry, we see that uh, the most affected patients are the younger patients and men compared to, to, uh, to women. If you look at the uh, uh, failure mode, uh, infection is most likely to be the reason that a joint is revised in the first year. This is for the National Joint Registry, is very important data because it's stratifying the failure mode according to the years. Uh, that the revision occurred. And the revision between the first and the third year is most likely to be the septic loosening and pain. After th the third year, a septic loosening dominates. In the Swedish knee arthroplasty register, uh, the, uh, the failure modes are very similar. And so infection is the most common reason for revision. And uh, the sharp increase in the number of primaries over the years 
uh, leads to over-representation of early revisions that include infection, and this is an important uh, factor. And also, uh, patella problem, particularly when the patella is not resurfaced, uh, and instability can be uh, the other major reasons for total knee arthroplasty revision. If you look at the Australian Orthopedic Association Registry, uh, and uh, we uh, look at the revision after um, uh, um, 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 taking out the infection, we see that loosening uh, is a major fact, uh, a major reason for revision, followed by, again, patella reasons and instability. So that registry confirmed what we have been uh, look at uh, the Swedish uh, in uh, uh, registry. If you look at the uh, American uh, Joint Replacement Registry, we see almost the same thing. And so the faction accounts for the majority, 24% of the cases, total neoplastic revision, followed by loosening and instability. If you look, uh, interestingly, polyethylene wear uh, is, is greatly uh, reduced, uh, uh, slightly more than 3%. Increasing number of knee revision due to infection are, as we commented before, uh, is related to the increasing numbers of primary total knee arthroplasty performed. It's quite stable uh, in the past uh, four years. And also, revision burden is very stable, uh, as you can see here in the graphs, around 7.5, 7 7.6. So in conclusion, uh, total knee arthroplasty failure and subsequent revision is a costly problem expected to increase, increasing because it's increasing uh, the number of primary procedure. Uh, there is a slight decline of total knee arthroplasty revision rate and CRR in the last few years. Infection is now the most common reason uh, for early total knee arthroplasty revision worldwide. Uh, there is a dramatic decrease of incidence of revision due to polyethylene wear compared to the past. Uh, infection is overrepresented due to the increased number of primary total knee arthroplasty and early revision for infection, that procedure. Losing account for the majority of total knee arthroplasty, about 20-30% after infection, Affecting cementing technique is mandatory. This is why we're looking more to the cement less implants. And also, very important to have appropriate diagnostic tools and good timing uh, to define uh, the best total knee arthroplasty uh, revision. Thank you very much for your attention. Hi everyone, I'm Yongin from the Catholic University of Korea. My topic is unexplained pain following TKA. The satisfaction rate of 20% following TKA has persisted over the last decade, despite substantial advances in surgical technologies. Influencing factors for dissatisfaction after TKA include level of residual pain, functional outcomes, and preoperative expectations. In order to diagnose the painful DKA, we have to rule out mechanical causes such as loosening, instability, and infection, and also arthrofibrosis. But residual pain is reported by patients who reportedly have a physically rare function in knee. Why? Because DKA is very uh, painful surgery. Need to say, one of my patients said to me, then, does everyone feel the same amount of pain after TKA? If not, who's complaining more intense and persistent pain? We have to consider uh, patient characteristics such as psychological or uh, psychiatric factors and uh, chronic uh, pain conditions which can increase the pain sensitivity and gender, age, and comorbidities. Today, I'm going to talk about the chronic pain conditions, especially on uh, central sensitization. 
Central sensitization is not a mental disorder, a non-organic disorder. It is a state of abnormal and intense enhancement of uh, pain by mechanisms in the CNS. We know the central desensitized patients are more pain, uh, such as hypoalgesia, and have more pain, uh, such as uh, allodynia. Hopefully, CS can be screened out uh, using uh, CSI, central sensitization inventory, which is a self-report outcome measure. It uh, consists of from a zero point to uh, 100 point, and uh, more than 40 points of CSI score uh, can be diagnosed as uh, central sensitization. And uh, CSI is a reliable and valid uh, tool to diagnose the CS. CSI consists of 25 questionnaires. And in TK patients, uh, patients having uh, more than 40 points of CSI score have more pain and persistent pain. Why centrally sensitized patients uh, have more pain even with physically well functioning artificial disease? We investigated the patient uh, preoperative expectations and found that CS patients have higher expectations. We used the uh, HSS knee replacement expectation survey score, and CS patients had significantly higher HSS KLES score for pain relief and psychological well being. The higher the level of expectations, the poorer clinical outcomes. And uh, we investigated the relationship between the pain sensitivity and clinical outcomes and found that, that uh, increased the pain sensitivity led to inferior clinical outcomes. We used the pain sensitivity questionnaire, which is one of the screening tools of CS. Up to one year, high PSQ score group had a higher pain, bus, and worse vomit. And uh, minimal clinically important differences for the warm-up of CS patients was great, which means the CS patients showed a, a low, lower MCID achievement rate uh, compared to non central sensitized patients. It can be a cause of persistent pain after TKA in CS patients. And postoperatively, we found that the preoperative CS was persistent until two years after TKA. Two years after TKA, preoperative CS remained unchanged, even after TKA. CS patients had worse quality of life, functional disability, and dissatisfaction than non-CS patients at two years. So this diagram showed the situation of CS patients. Preoperatively, they had high expectations. Perioperatively, they had increased pain sensitivity and feel more pain. Also, relatively, their CS characteristic uh, has not changed. Even they had greater MCID because uh, their uh, expectations are higher, and but the improvement is not uh, good. So uh, they had lower uh, MCID achievement rate compared to non-CS patients. Then what are the uh, strategies uh, for the pain control for CS patients? We focused on duloxetine, which is one of uh, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. So we investigated the effect of duloxetine uh, in CS patients. Duloxetine group had a better pain metrics and superior quality of recovery two weeks after TKA. Duloxetine might help for unexplained pain after TKA, such as in uh, centrally sensitized patients. So, in summary, uh, CS can be a cause of unexplained pain following TKA. So, uh, for the pain plea, we have to rule out the mechanical or infectious causes, and we have to rule out psychological or psychiatric causes, and uh, recommend a screen as CS patients, and we have to give realistic expectations for pain relief to patients, and also give pain education explaining the mechanism of CS. And uh, we should consider incorporation of duloxetine or similar drugs into multimodal analgetic protocol according to their severity of CS. And this is the uh, last slide. In CS patients, uh, they have a high expectation, so we have to uh, give uh, them the uh, pain education to have uh, realistic expectations. 
And uh, we have to include uh, pharmacology treatment after TKA. And uh, we have to give the uh, pain education and cognitive, uh, if needed, uh, cognitive behavioral treatment to improve pain, co pain conditions. Thank you for your attention. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. He Chuan from Regent Hospital, Shanghai Jiao Tong University Medical School. I'm very glad to attend this combined virtual meeting online. Today, my topic is anterior pain after TKA. Totally arthroplasty has been shown to be a successful procedure for patients with end uh, stage osteoarthritis. But uh, according to literature, up to 19% of patients are uh, dissatisfied with their prosthesis. And uh, approximately 5 to 10 percent of patients experience uh, anterior pain after primary TKA uh, or through improving patella friendlies of um, uh, femoral component designs. What's the anterior knee pain? Uh, anterior knee pain can be described as the um, regional patella or parapatella pain. Um, with patients uh, uh, and the limiting patients in their every life. Um, the patients suffer from anterior pain, experience difficulty in standing up from a chair, working up or uh, downstairs, and uh, riding a bicycle. Uh, anterior pain is an uh, important reason for patients' dissatisfaction after TKA. So there are two questions. Firstly, is the patella responsible for the anterior pain? So far, most of the studies evaluating anterior pain has focused on the patella femoral joint. Secondly, does the secondary patella resurfacing really resolve the problem? Uh, in clinical practice, uh, surgery is easy to do the decision of uh, secondary patella resurfacing. When you face this uh, patient suffering from anterior pain uh, after patella tendon TKA, you know, the most of the surgeons uh, don't resurface the patella during routine primary TKA in China and some country as uh, well. But according to literature, Similar resolution re, uh, following the uh, secondary for uh, patella resurfacing uh, for anterior pain after primary TKA is about uh, 44 to 64 percent. In other words, uh, the failure rate is close to half. The causes for anterior pain are usually uh, multifactory. Uh, several patients and the technical related factors involved in anterior pain has been identified. Um, patella femoral joint problem, uh, muscle unbalance, uh, intra uh, in a uh, femoral component P bearing design, um, changes in joint line, bowel rotation could all contribute to anterior pain after TKA. A diagnostic process to Get the exact course of pain is challenging. In patients with anterior knee pain after TKA, the first steps of clinical workup are a detailed history, clinical examination, and conventional radiographies. Also, joint as pressure and fluid analysis are necessary to rule out infection. Most diagnostic algorithms. Also consider 3D images uh, such as CT for uh, assessment of TK position and uh, more detailed uh, analysis of um, resolution 9 and uh, defects. In addition, MRI and the bone scan are employed for further diagnostics. But it's still difficult to identify the patient's problems. Uh, recently, a novel technology, single photon in imaging computer the tomography, uh, CT has been used in clinical diagnosis. Um, it combines the uh, functional and uh, anatomic images, improves the image quality, uh, and uh, recently it's used in 
joint disease diagnosis. Uh, since uh, 2010, Dr. Hishman uh, and the colleagues uh, have highlighted the clinical value of bone uh, spec CT uh, for assessment of patients with um, M4TKA. Uh, they published the many articles uh, to demonstrate the, this technique can uh, actually uh, determine the um, parasitic bone uh, twister uptake and the position of TK uh, components. Recently, this group confirmed, uh, confirmed the bone uh, specificity has excellent uh, sensitivity and uh, uh, specificity for diagnosis. Uh, Tail of femoral problems after TKA. The pictures come from Dr. Hishman's paper published in 2011. The pictures showing the spec CT imaging, the imaging of a patient with patella femoral problems, mechanical loosening of tibia components and the femoral components as a course of painful. Um, totally as drastic respectively. From 2014, SPECT has been adopted a routine modality for assessment of patients uh, with pen 4 tk in our institute. We did a retrospective study to find out the SPECT's diagnostic value. Uh, from 2014 to 2018, um, a total of um, 26 leads uh, of um, 25 patients with enter knee pain after primary TKA was included. Um, all patients uh, underwent a routine diagnostic uh, algorithm mentioned above. Uh, infection was ruled out clinically. In the meantime, from primary TKA to the data of spec CD imaging was 18 months. Uh, results. In all uh, 26 of these, uh, 17 uh, progressing of um, patella femoral joint osteoarthritis uh, were, uh, were identified as the cause of anterior pain. Uh, 11 of them was revised with uh, secondary patella resurfacing, and uh, two of them, uh, the two of them, the, the, those 11 cases. So, also did an uh, insert exchange at the same time. Their patients uh, hated to receive the uh, resurfacing surgery, so the uh, secondary patella resurfacing was denied. Uh, three needs no surgical treatment. And in all 11 needs with secondary patella resurfacing, the intraoperative findings confirmed, uh, confirmed the preoperative specialty diagnosis of uh, patella femoral joint uh, problem. We also did a follow-up study for secondary patella resurfacing. 11 needs of um, 10 patients uh, revised with uh, secondary patella resurfacing as a follow-up from uh, average to one month. Eight patients uh, reported the, that the secondary resurfacing resolved their anterior pain symptom. Uh, resolution re following secondary patella resurfacing uh, for anterior pain is 81.8%. So, spec CT is clinical value proven. Uh, it's due to the benefits in establishing the correct diagnosis in patients with anterior pain after primary TK. Uh, spec CT helped them. Um, Increasing success rate of um, secondary patella resurfacing. Let's show some uh, classical cases. Uh, this is a um, uh, 78 years old female patient underwent uh, primary uh, patella sparing total knee osteoplasty uh, for osteoarthritis of the right knee joint. One year post the surgery, the patient continued to uh, complain of anterior pain to the operated knee. Uh, this pain uh, was active related and it uh, got worse at 15 to 30 degree of knee fraction. The anterior posterior and the lateral uh, radiographies at one year after primary TK was unremarkable. Uh, spec CT 
imagine you bring a tracer haptic specifically to natural patella facet and according CT analysis, uh, the femoral component rotation and the position are all correct. The diagnostics suggested the PFG problem as the source of anterior pain. In revision surgery, uh, an uh, impingement between lateral patella facet and the lateral femoral groove uh, was identified. And the bone defect at the lateral patella facet also was found. Uh, this knee uh, revised with secondary patella resurfacing and the lateral soft tissue release. Accordingly, uh, we see an immediate improvement in the patient's symptom. The lady's anterior pain totally disappeared at a two year post operative follow up. Uh, this is another case. A uh, 65 years old female patient underwent a primary TK for arthritis uh, uh, for right knee with no patellar resurfacing. As, um, patient had suffered from persistent uh, anterior pain and stiffness for nine months after TK. Her range of motion was only 10 to uh, 70 degrees. The surgeon did a um, Manipulation under anesthetic and uh, three months after TK. With almost 120 degree of flexion, but patients right knee soon went back to the original stiffness. Because the scan I uh, radiography just taken from, uh, taken after uh, the manipulation. It looks good. That's actually. Imagine showing from super abdicts specifically to lateral patella facet, just like the, uh, last, uh, the, the first case. And this patient, the secondary patella is surfacing, but the MRI and CT analysis should uh, consist of components small position. The femoral component and tibial tree also is an extensive. Um, internal rotation. Uh, so secondary patella resurfacing alone wouldn't work in this patient. I recommended a total revision to her. Summary. Entry pain after primary TKA is still a complex issue. The challenge is in identifying the cause of pain. The value of specialty on diagnosis of patella femoral Osteoarthritis was confirmed. Combined with the conventional diagnostics, specialty should help find out uh, the patients, uh, those who benefit from the secondary patella resurfacing and improving the resolution rate of um, entry pain. At the last, I strongly recommend uh, I recommend that a specialty should be used as a routine tool to diagnostic notice for patients with anterior pain after primary TK. Thank you for your listening and I appreciate your attention. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, uh, dear audience. Uh, my name is Guo Tiang Zhang from 301 Hospital in Beijing, China. My topic is medial condylar restoration for total knee arthroplasty. As we all know, with the technique of total knee arthroplasty developing, patient satisfaction was more and more concerned. About 260 related papers were published in recent years. However, the satisfaction rate of total knee arthroplasty were still at the range of 80 to 90%. One of the most important factors of unsatisfaction is dysfunction post-operation caused by technique, technique error. Firstly, the current technique is easy to change the joint line, such as the mechanic alignment. The average, uh, the average elevation of uh, joint line in primary total knee 
is about three millimeters. Joint line elevation can cause anterior knee pain, uh, decrease range of motion, patellar baja, mid flexion instability, patellar tendon impediment, and uh, accelerated wear. Let us see the standard MA technique. This is an osteoarthritis case. The joint line is in various position. When I cut uh, the tibia and the femoral bone according to the MA technique, the joint line is, is a uh, perpendicular to the mechanical axis. We found the joint line is already elevated especially its medial side. At the same time, the thickness of the uh, prosthesis is less than that uh, of cutting bone at the medial part of the femur. On the other hand, although we use the uh, same guide to cut the, and follow the same measure resection principle, the knee is different, different at cartilage wear and loss. Therefore, the real thickness of cutting bone is totally different. This is a measure study uh, done by our team. Results show that thickness of bone cut on medial distal femur and the posterior medial femur are more than that of prosthesis. Uh, every, every three millimeter increment. Maybe three to four millimeter joint line elevation doesn't affect the stability at four uh, extension and the 90 degree flexion, but it could affect mid flexion stability. From the video, we can see the knee joint is stable. Inflection in full extension and 90 degree flexion. However, we can find it is a little bit laxity in thir uh, 30 to 60 degree flexion. At this, at the same time. During its moving from extension to flexion, the tibia is external rotated. This may be a kind of subtle instability and will cause proctoxical anterior translation and mid flexion. Therefore, the patient is afraid to do some high performance activities, such as up and down stairs. So, let us review the feature of natural knee. On the later part of the knee, there are more freedom, more mobility, more glide. On the medial part, more constraint, more stability, create medial pivot movement. As though medial femoral condyle, it maintains medial joint line. So we design the medial restoration philosophy. It's, it is restore uh, original structure of medial condyle of the femur, restore medial joint line, restore ligament tension of the medial side, and stability at full of range of motion, uh, acquire natural uh, kinematics, that is medial pivot mo movement. When we carry out this uh, distal femur resection, we need to consider it the thickness of cartilage and the uh, girth. Allow various cutting bone on tibial side in two degree. Posterior uh, condylar resection also ensure the equal replacement and including the thickness of cartilage. This is lateral X-ray preoperative and uh, post-operative X3. We can see the PCO is larger uh, on post-operation X3 than pre-operation due to considering cartilage thickness. Using the MR technique, we can find, we can find uh, the full range of motion stability from this video. <laughs> And also found the medial pivot moment. This is a natural knee moment. 
Okay. This is a uh, post-operative X-ray. As for the rehabilitation after total knee uh, arthroplasty, using this MR technique, uh, we can ask all the people, all the patients, walk with bear with with bearing on first day post operation, just like that. <laughs> These patients also uh, walk with bearing on two, three days post operation. This patient just walk um, in hospital two, three days post operation. Three months follow up, she can climb with normal gait. So, so many patients just like that. Two weeks follow up. And uh, when they post operation, the patient can walk with normal gait. Three months follow up, she can climb stairs. This is also. So, this. IMR technique just focus on the restoration of medial condylar structure, avoid mid flexion instability, limit or no release medial soft tissue, maintain original soft tissue tension on medial side. If you use smart tool, uh, navigation or robot can assist bone cut and the soft tissue balance accurately. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to thank the uh, organizers of the course for allowing me the opportunity to uh, speak at this uh, forum. Uh, I would spend the next six minutes speaking about this, uh, a systematic approach to uh, address a problematic knee replacement. I'd like to fit as much uh, current uh, literature as possible, uh, but it, it, in seven minutes it's going to be. Uh, a tough job to do. However, I will crack on. As a young surgeon, when I was growing up, we used to tell patients that this is a 95% successful surgery. Now we, now we know that success is a very, very relative term. That figure is entirely incorrect. Uh, we, at that time, probably did not quite uh, know what PROMs are, or we did not quite use PROMs in coming up with that uh, figure. Uh, as a more experienced surgeon now, when I see patients in my clinic with a knee x-ray looking like that, and the patient still in significant pain a, a number of uh, years down from the knee replacement, you know, it, it comes to you as, you know, what am I doing wrong or what's wrong with this patient? And it is really these patients who, who we need to focus on, and the session is uh, actually focusing on that uh, particular problem as well. How big is this problem? We know that there are about 10 to 20 percent, that there is about 10 to 20 percent dissatisfaction rate. If you look at the Scandinavian registry outcome, which is a huge chunk of patients, they had about 82 percent satisfied patients. If you look at this particular paper, which evaluated contemporary knee designs, uh, it is still the same. It is it's still about 80 percent satisfaction rate. So we've got a huge chunk of patients who are dissatisfied. But it is a big problem, and, and, and that should serve as a reality check for all, all, all of us. The Canada tool published this fairly recently, which looked at preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative factors, including things like mental health problems, lower back pain, a couple of things that we hardly ever evaluate. Uh, and then uh, we, we know now that mobile bearing and surgery services have shown to, you know, to increase patient satisfaction. However, that's still debatable. Postoperatively, postoperative pain control and rehabilitation, very importantly, Meeting patients' expectations is key to having a dissatisfied patient. If you look at the top 10 research priorities, pain, infection, stiffness, how your health service is configured, surgical and non-surgical management strategies available to you, as well as active measures that you use to evaluate the outcomes of the knee is key. Now, what are the causes? What are the diagnoses that can cause pain after total knee arthroplasty? The list is long and exhaustive. 
Uh, if you go through this instruction course lecture, you will see so what, which one of this are we dealing with in a particular patient. For that, you have to go back to basics. So hit your history, physical examination, and a system of investigations to reach the right diagnosis and manage appropriately. We all know about the specific criteria. Uh, it's, it's now part of the board's guidelines. It, it is very nicely illustrated in this paper by, uh, again, published recently by Murray et al., uh, which talks about stiffness, soft tissue problems, patella problems, excessive mechanism dysfunction, confident loosening, infection fracture, instability, and confident wear or breakage. Now, uh, if you have this acronym, it's, it's a good way to remember what you're dealing with, and then possibly the solution is going to be surgical. If you, after your four or six stage assessment of history of examination and investigations, if, if you're, or you have a specific diagnosis or fits one of the specific acronym, and possibly you're looking at a surgical uh, uh, solution, if not, then you're probably possibly looking at, you know, getting involved with your pain management colleagues, getting involved with your uh, psychiatry colleagues, uh, your, your rehabilitation therapists, your occupation therapists, and very importantly, the patient's primary physician or the general practitioner who will be who, who would be your, your uh, anchor, really, uh, for managing this patient. Now, in history, uh, when you do your four-stage evaluation, you're looking at pre-op symptoms, what the deformity was, comorbids, post -op, whether there were any post-op complications, uh, whether there was a pain-free window, uh, and a detailed pain history. Examination, you should be looking at straight leg alignment, gait and walking aids, uh, whether there are unclinical features of infection, range of motion, residual deformity, instability, especially mid flexion instability, and then assess, form assessment of hips and spine, a good neurovascular assessment, is key. In the labs, you should be uh, you should always investigate for infection with CRP and ESR. Uh, there are different uh, you know, guidelines, and you should stick to your uh, guidelines which you use in your practice. Uh, and then finally, uh, if there is, uh, you need to identify the organisms by virtue of an aspiration or biopsy. Finally, uh, imaging should include weight bearing long leg films, lateral X rays, which should be weight bearing, patella skyline views. In UK, you can use Rosenberg or Schuss views. And uh, yeah, this is what I was talking about guidelines. You can either use the ICM guidelines, a lot of hard work put in by Pervisian colleagues, or the EBJIS guidelines, which we use currently, which have just been published this January and now adopted by the MSIS. Um, specific special investigations such as CT, uh, SPECT scan, and MRI scans with metal subtraction are, are, are useful, uh, but they should be used judiciously. Uh, CT scan is really good for a uh, rotation profile. For example, a SPECT scan can show you uh, difficult diagnosis, such as this example, where there was an osteochondral defect uh, uh, because of uh, lateral subluxation of the patella, uh, which was causing all the anterior knee pain. An MRI is useful in certain settings, again, controversial use, but this you can see is metal allergy and large pseudotumor forming, rare in the setting of a knee replacement, more common with hip replacements, but can happen and uh, sometimes an MRI is required. Again, not to diagnose probably, but to evaluate the extent of the problem. Uh, a nice pre-revision worksheet, again, going through the specific diagnosis. It's basically a tick box. It's nice to have in your clinic if you're a revision of party surgeon, and then you can systematically tick off each of the problems as a yes or no, and then eventually, if you don't have a diagnosis, then you're considering doing something different. Now, we all like algorithms in orthopedics. Again, this is an algorithm that is nice to print and paste in your office or somewhere uh, where, where you can use it. Uh, so, well, you're looking at whether there's instability, whether it's normal, uh, and then you can work through different pathways and arrive at whether you want to do surgery in terms of a revision or you want to manage this as a multimodality, multidisciplinary care. Beware, beware of the pitfalls, which are complex regional pain syndrome, psychological assessment of these patients, and influence of low back pain control. So always investigate. Uh, this particular article on complex regional pain syndrome is very interesting to read. If you go back and see how many of these patients are actually being misdiagnosed or overdiagnosed, 
uh, when we can't find a problem, we say, oh, if CRPS, refer them down, actually there is, there is a problem that can be fixed. So having a system is always good when you don't want to over-diagnose and just dump the patient off your clinic, but you, you, you also should have in mind, well, I've worked out through all my scheme, and I think this is probably pocket regional pain syndrome. Um, so in, in summary, uh, evaluation of problematic chaos can be complex. Uh, so therefore, uh, a system is, is recommended. Infection should always be ruled out. Uh, all your uh, investigations should be used judiciously. The acronyms and the, uh, uh, the uh, pathways are, are good to arrive and give you a system. However, remember that a surgical solution cannot always be uh, identified and therefore a multimodal MVP approach is recommended. Thanks so much. Good evening. I'd like to thank the organizing committee for asking me to give this talk, Stiffness After Total Knee Arachoplasty, Prevention, Etiology, and Treatment. These are my disclosures. Stiffness After Total Knee Replacement. There is no clear definition or cutoff, but this is generally considered as flexion less than 90 degrees after total knee replacement. Reported ranges of stiffness have tended to be in the 8 to 12 percent region historically. The reported incidence in recent series is lower probably due to better surgical and anesthetic techniques, as well as widespread implementation of ERS-type post-operative protocols. This is a meta-analysis from the Mayo Clinic in 2019 of 35 studies. The prevalence of stiffness post-TKA was 4%, ranging from 1% to 38%. Up to 58% of procedural reinterventions post-TKR were due to stiffness, and most studies use the definition of less than 90 degrees of flexion at six to 12 weeks. There was no correlation with age. Female and high BMI were at increased risk. And the authors proposed the definition as acquired idiopathic stiffness in cases without identifiable causes with less than 90 degrees of flexion at 12 weeks. Further research was suggested. This is a paper from my institution in 2014. We examined the current reasons for revision in total knee arthroplasties. Stiffness was the third leading cause for revision. This paper, also from 2014, from Peter Sharkey's group, looked at their reasons for revision, and arthrofibrosis was 4.5%. In general, preoperative range of motion is still considered the single best predictor of postoperative range of motion. Previous surgeries, especially multiple previous surgeries, that put the patient at risk, as well as previous arthroscopy, and there is emerging literature on this subject, especially the interval in which total knee replacement should be delayed after an arthroscopy. There's no correlation with severity of preoperative deformity or obesity. Male patients are felt to be at risk in some series, as well as the non-compliant patient. The intraoperative and technical factors we're all familiar with, with gap balancing, sizing, rotation, joint line elevation, tibial slope, and of course, the posterior cleanup. It is important to adhere to the usual total knee replacement principles of implant placement. The Scott Hang test is very popular and generally considered to be an accurate predictor of postoperative flexion, where the thigh is brought to be vertical and the leg allowed to drop down. Uh, Scott described we should look achieving at least 120 degrees or as much as the surgical drapes would allow. Thoral animal anesthetic infiltration is important and consider adding steroids in a high risk patient as well as an regional adductor canal catheter, uh, although this can be routine at some centers. This is a pretty clear example of a very large spacer causing a tight flexion gap. This was evened out and the patient being flexion postoperatively. Postoperative factors for arthrofibrosis also include peripatellar fiber spans for patient motivation and compliance. Infection should always be thought about. Teller complications may include tracking issues or occult fractures, such as this small avulsion from the superior pole. CRPS can also be present, as well as heterotopic calcification. And for postoperative management, although the utilization of formal physical supervised therapy is controversial, it may be considered in the high risk patient. CPM is no longer in favor and not supported by current literature. And cases that are borderline, that being 90 to 95 degrees in three months, can usually be followed and observed as range of motion should increase for up to two years postoperatively. 
Here's a case example of a 68-year-old healthy large male, multiple previous open surgeries and scars, including open MCL, the total mastectomy, two previous arthroscopies, very stiff preoperatively. Spinal anesthesia was used with an adductor canal block, removal of all osteophytes, especially posteriorly, posterior capsule release, component sizing alignment and gap balance per usual, full motion achieved intraoperatively with a Scott Hang test of about 125 degrees, and thorough infiltration of the surgical area, especially the capsule and ligament released areas. Three months of intensive physical therapy with aggressive pain management, and he did move slowly, but eventually got to about 120 degrees of flexion. So it has to be a lot of work, and the patient has to be encouraged every step of the way. The role of manipulation of anesthesia is controversial as to whether it should be early, within six weeks, or late after three months, depending on the philosophy. General anesthesia is usually used. I manipulate gently into full extension first, if necessary, and then into flexion with a hand across the patella to feel the adhesions released. And hold in full flexion for a few minutes, inject with local steroid and anesthetic at the time, followed by supervised physical therapy. Dr. Maloney wrote up his series in 2002 of 24 manipulations under anesthesia. He had quite good gain in range of motion, going from 67 to 111 degrees. But again, even later in two years, a little bit more motion can be gained. As far as revision for stiffness, the results are mixed. Open or arthroscopic lysis of adhesions can be considered. The results of revision of components are best when there is a clearly identifiable mechanical reason, such as the case I had showed. And late stiffness after good range of motion initially achieved is rule out infection until proven otherwise. Here is a good algorithm from Journal AOS 2004, if anyone wants to look at it. So in conclusion, stiffness continues to be a leading cause of both early and late patient dissatisfaction and failure and total need. Prevention is key, and preoperative recognition of the high-risk patient is also critical. Future strategies to improve outcomes in total knee and prevent stiffness should focus on surgical technique, infection protocol access, and ERS-type protocols. Enabling technologies such as robotics navigation may help us in the future, and patient optimization strategies such as addressing internal medical, modifiable risk factors, ERS and pain control, and of course, always patient proper communication, preparation, and expectation setting. Thank you very much. Thank you, brother, for the great, great presentation. So, and, uh, and uh, we have get the question of the slide. And I pick up answer. I ask the every all faculties the key point. So and the most important thing is how to gain the patient satisfactions. So please answer from your point of view. And then Dr. Kim, so the test help to gain and it effective for the patient for the patient satisfaction, buddy. Yeah. I think the CAS TK is uh, one of a helpful tool to improve the outcomes. But frankly, uh, for the experienced surgeons, uh, we can control the good balance and the gap without any CAS support. So, but I agree the when we use CAS, it will be uh, effective for learning, especially for beginners less experienced surgeons. Thank you. And uh, uh, the Dr. Saito, you treat uh, an uh, osteotomy. And so, and uh, how do you, how is your impression that uh, uni and uh, HTO, and uh, what the benefit of the HTO during the, uh, the arthroplasty or uni? I think uh, we use uh, uh, high level osteotomy to preserve uh, completely uh, uh, patient needs. So that is the uh, most benefit of the high table of certainty. If you treat the, if we use a uh, uni for osteonecrosis of the knee, maybe I, I'm afraid the uh, uh, femoral component, uh, uh, to stabilize the femoral component is very difficult because uh, the, the 
general component are very uh, weak. So that's why the, I think uh, high level osteotomy is the uh, first choice for SONC's patient. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Perfect. you very much for your question. And uh, the Professor Fabio Katani, and also the, the patient, so satisfaction and so the RE and satisfaction is a and a have the relation for the longevity or and on the contrary and high activity for the young patient is a risk and is a that risk for the early losing aseptic losing and what do you think about the patient satisfaction and the longevity? No, thank, thank you for the question. And uh, you know, I think the patient unsatisfaction is happening just right away after the surgery, after the four, eight weeks. And so I think that we have two kinds of unsatisfaction. One is a early unsatisfaction. And so this is related to the surgery, to the accuracy of the cuts and the accuracy of the soft tissue balancing. But also, as we saw in the beautiful presentation, be related also to arthrofibrosis or biological issues. The second satisfaction can be in maybe after five, six, seven years, but this is due to mechanical loosening. So it's a different kind of, uh, of uh, unsatisfaction. One is more related to the surgery. And so that was very interesting to see, uh, looking at the literature, but also our experience that the surgeon is much better. And so can be also some instability, but you know, we have a better performance of the surgery. Maybe in the future with the technology, we can improve uh, even more. And also where problem of the polyethylene decreased so much. And so there is several factors that can improve satisfaction of the patient at early or a long time. Thank you. Okay, so, and unfortunately, it's time to close this session. And so thank you everyone. And uh, so thank you, officers. And uh, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, we come towards the end of uh, today's uh, proceedings and we have a, a fantastic surgery lined up for you and by none other than Dr. Arun Mulaji uh, from Mumbai, India. He's going to demonstrate to us uh, how to do and uh, attune uh, a knee replacement using navigation. He has been using navigation uh, for last uh, more than 20 years, I would say, and does all cases with navigation. And uh, I welcome the moderators along with me, Michael Solomon and Fabio. So over to Michael Solomon to introduce the case and then we will have the uh, surgery put on. Thank you, Parag. Um, well, I, probably Arun is, uh, is better to do so because I believe uh, he's going to show us a recorded uh, surgery uh, due to some issues with the live stream. So. Arun, perhaps if you can uh, describe to us the operation you're about to do, and then we'll go through it. Right. Um, thanks, Michael, and thanks, Parag, for a wonderful meeting, and thanks for inviting me to this. We had some uh, Wi-Fi issues, so we've done a recording, and this is a complete unedited uh, recording of the surgery. So we can do a lot of discussion during uh, the bits that are uh, not very exciting. So this is a 68-year-old lady, uh, 64 kilos, uh, 5 feet 4 inches, rheumatoid and hypertensive uh, with a bilateral problem. We recorded both the surgeries. It was a bilateral surgery. The left was hyperextending but had less varus, almost about 10 degrees. And we said we will show the right one, which had 16 degrees of varus. Uh, we're going to use navigation and uh, perform a cemented 
attuned uh, posterior stabilized rotating platform total knee. The surgery is done on the spinal uh, epidural, which is the bilateral, uh, with hypotensive anesthesia and no tourniquet. Great. So, Arun, we also have Fabio with us. He's just joined us. He's in transit, but I'm sure he'll be there for a bit. Welcome, Fabio. Arun, can I ask a quick question? Before yes. You, before you start, with your spinal epidural, do you put morphine in it? No. No, we don't. We, we actually have a problem in, uh, in the private hospital where I work to get morphine. So, uh, the anesthetists actually don't use it. So it's effectively quite a short-acting. It is a short-acting analgesic perspective. Right. Yes, it's only for extending the duration of the spinal uh, because it's a bilateral and during a recording uh, of the surgery, sometimes there are delays. So we wanted to uh, ensure that it doesn't take too long. Thank you, and then maybe you can uh, you can tell us about your post-operative pain regime then uh, once when, towards the end, I suspect. Yeah, so I think, uh, uh, Arun, you can just take us through the case. As you said, this is a bilateral, and you're doing, you're demonstrating the right one to us, right? We're showing the right one, which is a very yes. simple, with a minimal flexion contracture um, okay. of about four or five degrees, which we'll see with navigation, so we'll have a precise idea. Um, we missed out I think, the first uh, few minutes, but there's nothing really great in that. But the key point in, in, in exposure, which is a standard medial parapetella uh, approach, we actually did a, a study with bilaterals uh, where we did a subvascular on one side and a medial parapetella on the other side, and there was no difference. Okay, and I okay. think largely that's given up by most people. So the key point here in this patient if you see the x-ray that was shown, uh, there was substantial lateral subluxation and a lot of lateral laxity. So these are the cases where one has to be very careful in terms of the amount of releases one performs and the amount of bone one resects. It's very important to take off less bone when you see such, uh, such a degree of laxity because then you're going to run out of insert thickness. So uh, even during the exposure, we find that uh, in the past, we used to do a very large exposure. Everyone used to do it. And we'd all learn from um, Ranawat and Install, and it was called the, and Scott, so it was called the Ransal Maneuver, where you used to strip everything down the right. medial part of the tibia and bring the tibia forward. So we've completely moved away from that, and I suspect most people have. Where no release is done whatsoever. It's a very minimal amount that we do on the medial side, just enough to be able to subluxate the tibia forwards. And you can see that in a moment after we've done all the preliminary preparation. One quick question, Arun. So you were talking yeah. about uh, subvastus versus uh, a conventional approach, and you found no difference. So, at what uh, duration was that? Is it uh, after three months, or even in the immediate post op period, there was no difference? Yeah, in the immediate post-op period, the only difference was that active SLR was possible within about 12 hours with the sub -vastus. It took about 24 hours uh, with the uh, the standard medial parapetella approach. But we had okay. a few problems with wound healing, which did not occur with the standard approach. Yeah. Um, so what I do is I, I do the patella preparation first. We, we've not subluxated the tibia, we just excise the uh, uh, intrapatella fat pad and then uh, measure the patella thickness. Any yes. particular reason for doing the patella first, Arun? Because usually we tend to do it as the last cut after finishing uh, the femur and tibia. So any particular reason or is just your practice? It, it's easier because uh, I do very little release, so I can use the Oman retractor on the lateral side very easily because you debulk the patella, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, okay. I get it out of the way. Uh, of course, in a acute, uh, in an acute knee, uh, you position the patella later, not at the initial uh, part because of the uh, design of the uh, attuned patella. Uh, you want it to be perpendicular to the trochlea. So we position that at a later point uh, after we've seen uh, how the patella tracks. 
So the key here is uh, we we take off the cruciates, uh, the osteophytes, um, but at the moment we're just removing the uh, cruciate ligament. And sometimes this is a bit difficult. Um, it just takes a little bit of time. Uh, PS surgeon. Yeah, all all cases um, um, we do a PS knee. I do unis where we keep both the cruciates, but um, when I do a total knee, I take them both off. Remove both. Okay. Does Atune also have a CR version, Arun? Or? Yes, it has a CR version. It has a fixed bearing. It has a mobile bearing version. It also has cemented and cementless versions. PS, oh. CR, and fixed bearing and RP both. So the whole armament area. Yeah. So again, here you can see uh, there's just a, a Homan tractor being used and we've done no release whatsoever on the medial side, just a few millimeters along the posterior medial border. And uh, with the help of a Homan, you can bring the tibia forwards. Um, so yeah. no release has been really performed and uh, very meticulously we excise the cruciate ligaments and the menisci before we do the soft tissue balancing. Now, you've seen all of that in the morning uh, and the other videos as well, where with robotics, uh, the software is basically the same software which has evolved from the computer-aided surgery platform. So the software is really no different, and uh, it basically allows you to assess the soft tissues as well as the um, bony cuts, and you can then plan this out. Now, some of the robotic systems that Fabio and the others use probably have CT scans. So this is image tree navigation, where you would give the various landmarks to the computer during the surgery. As against in, in uh, CT-based, where you then match the CT scan, which has been uploaded to your software, with the landmarks that you provide during surgery and match the two. So that, that step is uh, is um, avoided here because you are doing it at the same time. Yes, Dr. you had some point, you can unmute. Yes. yes, thank you. Because, you know, in, in this kind of patients with virus and lateral laxity, uh, having a navigation or a robot, you, know, you can have cut uh, the virus on the tibia if the tibia is virus and, and so in that way you have also more internal rotation of the femur allow, allowing a more stability in the middle side and re you reduce the space um, in the lateral side and so i think the alignment of the component as you said uh, i think is very important to uh, avoid medial instability and also to have more stable lateral side yeah that, that's a great point, um, Fabio. So here again, uh, you, the alignment that we shoot for uh, has changed over the years. When I started navigating in 2005, which is about 15, 16 years ago, uh, we were using mechanical alignment like most people. And over a period of time, we realized that uh, that compelled us to do a lot more releases. And over a period of time, we realized that if you left the tibia in a little bit of varus, kept the femur perhaps slightly less externally rotated, uh, took off a little more on the lateral side of the distal femur and left the femur in a little more valgus, more similar to the anatomical alignment that Hungerford and Krakow had originally talked about. If you approach those sort of uh, uh, values on the femur and tibia, you ended up doing less releases and patients seem to be recovering much better. So we were in the sense doing kinematic alignment or non-mechanical alignment even before these became uh, mainstream and everyone started talking about it. We were always leaving them in about a degree or two of errors. So that's what we found seemed to be looking and working better. This has now of course been crystallized into these newer terms, kinematic alignment, inverse kinematic alignment, uh, mechanical alignment, adjusted mechanical alignment. So you have the whole works here, you know, constitutional alignment. So you can take your pick and say, okay, I'm going to do this. 
Yeah. So, Arun, can you just talk us through the, the trackers you are putting now and the pins and uh, what are the positions and how do you uh, place them? Yeah. So, uh, these are bicortical pins, uh, both on the tibia and the femur, and I use it through the incision. The idea okay. is that you insert these in the uh, in the manner that they give you as much information as possible without interfering with your your technique and the other instruments that follow. And the pin tracks are now protected by the implant itself, so we are not creating stress risers because they are within the implant confines and they are not going into the diaphysis or the metaphysis just outside of the implant. And those have been known to create stress risers and fractures. So that's something you can avoid by keeping this as close as possible to the joint line. Of course, you then have them coming your way sometimes. You've got to be a little careful exactly how you position it. Um, and, and if you have to bail out, obviously, then you'll be taking these pins out if you need to put in, let's say, an intramedullary rod, for example. So then so if you remove the pins, out. then do you have to re-register, Arun, if you remove the pins for some reason? Uh, yes, if anything happens to the arrays, you, uh, you've got to re-register. If they lose it out or if you take them out for some reason, of course, you can clip them on and off. So if the pins are in place, you can move the arrays. But if the pins are loose, then you have to readjust and put them in and then re-register. So anything new in the registration, anything new in the registration process? Because I remember initially it used to take about seven or eight minutes to so you know, register or something. This is happening in real time. So uh, it takes only a few seconds, really. The only thing right. is it's taking a little longer because we had cameras. We had, you know, the recording camera. We had the uh, infrared camera and the right. monitor. And you have to try and keep out of it while doing it. So it, it sometimes takes a little longer. But now this is the main part that is important. and. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Fabio and Bernardo Innocenti recently published a fabulous paper on how much force to use uh, to stress the ligaments. This is something that nobody talks about. How much do you apply this force in order to get your soft tissue envelopes? Uh, so we do it after removing the cruciates and menisci to give a sense of what's happening to the soft tissue balance. And you saw over here that the um, medial side is tight and the lateral side is quite lax. Based on that, then the computer, now again, we're showing you the deformity. It's almost 20 degrees of deformity. So it's usually much more than what your uh, long leg films show. Uh, that it's often much more. And uh, when you stress it and put it in maximum varus, you can see the sort of deformity. And then you give a reverse stress to see what's happening, how correctable it is. Because not every deformity that's 15 or 20 is a rigid deformity. Sometimes you have deformities which are quite flexible because soft tissues are more lax. And these are the ones where you've got to be even more careful not to do more releases because you're only going to make it more unstable. So you've got to preserve right. your, your soft tissue envelope almost like the, the old saying that you know, it's, it's it's like a virgin who's got to preserve her virginity. So it's more like that. You've got to keep your soft tissue balanced and not disrupt the ligaments at all. And so we do no release for the uh, the superficial MCL at all in a varus knee and never uh, do anything to the lateral, collateral or the popliteal tendon in a valgus knee. Okay, okay. Yeah, I really, you know, Studied your concept and the whole idea of not releasing the MCL, uh, it, it does make sense after a long time to me. And uh, even now in severe cases, I have seen that most of the times you can get away. But the severe ones, uh, you know, I, I tend to, when you when you pie crust the, uh, the deep MCL, also the superficial gets pie crust. I think that's enough. The distal release what we used to do, Arun, I don't think that's necessary. I agree with you. Fabio, you had a point? Yeah. Uh, yes, you know, I'm now using MECO uh, and having the opportunity to preserve the PCL, to use the PCL, the CR uh, you know, implant more and more to, to be a more stabilized uh, middle side. And so, and I'm seeing that also in that case is having a CR is very stable 
and you have a very stable uh, middle side. And so I've been asking if you're using a CR also sometime or are you using only PS? No, I only use PS uh, for all my cases just to prevent any confusion so that every case, you know, everyone knows what's what's going on and we don't keep changing our technique or, or the implants unless there's a real, real need for it. And most of our patients that we see do have big deformities and uh, bone loss and so on. And I'm not, I, I, I started doing uh, cruciate retaining knees uh, when I started my practice in India, but very soon gave up because I found that by the time I balanced the PCL, I often had released most of it and, uh, you know, patients were not flexing as much if I hadn't released the PCL. So that, that put me off uh, cruciate retaining knees and then I just switched to, to PS and, and then changed. Yes, I, I we started to using CR just with the robotics and balancing very well the flexion, extension gap, and also maintaining the island, the bone island, so perfectly with the aptic control. And so I fully agree. Uh, without technology, do a CR implant is very difficult. Also, my hands is very difficult. Thank you. So I might follow your footsteps, Fabio. You're the you're the leader in in thought. So I might I might start adopting this for the younger patients with uh, uh, with good PCL and and less deformity it might be a good idea. A lot of a uh, lot of my colleagues who were on the attune design team were PS users started doing CR because the CR knee was released first, and a lot of them started using CR knees and never went back to using a PS knee. Um, but by the time Tune came to India, uh, they had the PS version. So I never had the opportunity to only try out the CR needs. But the ne next thing that I'm showing here is the removal of osteophytes. And uh, we recently published uh, in the JBGS uh, the importance of osteophyte removal. And that almost two thirds of your patients will achieve balance and alignment by just excising the osteophytes. And that's in our population with massive deformities. So almost 60% uh, require just osteophyte removal. And if you don't destabilize the, the medial collateral, you will have perfect balance with a standard PS knee. And you have alignment as well as uh, good balance in flexion and extension. So we just published that uh, in, in the BJJ, the, the former... British JBGS. Yeah, Michael. But can I ask, so you looked at your varus and valgus stressing before you took the osteophytes off. So is there any value in actually doing it after you've done the osteophyte removal? So this was uh, more to demonstrate that we've been able to achieve what we set out to achieve. And uh, the, the values that we achieved were almost... Uh, after osteophyte removal, I've written it down, we were fairly well balanced. So uh, that just shows that you don't need to do any further releases. So a lot of these myths that if you use robotics or if you use kinematic alignment, you don't need to do a soft tissue release. I don't think that that's really true. Because if you put back the bony anatomy in terms of the osteophytes, if you remove them, uh, you should be able to restore the the combination of soft tissue envelope and bones to get the alignment that the patient had beforehand, before the uh, development of the osteophytes. So I, what, yeah. Sorry. So, so what uh, technique or how do you work out how much varus you want to put that tibia in? So uh, we look at this. Uh, if, if you the the X-ray that you've seen, uh, we. We look at the MPTA. If the MPTA is around 87, 88, then uh, we're okay keeping the uh, final implant in about two or three degrees of varus, um, uh, but not more than three degrees. I usually keep it around two degrees, 1.5 to two degrees of varus on the tibia uh, in a varus deformity. On the femur, again, we look at the MLDFA angle and see whether the bone loss is essentially on the medial side, which typically it is. And uh, only very recently we published the different phenotypes of varus knees. 
So this is in, in print, so it should be online within a, a short time. So there are actually different phenotypes of various needs. And you've got to be aware of that and decide how you're going to tackle each phenotype. Uh, are you going to take it off more on the femur? Are you going to deal with it on the tibia? Is it more an extra articular problem? Uh, is there a greater degree of femoral bowing, metaphysical tibial bowing? So you've got to take into account all of this along with, you know, the patient's soft tissues. So you've got to put it together with the soft tissue uh, envelope and the sleeve that you find when you stress it. And you're doing these stress uh, tests. And uh, we came to the conclusion that you needed about uh, five kilograms of pressure to stress the ligament. And then coincidentally, after we did all of that, we found Bernardo Innocenti's paper, which said that it should be around 50 to 60 newtons, which actually matches up to the same values. So I don't know, Fabio, if you agree with that. That's the sort of stress that you apply to check the soft tissue sleeve. And uh, with that, you get a fairly good idea as to how much release you need to do, if at all, how much correction you're getting by just removing the osteophytes. So here you can see now we we uh, removed the osteophytes. Now we're tensing the ligaments. Arun, how much cut you take? Do you measure the cut? Or, uh, yes. Right. We measure, we measure the cuts. And in this case, we've taken off about, I've written it down here, 6.5 uh, on the tibia. Okay. So because of the laxity, we've taken off a little less. And you'll see at the end, because I, I know what we ended up with, you ended up with quite a significant amount of an insert, even though we've taken off less bone, not only on the tibia, but on the distal femur as well. Okay. So now you've finished with your proximal tibial cut and the distal femur yeah. cut. So it's a tibia first technique, and then we check the extension gap. So I use uh, like laminar spreaders on both sides of the joint, and that gives me a sense of what alignment I'm getting and how much pressure I'm using medially and laterally. So I've already done that with uh, uh, and my initial stress after having removed the cruciates and the collaterals, but with no cuts. Now I'm right. doing it with a tension in the extension. Yes. You've not finished your distal femur yet? No, no. So this gives me a sense of where I need to cut my distal femur in order to get my alignment right. Uh, right. So right. I just put a couple of marks there tentatively so that I know uh, roughly how much distal femur I need to take off. Right. Have you had a point? Uh, yes, yes. I, I think is. Uh, you need uh, 3.5 degrees of posterior slope, and uh, I really like this because it's according to the anatomy of the patient. I saw the x-rays, and this is also important for the flexion gap and also for the extension gap. And so uh, even if you are using a PS, I think that the posterior slope can help a lot in the stability. The, the only issue is you've got to be a little careful not to overdo it if you're using a rotating uh, platform, uh, an RP device, because you don't want spin out to occur. So you've got to be careful that you don't overdo the posterior slope. Uh, and if there's significant laxity uh, posteriorly, then you have to be a little careful and you might want to reduce the posterior slope in, in those type of cases. So here, once we, we've got an, a sense of the soft tissue, so I know that, okay, I'm a little bit more tight medially. We don't have instrumented tensors. We did use transducers, pressure transducer films uh, with 64 transducers on them. And we were using these to find out the pressures uh, when we are doing this alignment with the tensioner in place. And we found that it was so variable, it was all over the place, these values. If you held the foot in a particular way, if you lifted it a little higher, the numbers changed. If you turned it internally, the foot slightly externally, all those values were changing. So my own personal sense of these uh, smart tensors and devices which give you the readings of the pressure are not too great because we did all this with transducers almost 10 years ago. So I know yes. about Michael, so, uh, Michael and uh, Fabio, whether you use uh, 
these instrumented inserts and and so on. And I don't. Uh, Arun, uh, when when you don't uh, when you have only the the tibia cut in the past, I've been using for checking the flexion uh, with the femur intact. I've been using a CR insert, uh, eleven millimeter, and so you can check the stability. And I think that this was a good trick in order to see the stability uh, in uh, in flexion, or if you have a flash on you know spacer that can help you but i i love in the few in in the past to use a, a cr implant with two millimeter more and so that that can be a great solution yeah i i i keep a cr insert only for this purpose uh, and we sometimes use it but i find that it's a little more elegant if i use a tensioner because i can feel the actual tension in my fingers so that gives me a subjective feeling that okay, these these tissues are very tight and these are very loose. So I need to uh, perhaps do something to get them more or less balanced. And that's where I can then cheat. And maybe uh, if I find that I'm going to have to do a huge amount of release in whatever manner, then I might need the tibia, uh, the femur, and a little bit of varus. I'm a little more particular that I get my tibia in two or three degrees max varus, not more than that. And then whatever adjustments I want to make, I might make on the femoral side uh, rather than on the tibial side. So I have strict limits on the tibia, but not on the femur. Do, do you all do something similar, Fabio? Uh, yeah, yes, uh, particularly in that case. And so you got uh, you know uh, less bone in the lateral side. But if you do some virus and posterior slope, you know that can be really. Um, important to check the medial stability. So I, I, I follow your ideas, uh, but recheck always the uh, the medial stability. So we, we resected about uh, 6.5 on the tibia, and on the femur, uh, the resection amounts are about 6 both distally and medially, 6 millimeters. So uh, we haven't gone down to 8. And you can right. see it's, uh, we're rechecking that Next, it a substantial amount of almost six, uh, six degrees. And then uh, we do a slight recap sometimes to make sure that it's not too much. And sometimes reduce it by taking off a little bit more from the anterior part, just freehand that bit. And then what we do is put in a, a, a spacer. Now, now we've got an extension gap. So I still use a good old uh, old fashioned spacer to check the gaps and then give a varus and a valgus stress to see again whether I'm balanced or not and whether you need to do anything further in the flexion space. Yeah, sorry, in the extension gap. Yeah. So here what we are doing is we are opposing the two surfaces just to see what is the uh, our bony cuts with no soft tissue involvement, what's going to be the flexion between the two bones and the various valgus alignment between the two bones. So we oppose the two and then start distracting it with the help of pull it and then use, an, use a, a spacer block. Sometimes when your medial side is very tight, you have to use a thinner spacer block than you would like. So you start off with the thinnest one and then give a valgus stress. So that'll tell you, yes, you are able to get it right. But when you give a various, uh, various stress, then you see that it opens up on the lateral side. And then we note that on the uh, computer, how many millimeters or how many degrees is it opening up laterally? So that gives us an idea that we will need to do something to bring our medial space to that amount on the lateral side. So we know, okay, it's going to be two millimeters, three millimeters, four millimeters more on the medial side. So how are we going to get that? And then we start deciding, are we going to do a reduction osteotomy? So in most cases, we would do a reduction osteotomy and downsize the tibia. Most teeth have a little flare on the posterior medial part of the tibia. They have some osteophytes. So initially, we've taken the, the osteophytes off in a very gentle manner, conservative amount. And then you can take off a few more millimeters. And we've shown that if you take off about two millimeters of bone, you'll get about a degree of correction. 
So depending on how much you want to correct, you can remove the osteophytes, you can play around with a distal femoral cut. I wouldn't fiddle around with my proximal tibial cut. So by, th by these means, I'm trying to now get my, uh, those few millimeters that I'm missing on the medial side, I'm trying to increase it and try and bring it to my lateral side. So are you tight on the medial side right now, Arun? Is it yes. Uh... With the spacer block, we were tight medially. So that's when we do uh, the reduction of steotomy. If that doesn't work, then when we check our flexion gap, so we leave it at that point and then go and prepare our flexion gap because that's very important to know whether you're tight both in extension and flexion or you're tight only in extension or you're tight only in flexion. Right. The last, last is very rare that you will be tight in flexion but not in extension. So most of the time, it's going to be in extension, sometimes in extension and flexion. So now I'll go and check it, what's happening in flexion. If I'm right. tight in flexion as well as in extension, then I know that I need to do a reduction of steroid. If I'm tight only in extension, then I will do a posterior capsular release. And that's what we ended up doing in this patient. We first did a reduction of steroid, and then whatever was left, we will, you'll see that a little later. We are now preparing the femoral, the flexion gap. So we're preparing the femur for our flexion gap. Again, we are checking with the gaps, uh, the, the, with, with the tensioner in place, what our gaps are in flexion. So you can see I wanted about two millimeters more lax laterally, it's 12 and 14. So these are the same numbers that we are looking at as we did in the morning with uh, Mark Latworthy's uh, robotic surgery. The software is really the same. Uh, and here what we are doing is we are not showing you the planning screen because I don't use the planning screen, but we do it uh, continuously during the surgery itself. We modify it and you can uh, modify your cuts and see the result right away. Uh, but there is a planning screen which is what uh, the robotic software is also based on. So now in flexion, again, we are making no cuts. We're just distracting it. And then we are positioning our AP cutting device as well as the plane finder so that we are getting our rotations right and we are checking our gaps and we can put our spacer block in place and check how stable it is in flexion. So we tentatively pin a femoral uh, AP guide in position. Uh, this does not have slots, so we can um, position our spacer block, which we've done, make sure that our flexion gap is appropriate and adjust our rotation because we've got the values of all, all the uh, landmarks, trans epicondylar axis, white size line, the posterior condyle, as well as the tibial cut. Is this something like a runaway block? What you have, what you're trying to put in, and you know, you, is this the gap? It uh, is. So we are, it's the same thing. And at the right. same time, right. we call it the combined referencing technique because okay. the method you can't uh, actually see what you're doing uh, because you don't have the white sides, uh, trans epicondyle, you can feel. Uh, but here you also put in a, uh, an angel wing or a stylus so that you know that you are anteriorly positioned well and you're not going to notch so that decides your anterior position and then you are seeing whether you are balanced in flexion i wanted about a millimeter or two millimeters lax laterally at 90 degrees so if i'm okay with this and then i check with the trans epicondylar line how much am i off more than two or three degrees I might want to internally rotate it by a couple of degrees just so that I get that laxity on the lateral side that Fabio also talked about. And then I'm seeing vis-a-vis -vis the white sides line and the trans epicondylar axis that I'm reasonably okay. Uh, if one of the lines is completely off, then I will recheck everything before making the cuts. So here I've confirmed everything. I'm happy with my flexion gap. And then I proceed to make my anterior posterior cuts and then the uh, notch notch cut as well. Right. So, 
when do you use the can you show the navigation screen would it be possible to see all this what you described the exact uh, values on the screen yeah i think while we are talking come probably so we will see that as soon okay. as now it's done we will assess the need with the trials in place so we'll be able to see the the gaps and the balance and once the uh, I, I i think very briefly we have shown the positioning right. of uh, the, the rotational landmarks at at tom we might have to rewind this and i think we'll run out of time Okay. but that was shown over there briefly so it's about i think two degrees internally rotated okay. relative to trans epicondylar axis the other important thing of course is to make sure that you position the tibial component or the femoral component medial laterally in the correct position if at all more lateral than medial so you don't want any medial overhang slightly right. lateral but we already marked out white sides line so that right. remains as a good guide and we mark it out with a cautery burn so we mark it on the cartilage and that cartilage often remains till the end so we are able to position your cutting block with that mark in the center of your cutting block and okay. then in this cutting block so that we got our our uh, trochlea line absolutely in the center of this if at all you want to err on the other on the lateral side but not on the medial side that would help our uh, patella tracking a little better So initially you were saying uh, around that you like to have a couple of degrees one or two degrees of varus in your tibial component and slight valgus so in what scenarios would that be in most of your varus knees or, or when do you have that kind of an alignment you spoke about that briefly in the uh, initial part of the surgery i think most of our uh, tibias would be in about a degree or two of varus and what is the femoral component and the femoral component will vary as i told you uh, they will vary uh, from neutral to 1 degree of varus to 2 or 3 degrees of valgus even so uh, we are, we are not rigid on the 180 degrees uh, that's that's where the soft tissue and especially the medial collateral the superficial medial collateral acts as the guide that's that's like your um, lighthouse as it were yeah. and it tells you if if you do not touch the medial collateral ligament then that tension tells you that this is correct now uh if you can position uh, your components without having done any release then you know at least on the medial side you've got it right on the lateral side you know that the lateral femoral condyle the distal condyle is not affected so if you're going to be taking off the right amount on the lateral side uh, equal to the thickness and on the medial side you've done no release on the tibia you ensured that your cut is in a degree 2 degrees of varus unless of course the mpta is significantly abnormal um, right then most of the times it's your soft tissue that guides you as to what should be your ultimate alignment so it's more of a feel as you uh, take it, take the patient's knee through the range of movement is that right Absolutely. yes and that's why you have to keep applying a constant force then that should be fairly uh, consistent and uniform and what we've done is actually use some instruments to get us a sense of that force so we've been doing a lot of these studies where we're using a fixed force so now we know roughly we are doing about 50 newtons pressure in varus and valgus so that gives us a sense of the soft tissues Uh, and what is the difference medially and laterally in extension and in flexion? So the idea would be that in flexion we want it about two millimeters lax laterally, and in extension we want it as close together as possible within a, a millimeter of each other. Okay. So right now you are cementing the femoral component. Michael, you had a point. Yeah, uh, Arun, the rotation. was is clearly going to affect your flexion balance. Yes. So if you are 
internally rotating it more, at what point do you get worried that you may be compromising your patellofemoral uh, tracking if you need yeah. to internally rotate it? Uh, this is a concern that I had initially when, when you're putting these tibias in a little bit of varus because when you put the tibia in a little bit of varus, uh, you don't need to externally rotate the, the femur as much. You can then start so-called internally rotating. But when you're internally rotating, all you're doing is if you're internally rotating by two or three degrees, your posterior cuts are going to be more or less equal. So uh, that's where it is not truly internally rotated, but relatively to our concept of using the posterior condylar axis for rotation, we are saying it is internally rotated. So actually, we'll be resecting uh, both the condyles. In fact, I have written it down. We've resected nine millimeters of both medial and lateral uh, posterior condyles of the femur. Uh, with our resection. Which is similar to the sort of Stephen Howell freehand technique of, of, of resecting equal posterior condyles. Correct. But this, this is guided by the soft tissues. So what is it on the screen you have now? Can you just explain those figures? Yeah. So now this is the trial reduction. So now you can see as we are stressing the knee in flexion, we are trying to see the gap medially is 1.5. Uh, two millimeters to 4.5 uh, laterally. So we wanted a little lax laterally compared to medially. And then we are seeing an extension. Uh, we are almost uh, where we want it to be within a millimeter of each other. Now, the tighter the knee is to start with, the tighter I will leave these knees at the end of the day. The more lax they are to start with, I will leave them with a little bit more laxity because that's what that knee was. If it was slightly lax, generally, uh, I don't want to tighten them too much because that's not natural for the soft tissues. But if somebody uh, has a very stiff knee and the tissues are very tight, then I want them to get back to more or less that sort of uh, tightness. Okay. So here, yeah. this lady was fairly lax. And therefore, I'm leaving her a little bit of uh, laxity. I don't want them too tight. Yeah, that's what I've generally seen. You know, if you leave the knees too tight, you know, most of them, you know, do get some flexion deformity or, you know, the range of movement is painful. So, it's rather, my particular thinking, Arun, is to err on the side of slightly, you know, loose. It should be absolutely loose, but compared to the tight, you know, I prefer to keep them slightly lax. That's what uh, my thing is. Yeah. And, and this is something that you can correct. Uh, um, I'm not sure how, how one should deal with this, whether you should keep it tight for all of them, loose for all of them. It doesn't make sense to me that you do the same thing for everyone because everyone has different uh, bony alignments. We've looked at that. We've described these different bony phenotypes uh, morphologically of the femur. And I'm sure that uh, when we are looking at the soft tissues in detail, so I think even in the soft tissue balancing, there is a great deal of variability among patients. Right. A lot of, a lot of the data is from cadavers, which is completely useless. We did our own study in cadavers and navigated knees in cadavers to see what happens with the soft tissues as we release them. But that gives you limited information because that there, there was never any disease to start with. So there was never any loss of bone or any deformity. So that gives right. you limited information. And the real information we can get is only from patients. And we've been collecting this data. We now have uh, several thousands of these uh, navigated knees where we are looking very carefully at the soft tissues. And there is a remarkable variation in them. But at the same time, there are certain patterns which are emerging. And okay. we will be able to publish these patterns as well so that along with the soft tissue pattern, if you use the bony phenotype and combine these two, uh, you can then assure that you get something like this. So you can see now with the trial reduction in place, you've done a posterior capsular release. Once we do that, the knee is flexing to 140 degrees, which is what we started off with. Um, it's flexing very easily, and this is a mobile bearing knee. 
Uh, so it's flexing all the way, and you can see now the the soft tissue balancing uh, as you extend the knee is now even better. Right. So right through the range of motion, you can assess the stability uh, when, as you give a medial and lateral stress, uh, you can see keep keep giving a varus and valgus stress as you flex and extend. You can see that's what we are trying to do. And at the same time, you're now getting a sense of the soft tissue envelope and how it has responded. And you, you realize you've done no release for this 17, 18 degree varus. We've not released anything except the posterior capsule and we've excised the osteophytes. And right. we've got complete stability and we are placing the components in a reasonable position. We are not compromising our implant position. Uh, whereby, you know, you keep it in five degrees and six degrees of various like Stephen Howell might do. And then you're risking those implants. So here, biomechanically, we're not taking that risk. We're putting them in two degrees, maybe three degrees of various if needed, two or three degrees of valgus. And then dealing with osteophytes and doing only releases, not of the collateral ligament, but of the capsule. So that the collaterals guide your movement and give complete stability. And uh, if we reach the end of the video, uh, we had the opportunity of actually uh, next day filming the patient herself uh, after her bilateral knees, standing, uh, flexing to 90 and standing and walking with just a little support from her stick. So they are absolutely stable because you've done no release. But at the same time, you put implants which are not going to be in danger of long-term uh, failure because of positioning them incorrectly from a biomechanical standpoint. So I'm worried about that because I know uh, Stephen Howell has published a lot that they have been doing it regardless of the deformity. But I think in our patients where they have osteoporosis, osteomalacia particularly, they have this lax lateral tissues, they tend to go into various, we are risking a tibial failure. If, if we put the tibia in too much of various, so I would stick to about two degrees. Rarely do we go to three. That would also depend, Arun, on the pre-operative uh, existing virus or what the constitutional alignment was. You know, just saying fixed one or two degrees for everybody might not work. Okay, so that's a great point you brought up, Parag. Uh, what you have to now differentiate is a patient with pure intra-articular problems and a combination of intra plus an extra-articular problem. You deal with the intra-articular problem by doing more or less what I've said over here in terms of releases, not releasing anything because there's no contracture. Now, as regards the alignment, that is going to be guided by what's happening extra-articularly. Intra-articularly, you do exactly what you should do for the implant survival and at the same time, no release and at the same time, you're maintaining the joint line. So here, this gives us a very good idea that we maintained our joint line in extension and flexion. So we're not altering any of that. Therefore, we are not having to do any soft tissue release or lateral release, for example, because the patella is not tracking well or, um, you know, you're overstuffing the lateral compartment of the uh, FEMA. So that doesn't happen. So we are not risking failure of the implant and yet we are maintaining stability. Okay. So I think that's that's uh, where we differ from the other philosophies where they say, okay, we keep cutting in more and more of various or more and more of valgus. But I think a little bit of understanding of the soft tissue balance goes a long way to ensure stability. Absolutely. So, so, I mean, the rest of it is all fairly straightforward. The main thing was to show you that if we've got complete alignment. We've been able to align it to about a degree uh, and a half to two of various uh, HKA. The soft tissue stability is maintained right through the range of motion from extension right up to deep flexion of 140 degrees. And we're leaving it slightly more lax on the lateral side by a, mill a millimeter or two in deep flexion. But in extension, we are fairly tight. And this is an RP. Sorry. Yeah. 
you know, so, so while you're just uh, you know, getting uh, prepared to cement, the question is uh, whether you do robotic along with your navigation or it's just navigation. Have you started doing robotic also? No, I haven't started doing robotics. But as I told you, uh, there isn't any significant difference between the actual software and what you are doing uh, in in the two regarding the soft tissues and your bony cuts. Because the software in robotic surgery is more or less the same as in navigated surgery. It's right. Just that you then freeze your plan and say, okay, now this is it. And now the robot takes over. It takes over the role that you as a surgeon would do along with your slotted guide or your jig, which you have navigated into position and then you cut it. So as discussed earlier in the uh, talks, I think Dermot brought up this point very well uh, in his very slick robotic surgery that he demonstrated that the main difference between the two is that in navigation, you're putting it through a block, your saw, and you may not be as precise with your first cut as uh, a robot would be. And that you may need to recheck and make a few more cuts in order to get it perfect. So that is right. really the essential difference between the two. Uh, right. And some of the softwares like the Mako software does have the ability for you to uh, you know, remove the implant and see what your cuts are going to be like. You can see in 3D as well uh, you know, how you're tracking from medial to lateral. You can see uh, your bone removal whether you're situated correctly in the trochlea. So it does help you and gives you a little more insight into the bones. But in terms of the soft tissue behavior, there's no difference. Okay. So apart from what you just explained that the robot takes the customer, otherwise everything is common for the robot surgery. And the robot comes in once the planning is done, you get the arm and then they do the cuts. So, Correct. So, so if your cuts uh, are as good as the robot just assumed, then uh, probably the other part of planning and doing the navigation remain the same. And that is why uh, there are very few studies which have actually done a head-to-head -head comparison of computers and robots. And if they do that, they find that there's really no difference in any of the outcome scores. There may be a millimeter or not even a millimeter, half a millimeter greater accuracy with the robot compared to the uh, computer. Uh, half an, a millimeter or half a degree at the most of uh, differences between the two. But in terms of the uh, proms and the functional outcomes, there's really no difference. Okay. Well, I think what you're demonstrating is that in the end, it comes back to the feel of the soft tissues and how you've come to the position based on your soft tissue feel. And for most surgeons who do not have access to a robot, uh, but certainly navigation is uh, is pretty much routine now. Uh, you've demonstrated very nicely how what you need is just a good navigation tool and then to understand using your navigation, your soft tissue tensions. And you don't need a robot for that. I, I don't use a robot, but I'm just saying for well, most people wouldn't have access to one. Yes, I, I think uh, in terms of the cost factor, it's, it's a huge, huge uh, leap. Uh, for a lot of our patients to be able to afford the accessories that go with it. You know, everything gets added on to the patient's uh, bottom line, uh, whether it's the AMC, whether it's the disposable stuff, et cetera, the burrs, the saws, and lots of, lots of the uh, disposable items itself cost as much as an implant costs. So these, it, it's, it's your almost charging double uh, than that, then the cost of the implant itself because you're using a robot. And uh, in, in our country, particularly where a lot of people are paying for their surgery on their own, we don't charge anything extra for computers. The only thing that gets billed extra are the arrays which are uh, reusable, uh, sorry, which are disposable, but uh, you can get uh, some cheaper versions of these as well. But in the case of robot, you have a, this huge expense, which to justify that, in some of our patients is a bit difficult. That, that, that is the point. I think uh, unless the costs do come down of the robots or, you know, maybe the companies give it to us on rent, 
I don't think it's going to be used widely across. And as the point you brought out, Arun, I, I think it's a very good point that navigation is affordable. And as long as you get the component placement right, half a millimeter or a millimeter, you know, you already know what your error is when you cut manually versus with a robo. So that also can be figured into the final calculation. So you're good. No, I'm not saying we should not progress. I think, yes, centers where they are looking at robots and they're uh, doing these in larger numbers, I think for research purposes, for evaluation, for, I think we need to move forward uh, in, in our uh, discipline. And uh, robotics is certainly a very important uh, next step. But I think currently with its given prices, uh, it's still going to be a little difficult for uh, the vast majority of surgeons to be able to use it. And therefore, right. it still is very important for surgeons to really understand the soft tissue aspect because all of this can be done with conventional surgery. And in fact, we just recently published a paper which shows how you can accurately position the femur with conventional surgery as accurately as with, uh, with navigation with some uh, couple of extra steps. So it's very important for the vast majority of our, our patients around the world that you have affordable technology, which is successful. But I yes. think more important is that the surgeon understands what he is doing and the soft tissues still remain to me the key. Uh, these are just gadgets and tools which look very good, which look very elegant. They're beautiful. They're fun to play around with. Great for pre-op planning if you have extra time on your hands to sit and plan these things. But if not, uh, if you're a busy surgeon and you don't have that much time, then this is going to eat into your time because you're going to have to do all this pre-op planning for robots. Uh, right. So that's that's also uncomplicated for in terms of you know uh, your remuneration. That's not added to the bill, but it eats into your time. Whereas this is being done uh, on yeah. you know uh, in real time. So you're not wasting any time. You're seeing it and you're doing what you need to do. Right, right. But just before we you know, conclude, we have about uh, two and a half minutes left. So do you see yourself using a robot five years down the line? Or what, what would you say is the future, in your opinion, for your own practice? Um, yeah, I, I think if the robot becomes uh, uh, cheaper, if all the disposables and all get a little cheaper, I, I wouldn't be averse to using it because I'm sure we can all do added accuracy. But uh, right. more important than using the robot for accuracy is to be able to understand the soft tissue balancing. That is Absolutely. the key. And, and neither robots nor computers actually tell you what you should be doing. So these are only tools like your speedometer of your car telling you you're going at this speed. They're not like a Google map telling you this is what you should do. This is what you're going to encounter. And right. therefore, when you encounter this, this is the next step. So they're really not guiding you. I think we are misguiding ourselves if we think that robots and computers are guiding us. I think eventually it's a surgeon who is in complete control and needs to understand what he or she is doing. Um, these are merely tools at the moment. Yeah. So I think so now Michael, you can see x-rays. So these are the post-op x-rays of the patient. Uh, right. You can see the alignment has been restored. Uh, the offset, the slope, etc. The patella tracking. Looks good. Um, and then the next slide uh, will will show you the uh, patient uh, next morning after surgery, after a bilateral, uh, getting 90 degrees of flexion, full extension. And uh, perhaps if there's time, actually taking a few steps the next morning. Uh, and they feel reasonably stable. Of course, it's a big change for them because the left knee was hyperextending 15 degrees. Yeah. And the right was 20 degrees in varus. So these people right. have uh, severe problems to start with. Great. So, so, Michael, you have any quick comments? We have a minute left and then uh, we could conclude this session. Great no, surgery, I, Arun. A big round of applause. Well done. Beautifully, beautifully presented, Arun. Um, just give me, in, in a nutshell, what do you give them for pain relief or are they all tough patients? Uh, we, I just use uh, the infiltration, uh, perioperative, uh, the, the uh, pericapsular infiltration. That's it. It's a cocktail which we published in the JOA many years ago. Um, that's it. 
Thank you. The key is don't do too much of release. The yeah. more release you do, the more pain they'll have. Great. So I think we come to the end of uh, this session. This is the last session. So uh, we are finished for the day. Uh, thank you, Arun, and uh, thank you, Michael, for moderating this session. Really appreciate your time, and, and uh, it was good that it was pre-recorded, so you were at ease to, you know, explain the concept which you explained so well, Arun. And I think that sometimes can be a good idea. What we call as the pre-live surgeries, you can just record it, and then you are more at ease. Otherwise, the stress in the work can at times divert your thought process. So I think that was good. Uh, we now uh, finish uh, for the knee. Session. We will now meet again on 24th July at uh, 12 noon Australia time and 7.30 a.m. Uh, India time. So, great Arun. Thank you very much and uh, stay in touch. Stay safe. Thank you. Take care. Okay, Michael. Recording stopped.